Copyright Information The Sorceress Spy Book 2 in the Reluctant Assassin series by Thomas K. Carpenter A Hundred Halls Universe series Copyright 2018 by Thomas K. Carpenter Cover Design Copyright 2021 by Raven This is a digitally narrated audiobook. Chapter 1 11th Ward, August 2014 The first rule of magic is don't lose your head. The red line had brought them to a section of the city with three-story brownstones. Every fifth house had been abandoned, with foreclosure notices tacked onto the front doors. There was more trash on the street than in the other wards he'd been in, and the faint smell of fires burning filled the air. The empty streets didn't seem to offer much protection. I feel like we don't belong here, said Zane, glancing around. The meeting place is a couple of blocks away. We should hurry so we're not late. I don't want to start off the year behind, said Keelan. A bunch of shouting, followed by a clap of thunder and a scream, erupted from a block over. Then it sounded like someone crashed into a pile of metal trash cans. Zane, I see that look in your eye. Whatever that is, it's not our problem, said Keelan. We'll just take a look, said Zane, moving towards the noise. To make sure everything is okay. We've got time. No, we don't, said Keelan, tapping on an imaginary watch on his wrist. We're going to be late as it is. Then be quick, said Zane, flooding his imbuement for speed and strength. They'd been cautioned not to use their imbuements during the summer, but now that he was back in the city of sorcery and at the Hundred Halls, that caution no longer applied. The brick buildings blurred past as he sprinted down the alleyway, leaping onto a rusted blue dumpster to clear a chain-link fence that blocked the end. He narrowly avoided a sleeping brown mutt when he landed next to a puddle. Keelan skidded next to him and the mutt scurried away, but tucked low to the ground. The street on the other side was worse than the one he'd come from. Zane paused to get his bearings. We should. Zane cut his cousin off. Did you hear that? He didn't have to wait long before a second clap of thunder, followed by a small mushroom cloud of smoke, erupted from a compound up the street. To his surprise a sign with a big purple eye with flames surrounding it was out front. It came from a hall, said Keelan, which means we should get back to the meeting location. It might not even be a real emergency. Maybe their patron is showing them some advanced magic. We shouldn't interfere. When a scream followed that was so high and long it sounded like someone had been ripped in half, Zane took off with Keelan on his heels. The sign in front read the smallest eye. The front door looked like it had been hit with a battering ram. Zane stepped over a bloody arm. A trail of blood went deeper into the house. What the? said Keelan from behind him. He passed a room filled with alchemy equipment. Three separate tables contained rows of glassware connected by sagging plastic tubes. A bubbling blue mixture was winding its way through the tubes. At the end it turned into puffs of white gas that smelled like candy canes. What do they do here? asked Keelan marvelling at the glass structure. Zane hushed his cousin and tugged him forward. When he turned the next corner he almost fired a force bolt. A pair of motionless legs stuck out from a doorway. We found the rest of the body, said Keelan. Not all of it, said Zane, pointing to the empty space above the neck. Muffled grunts from the courtyard behind the house drew them to the back. Zane reached it in time to see a seven-foot-tall man with tattoos that writhed across his slate-grey skin, wielding a sword that filled the courtyard with whispers, take the head off a girl who was in the middle of a spell. The head tumbled against a potted plant, the girl's surprised expression facing them. Zane fought with his stomach to keep its contents intact. Keelan did not win his battle, and his breakfast spilled onto the stones, announcing their arrival to the tattooed warrior. Their immobility ended, the moment he took a step forward with his sword. Zane fired a force bolt at the same time as Keelan threw a rock grenade, but the warrior swatted the spells away as if they were crumpled paper. The warrior pointed his sword at them and fired it like a cannon, and a sonic burst knocked them back into the hallway. The thunderclap left ringing in Zane's ears as he struggled to his knees, fearful the warrior would be approaching with his sword. But the warrior had moved to pick up the girl's head. He carefully placed it into a brass cage covered in runes. The moment he closed the lid, a soft glow filled the box, suspending the severed head in ghostly light. Zane tried to stand up but crashed into the wall instead. The concussive blow had damaged his inner ear, giving him an awful case of vertigo. The warrior stacked the head in a box on top of three others, 
lashed them together, and picked them up as if he was shopping for cantaloupe. He took a step towards Zane, but stopped when it looked like he'd heard something, sirens Zane guessed, then he kicked open the gate leading into the alleyway and disappeared around the corner. Zane made an attempt to follow but stumbled over like a newborn foal. Keelan was no better, stuck on his hands and knees, crawling forward only to collapse again. Zane finally made it to his feet, and was busy trying to convince the world to stay in one place, when two men in rune-covered Kevlar and holding semi-automatics came through the door. He couldn't hear what they were saying. Zane touched the side of his head, his fingertips encountering wetness. He held them up to the protectors to show he'd been injured, but only got his hand halfway up before they tackled him. Chapter 2 Third Ward, August 2014 An assassin, a witch, and a jail cell. Four hours after SWAT collected them from the smallest eye hall, they were pushed out the front door of police HQ, bleary-eyed, into the stark sunlight. The discharging officer stayed at the door, while they moved to the top of the steps. Zane shook his head, enjoying the sensation of hearing again. The officers had been nice enough to have a paramedic fix his ears before they'd sent him out the door. He'd spent the time sitting at a desk, waiting for someone from the academy to pick them up. Keelan had to spend his time in a cell, since they had yet to verify that he was really from the hall he claimed. You drag me into an episode of Highlander, and then you get to sit on a comfortable desk chair while I spend my time in a room filled with drunks and rapists. Some guy must have bathed in urine before he got thrown in there, said Keelan. I guess that's the benefit of being twice arrested. Zane's apology died on his lips as he saw who had come to pick them up. You've got to be kidding me, said Keelan under his breath. It's the patron. I see her, said Zane. Priyanka Sai marched up the sidewalk, as if she were about to dress down a battalion of soldiers. Her silky black ponytail swayed back and forth like a scythe. I think she's going to murder us, said Keelan while keeping his jaw tight to hide his speech. We'll be fine, said Zane. Just stay calm. They met her at the bottom of the steps. Priyanka's eyes flashed to the officer at the top of the stairs. In a raised voice she said, Are you this accident prone or do you really want to join the protectors? She made a growling sigh. Follow me. You're late for everything. While they followed in her wake, Zane watched her muscles relax one by one until she was moving forward with long graceful strides. Keelan seemed to notice as well. He made a noise but thought better of speaking. They cut into a tea shop called the Mad Hatter. The attendant made no motion towards them as Priyanka went right through the colorful shop, heading for an orange and white curtain at the back of the main room. She shoved it out of the way, and they entered a kitchen. Once inside the empty kitchen she spun on her heels, facing them. She wasn't angry as Zane first expected, rather she had a hard curious glint to her gaze. You have the makings of a terrible spy, she said. Did you not understand my instructions on your first day in the academy? What does it matter if we go back to Varna after our five years? He asked. The response set her back. Because I want to get the most out of you before you go, which is increasingly difficult, as you spread your name across official records like some mutt pissing all over the city. I'm sorry, said Zane. We heard screams and went to investigate. She crossed her arms searching them with her eyes. Bannon Cree doesn't like it when another hall interferes with his turf. It took Zane a moment to remember that Bannon Creed was the patron of the Protectors, the hall that supplied the world's magical police forces. I didn't realize he was in charge of dealing with seven-foot-tall headhunters, said Zane. In the city he is, said Priyanka. The mages of his hall have the task of dealing with threats that come from inside the city. And you protect the city from the outside threats, finished Keelan. Good but not quite, said Priyanka. Not from outside the city but outside this realm, said Zane. You're getting it, said Priyanka. Which is why I'm not entirely mad at you for getting involved. You know where seven-foot-tall murderous thugs come from, asked Zane. Possibly, she said. He's not from here. Wait, said Zane. You're not surprised about this guy. That means you know about what happened. Not entirely, said Priyanka which is why I need you to tell me everything you saw, down to the last hair on their asses. They recounted the fight with the guy with the sword. Priyanka asked a lot of questions, mostly about the boxes that held the heads. When they were finished, she cupped her chin in her hand while her eyes whirled with thought. A heavy concern lay in that gaze. 
Very well, she said eventually. We should be getting to the honeycomb. The rest of the second years would probably like to know what happened, but you will not say a word about it. What should we tell them? asked Keelan. I don't really care, said Priyanka. You need to learn to lie or you're not going to last long in this hall. When she turned to head deeper into the tea shop, Zane asked, What about the hall? The smallest eye. I'd never heard of it. Were there any survivors? Priyanka's upper lip twitched, as if she had only just remembered that people had died. Unfortunately, no. It was a small hall with only a few members. They involved themselves with arcane microbiology, and now they're all dead, the patron included. She looked away. When Invictus was alive he let so many of these small halls form, not really caring if their purpose was useful or not. If they grew larger, then he nurtured them. If not, they disappeared. He sounds like an asshole, said Zane. He was, said Priyanka. But he was also kind and generous. So there aren't really a hundred halls, asked Keelan. Priyanka gave a throwaway shrug. No one really knows how many halls there are, especially with Invictus dead. Her lips curled with a frown as if she'd remembered something she had to do. She hurried into the back. She was a bottle of energy. To Zane's surprise, an obsidian archway had been built into the back wall. A portal, said Keelan. Not any portal. This is part of the garden network, the private pathways of the patrons. You will of course say nothing of this either, she said. She mumbled cryptic words and they went into the swirling darkness, coming out into the back of a study full of leather chairs and mahogany tables. A couple of older students that Zane recognized barely glanced up from their studies at their arrival. Behind them, a window provided a view of the glitter dome and the rest of the second ward. It appeared they were on the upper floor of a building. After you found your teammates, report to Instructor Pennywhistle to receive your tomes and schedules. The second year is often the hardest year so don't disappoint me, she said. Zane hung back after Keelan left. The patron who had been studying her phone raised an eyebrow. Yes. I know I don't deserve a favor after the trouble I've caused but I have a request, he said. Her lips flattened. It might hurt to ask. Is there any way to move Keelan onto my team? We only have four members and he and I work well together, said Zane. Yes, I heard what you and Keelan did to the goon. Priyanka's dark eyes shifted across him. He felt like a mouse standing his ground against a hawk. But your request is denied. It's better if we keep the teams together as they were last year. The chemistry is better that way. Yes, patron, he replied. Thank you for allowing me to make my request. She shook her head slightly with an amused tilt to her lips. I have a feeling that this won't be the last time that you're involved with something larger than you. But remember you've been lucky so far. Real academy work takes preparation, planning and careful execution. We don't charge into events with a hope and a prayer. That kind of work gets a lot of people killed and I don't like to see my friends or students dead. It's an unpleasant feeling. Trust me when I say that you don't want that burden. She turned her attention back to her phone and Zane took that as his sign to leave. He found this section of the academy to be only five rooms, the study, a gun range, a library and two meeting rooms. Zane didn't see Keelan either, which was odd since he'd only just left him. He did find two other portals. Zane went back to the study and asked one of the other students. Excuse me, but where's the rest of the academy? asked Zane. The student chuckled under her breath, glancing knowingly at the window to the second ward. Take one of the portals to the other areas, she said. What's the password? The girl taught him eight separate spells to access the portals. Which one is the one I want, he said. Try them and see, she said, holding a grin in her teeth. He felt like this was going to be a trick. He remembered his freshman year at Varna High, when an upperclassman sent him to the principal's office to purchase an elevator pass, even though it was only a one-floor school. The first portal led him to a series of classrooms. He was wandering the halls, looking for someone to tell him where to go, when he found another window which he looked out of, expecting to see the glitter dome or another part of the second ward. Instead, he was staring at the castle-like structure of Arcanium, which was in the fifth ward. The name Honeycomb became clearer in his head. He imagined the various parts of the school spread out amid the town, providing mobility and defense. Through the next portal, 
He ran into Vin wearing floral swim trunks and a towel over his shoulder. Zane, where have you been? I brought my collection of heist movies and was hoping to watch some with you before classes started. Zane embraced the big man. Complications. Zane gave him a once over. Where are you headed? There a pool here or something? Technically, it's a grotto. There's a half siren woman who lives there. She teaches water based spells and combat, but when there aren't classes, we're allowed to go for a swim. Assuming we plug our ears with wax first. She's not supposed to drown anyone, but accidents happen. Sounds safe, said Zane with a shudder, memories of cold brown water flashing through his mind. Can you tell me where our room is? Better than that, I'll show you, said Vin. So where is this part of the honeycomb? asked Zane. Seventh Ward, said Vin. Crazy, isn't it? Supposedly, the academy is spread out across all the wards. This section of the honeycomb seemed larger than the other two he'd visited. It took them a few minutes to reach their rooms, during which Vin babbled about his summer, which sounded like it was his best ever. Despite his imposing size, Vin claimed that he'd been an outsider at school, but he'd felt like the town hero coming back as a member of the Hundred Halls. What about you? How was your summer? Was it as kick-ass as mine? Vin asked excitedly. Zane didn't have the heart to tell him that in Varna, members of the Hundred Halls were more common than teen pregnancies, so he just smiled. He was saved from further questioning when they reached the apartment. Look who I found, said Vin. Skylar was sorting her clothes in the closet while Portia, who was only wearing her shorts, was folding laundry. They both ran over to give him a hug. Zane blushed when the half-naked Portia squeezed him around the middle. To hide his embarrassment, Zane made a show of examining their new digs. It looked like someone had built a three-story building, but forgotten to add the first floor. There were huts where the second and third floors were, but no ladders to reach them. We figured this room would feel the most like home for you, said Skylar. That's great, but what about a way to get up there? asked Zane. Skylar winked and bounded up the wall, grabbing minor imperfections in the textured stone as she scurried to a hole leading into one of the huts. She disappeared inside, then stuck her head out and waved enthusiastically. Getting up to use the bathroom in the middle of the night is going to be fun, said Zane. Late nights at the bar should be interesting, said Portia, not that we'll get any time this year with our classwork and the second year contest. They caught up on the last three months. It felt good to be back with the team. His face was warm with emotion. They'd all changed so much in a year. Portia's accent was completely gone, except for when she evaded questions about her summer in Mexico City, then her R's began to trill. Skylar, on the other hand, sounded like a news anchor with her near-perfect diction. She'd opened a boutique with her younger brother and was selling high-end clothing to rich people in Los Angeles. Are you in trouble with the patron again? asked Portia. Zane repressed a shudder as the memory of that woman's head rolling against the potted plant came back to him. Not at all. There was a murder near the pickup location and we happened to be witness to it. Just had to go down to protector headquarters and tell them what we saw. Skylar put a hand on her hip and tilted her head. Just happened to see a murder. And we're supposed to believe this. I swear, said Zane. I guess I have bad luck or something. Luck has nothing to do with it, said Skylar. Enough about that, said Vin, who was staring at the huts on the second floor loft. Since we only need four beds, I was thinking of taking this down, you know, give us more room. Could we wait on that? asked Zane, thinking about his cousin. He hadn't given up on trying to get him on the team. I heard we might have an opportunity to add a fifth later. Portia, who had just slipped a shirt over her head, raised an eyebrow. I haven't heard that. No one appeared to believe him, but they didn't press him on his request and agreed to leave the fifth bunk up. His first year he'd just been trying to survive. But after what had happened with the goon and with Keelan's newfound attention from the watches, getting him in his group was his highest priority. Chapter 3 Varna, May 2005. Staring at an odd vehicular fossil from the previous century. What is it? Zane asked as he leaned against the corner of the trailer, staying in the shade on the abnormally hot day. Uncle Jesse worked under the hood of a long strange car with a truck bed for a rear end. A patina of rust covered the vehicle. It smelled like grease and spilt gasoline. He pulled away from the hood and yanked a towel from a back pocket to clean his hands. 
Uncle Jesse always looked like he should have been born in the 1950s. He kept his hair long and had a deep tan that he always claimed came from his Italian heritage. That's a 1972 El Camino, said Uncle Jesse. A pretty little thing, if you ask me. It looks like a platypus, a car version of it anyway, said Zane. A fair comparison, said Uncle Jesse with a wink. Did you know the platypus is the only mammal that can lay an egg? Like everyone knows that, said Zane, rolling his eyes while keeping a big grin. Uncle Jesse tapped a greasy finger on his jaw. But did you know they don't have a stomach? They have poisonous claws in their feet, and they use their bill to sense the electrical fields in creatures like a damn superhero. He gave Zane an exaggerated questioning look. What they don't teach you those kinds of things in fourth grade? I'm in fifth, said Zane laughing. His dad liked to call Uncle Jesse the human encyclopedia to which he would reply that he was an autodidact, which was another way of saying he knew a lot of things, especially if they had to do with the animal kingdoms, but did crappy in school. Where'd you get your platypus anyway? asked Zane, receiving blown out cheeks from his uncle. This is the fruit of a well-laid plan, said Uncle Jesse with a wink. Then as he glanced around and realized he was standing in the middle of a trailer park, and nothing was secret or sacred in it, he looked a little sheepish. At that moment, Keelan came running up. Whoa, what is that? A platypus, said Zane with his arms crossed like a smug professor. Looks like a car to me, dummy, said Keelan. It's a bit of both, boys, said Uncle Jesse, giving Keelan a half hug. You two half pints interested in taking a spin? They both whooped and ran to the car door. While they were fighting for shotgun, Loser would have to cram into the middle since it only had a single bench. Aunt Lydia stuck her head out the back window of the trailer. She was letting her afro grow out, and it barely fit through the opening. Jesse, where are you taking the boys? she asked. A little joyride, he said, hooking his thumbs in the belt loops of his jeans. Nothing much to it. You ain't taking the boys on any errands, are you? asked Aunt Lydia with enough skepticism to start a small fire. No way, honey. Just a joy ride, said Uncle Jesse, then he slammed the hood down and slid into the driver's seat. Zane had heard his mother say a thousand times that Uncle Jesse could charm the tail off a whale, and he knew that whatever those errands were, that they were most certainly going to be going on them. The platypus fish tailed out of the trailer park, spitting gravel across the road, earning cheers from Zane and his cousin. The only time Zane got to take rides was on the school bus, and that didn't count, so even though he was stuck in the middle, there was enough wind coming in through the windows that he had a grin the size of Texas plastered on his face. Uncle Jesse took them down the old highway, which he lovingly called the Seven Hills of Hell. Each hill was steeper than the next, and when they went flying over it, Zane's stomach slammed into his throat. It was better than a roller coaster. Once they turned back towards town, Uncle Jesse reduced the speed of the platypus. Why are you going so slow, Uncle Jesse? asked Zane, looking up at him with an unhealthy dose of admiration. That prick Deputy Clovis would like nothing better than to bust my ass. We went to Varna High together, and he ain't never forgiven me for stealing his girlfriend, said Uncle Jesse. Who was that? asked Zane, wondering if he knew her. Since everyone knew everyone in Varna. He chuckled as he tapped his fingers on the steering wheel. It was your Aunt Lydia. Whoa, said Zane, sharing wide-eyed glances with Keelan. He couldn't imagine Aunt Lydia and Deputy Clovis ever dating. So what errand are we going on? asked Keelan. I promised your mom I wasn't taking you on any errand, said Uncle Jesse. Yeah right, said Zane. Uncle Jesse gave a leaning shrug. Maybe I was. But if I do, you're both sworn to secrecy, not a word to anyone, especially not Nevia. We promise, they both said in their best talking to adults' voices. This wasn't the first time that Uncle Jesse had taken them on an adventure, but this seemed different than the others. Uncle Jesse didn't say anything at first, staring straight ahead at the road, his jaw pulsing with thought. When he spoke it had the weight of concerned reluctance, as if he were explaining how disappointing the world could be. In that moment, Zane saw how restless his uncle was, how if he could he'd have joined the Foreign Legion or been a war journalist. You boys both know how things work in the town, with the lady and everything, right? They both nodded. I knew you did, but just making sure. You see, Varna's its own little environment. A closed ecological system, if you will. Since no one can leave, and we don't really let newcomers move here, 
certain roles have been predefined for everyone. You can move up, and you can certainly move down, but for the most part, everyone stays where they're at. At the top is the lady, the alpha predator. She surrounds herself with other predators, the watchers, the goon, the city council, anyone who can keep her in power. Then there's the rest of the town, the prey, who they feed on without regard. Sure they make a good show of it and rarely does anyone die, but make no mistake, they're prey. They asked Zane, what does that make us? Uncle Jesse clucked his tongue. A little of both. Your dad likes to think he's separate from the system, like he's found an alternative category or something, but I think he's deluding himself. In this town, there's only so much to go around, so you have gotta take advantage where you can. Only suckers pay full price. If Zane had heard that once he'd heard it a hundred times. He'd also heard his dad say that shortcuts would be the death of Uncle Jesse. After a few minutes, Zane asked, why doesn't anyone take care of the lady? Because then 2,000 people would die. He tapped on the steering wheel, looking thoughtful. Unless you have a way around her particular conundrum. Do you, asked Zane? Uncle Jesse didn't answer at first. Even if someone did, which I don't, how do you risk that many people? Because if you're wrong, that's a whole lot of death on your doorstep. The way he said it made it sound like it was a question he'd considered before. As if the ruts of the conversation had worn deep in his soul. They reached the edge of the town of Varna, which was made up of a half dozen crisscrossing streets. A quintessential city hall with a steepled clock tower provided the false center, as everyone knew where the real power lay. Unlike most small towns there was no Walmart, just Harry's Grocery and Hardware which was on 5th and Main. Uncle Jesse dropped them off two blocks up. There's a collection box outside the store with a sign that says Varna Historical Preservation Society. I want you to open up the box, remove the cash, leave the change and meet me at the church, said Uncle Jesse. What? We can't steal from that. It's the ladies, said Zane, incredulous at his uncle's brashness. A key appeared in Uncle Jesse's hand, along with a smirk on his lips. And that's exactly what I'm exploiting. Everyone thinks it's the ladies, which is why they give money, because they want to be in her good graces. But won't someone see? One of the watchers, asked Keelan. They don't care, and even if they did, they're busy on the other side of town. Plus, it doesn't say it's the ladies, so I have a bit of plausible deniability on my side. He checked his watch. I need to go, I have another errand that needs a lack of watchers. So go on, get you that money. And if anyone messes with you, just own it. He drove off before anyone could object. They walked side by side, neither one wanting to say anything as they approached Harry's. The parking lot was empty except for a couple of foreign cars. They stopped 30 feet from the box. It was on a table with a banner in front of it announcing Varna Historical Preservation Society, complete with a picture of a plantation house. Zane felt a nudge in his ribs. You get it, said Keelan. It's your dad, you do it, replied Zane. He'd been excited about the errands when they first set off, but now he just wanted to be back at the stack. Five elements for who has to go, said Keelan, then added no phase. Zane nodded quickly. He wanted to get this over with. They faced each other. One, two, three. Zane threw fire at the same time as Keelan. Damn again. One, two, three. Keelan's earth beat his air. Damn, said Zane. Keelan pushed him towards it. Hurry up, I don't like being here. Zane took the key and marched to the box expecting an adult to chase him off at any moment. When he reached the box he tried putting the key in the lock, but his hand was shaking. He got it on the third try. When he opened the little door on the side, bills pushed out. He couldn't believe how many were inside. He also realized the flaw in his uncle's plan. He didn't have pockets in his shorts. It was too hot for jeans. Come here, said Zane, waving his cousin over. Keelan stayed put, shaking his head. No, I need you like now. Keelan came over and whistled when he saw the amount of money. Shove these in your pockets, said Zane, grabbing handfuls and handing them to Keelan. Before long, his pockets were bulging as if he were carrying baseballs. Zane was grabbing another handful to shove in Keelan's back pockets when an older man with pale, wrinkly skin came teetering out of the grocery store with a cane. Get away from there, you thieves, he said, swinging his cane through the air. Zane froze and then moved to run, 
but he remembered what his uncle had said. We're not thieves, said Zane. Then why the hell are you stuffing money in that boy's pockets? asked the old man. We forgot the bag, said Zane. The old man leaned over his cane. That sounds like a cock and bull story to me. Why would you two boys be collecting for the society? And don't make me remind you whose money that is. We know, said Keelan. We do errands for the mayor. She sent us down but we forgot the bag. Zane held the key up. See, official key and everything. The old man stood straight. Come well then. I guess I'm mistaken. It's understandable sir, said Zane, remembering that old people like titles. The old man reached into his wallet, pulled out the loan $20 bill inside, and handed it over. You can have this one as well, and make sure and tell them who gave it to you. Zane looked at the old man's threadbare tan pants, the rattiness of his wallet. Before he could say anything, Keelan said, you should keep that. The society's doing all right. No, no. I must insist, said the old man with a hint of desperation. This bill is a down payment on good fortune later. Trust me, boys. Zane could see the old man wasn't going to take no for an answer, and he didn't want to linger around the box much longer, so he reluctantly accepted the bill. Thank you, said Zane flatly. We'll pass on your name. Winston Appleton. Got it, said Zane, making a face as if he were memorizing the name as he locked up the box. The old man watched them until they went around the corner. Keelan met his gaze and it matched how he felt. I feel like an asshole, said Keelan. We are assholes. When Uncle Jesse showed up in the platypus, they climbed in, foregoing the normal jockeying for shotgun. Uncle Jesse patted Keelan's pockets in appreciation, before pulling into the road. I see on your faces that it wasn't as pleasant as you thought it was going to be. Zane could only muster a tiny shake of the head. Uncle Jesse clucked his tongue. Just remember, as painful as that was, it's better than the alternative. You don't want to be a watcher, and you don't want to be one of the fools that lick their boots. In my opinion, it's better to be a son of a bitch than a sucker. Chapter 4. 13th Ward, October 2014. Tramp stamps not allowed. I want it on my butt. The words hung in the air before Percival, assaulting the picture of meticulous Englishness that he wore like polite armor. One leg was crossed over the other, and his hands rested on his knees. He blinked twice, his eyes fluttering as if he were a blushing maid. Of course, Miss Portia, I will place the imbuement on whatever part of your body that you wish, including your derriere, said Percival, as he collected the tattoo gun from the stainless steel tray. Please remove your knickers and I shall begin. With a mischievous grin held tightly on her lips, Portia dropped her yoga pants, panties included, and leaned over in front of Percival. This behavior was of no surprise to Zane and the rest of the team, because they lived with her. It didn't bother her one bit to sit and read in the common area of their apartment in the nude, spell tomes propped on her knees. Percival, who certainly had placed imbuements on even the most delicate parts of the body, had not been ready for the abruptness of her clothing removal. But true to his Englishness, he recovered quickly with a clearing of the back of his throat. The gun buzzed to life, and he placed the needle against her backside. Receiving their second imbuement seemed to take less time than it had their first year, probably because it wasn't as unknown as it was before, though instructor Penny Whistle, who had accompanied them on this trip, had said nothing about the nature of its magic. It also helped that instructor Penny Whistle, wearing an all-black ensemble including high heels and a high ponytail, was more engaging than instructor Allgood, who thought that the ability to glow at while smiling was an asset. After the imbuements had been given, the instructor gave Percival a peck on the cheek and led them to the portal. They came out into a dim cavern. Behind them was an obsidian arch surrounded by a low wall. Back in the Undercity, said Vin. At least this time we're not rescuing Skylar's magical vibrator. Skylar tweaked Vin's nipple, resulting in a yelp. I deserve that, said Vin, grinning. Instructor Penny Whistle looked on disapprovingly. Come. We've a little ways to go before you get to try out your new imbuements. Zane had been itching to flood his imbuement with phase, but he knew that would be dangerous without knowing what it would do. When they reached a huge cavern that contained a faint orangish glow at the back, Instructor Penny Whistle tilted her head, looking like whatever it was was unexpected. Something wrong, asked Zane. Devil dogs. 
probably a foolish student from another hall, toying with spells they were not equipped for. Hubris is the death of many a mage, she said, glancing towards Zane with the hint of a smile at the corner of her lip. Are they dangerous? he asked. For the group of us, no, but they can be trouble for a single mage without a good understanding of their abilities. But that's not the lesson we came here for. We'll go another way, she said, and led them towards a different tunnel. After another hour, in which they'd passed through countless caverns filled with strange phosphorescent fungi and dark bodies of water that they carefully avoided, they reached a cave that seemed to repel the luminosity from their mage lights. Instructor Pennywhistle smiled as they stared at the line where the darkness swallowed the glow. Perceptive, she said by way of compliment. The cavern before you has been cloaked in magical darkness. Sight is impossible, at least by normal means. One by one, you will traverse it while avoiding the dangers contained within. Dangers? asked Vin. Nothing too terrible. Pit traps, blade rooms, a few wandering snapjaws that might take off your hand if you get too close and other assorted surprises that I'll let you find on your own. It's quite the fun little challenge if you ask me, said Instructor Pennywhistle, waggling her meticulous eyebrows. You have a strange sense of fun, said Skylar. Hopefully the imbuement we just got will give us eye and skin or something. Nothing so mundane, said Instructor Pennywhistle, as if the thought of having eye and skin would ruin her carefully cultivated look. When properly fueled, the imbuement heightens your senses quite significantly. So we're supposed to make our way through the darkness just by listening, asked Zane. This is a lesson best learned by doing rather than being explained, she said. Skylar, you're first. I'll be waiting on the other side. I will not interfere no matter what happens inside. I'll send a signal when the next student should enter. Skylar looked quite alarmed. What happens if we get hurt in there? Or can't figure out how to use our imbuement? Without missing a beat, Instructor Pennywhistle said, then you shouldn't have joined the academy. Oh, I almost forgot to add. Normal magic won't work in there, so don't think you can bash your way through it with force bolts. Imbuements only. I will bid you good luck, even though luck has nothing to do with it. Instructor Pennywhistle disappeared into the darkness, leaving them alone. Everyone looked at Skylar, whose face was etched with concern. Her shoulders were bowstring tight. Don't worry, Skylar, said Portia, putting a hand on her shoulder. You're gonna do great. Before Skylar could enter the darkness, Zane said, wait. Don't go in. What? They all said to him. Let's figure out the imbuement before she goes in, said Zane. Pennywhistle didn't say we couldn't. Good point, said Vin. Anything that keeps me from going in there is good with me, said Skylar. I hate the idea of not being able to see. All right, let's do this, said Zane. But start slow, not too much. He closed his eyes, letting Faze trickle into the imbuement. A prickly warmth flooded outward from the back of his head, traveling down his spine pleasurably, until it felt like he was being bathed in mint. Gasps erupted around him, so he opened his eyes. Portia looked like she was in the middle of an orgasm. I can feel everything, she said. Oh, Miedo, what a good day to wear my favorite silk panties. I can totally feel the way the breeze blows through the cavern, like it's a living thing, said Vin. Skylar's eyes were wide. I can hear your heartbeats. Zane was aware they were speaking, but it was hard to concentrate with so many inputs. He could hear water dripping in the cavern behind them, the lingering smell of perfume that remained on Skylar's wrist, the scuffing of Vin's sneakers as he balled his feet inside of them. He opened his eyes again to see the others staring at him. What? You're all quiet. Are you feeling it? asked Vin. Almost too much. It's a bit overwhelming, he said. How much phase did you use? asked Skylar. Wait. Never mind. I remember how far you jumped on the course last year. You're probably hearing the city above. Wondering if he could, Zane concentrated pouring more and more phase into his imbuement until he felt like a satellite dish for the universe, transfixed by the inputs. In the distance he heard the scraping of claws on stone, probably the devil dogs, but they were still far away. He felt other things but he had no name for them and decided to pull back, letting the phase relax. Could you imagine what sex would feel like? asked Portia breathlessly. Everyone held still with thought considering her question. Then he heard, as clear as if she were standing next to him, Instructor Pennywhistle say from across the cavern, 
It's better than Christmas with the Pope, and you all can experiment later, amongst yourselves if you want, but enough playtime sends Skylar in. His eyes burst open, and he let his hearing return to normal. Um, did you guys hear that? Judging by their blushing, they'd heard the instructor as well. Sheepishly, Skylar slipped into the darkness. Wish me luck. After a 40-minute wait, which was punctuated by occasional gasps and the sound of steel on stone, Instructor Penny Whistle notified them Skylar had made it through, and asked for Vin next. Then after an hour Portia entered, leaving Zane alone. He used his imbuement to listen to the action in brief increments, but didn't want to wear himself out while waiting. Keeping Faze in the imbuement for a long period of time would be challenging enough. When it was Zane's turn, he stepped into the darkness, his senses tingling with newness. He let himself acclimate to the lack of sight, feeling the way the stone reflected his heat like an echo. He sensed a rock column two feet in front of him and reached out to brush the rough stone with his fingertips before stepping around it. He found he could navigate if he moved slowly, waiting until the picture of the cavern drew itself against his skin, but the problem was his sight only extended five feet at the most and if he encountered a challenge further out, he would be blind to it. Zane poured more phase into his imbuement, drawing in the world around him. Immediately he felt a presence to his left, low to the ground, lumbering forward. A snap jaw he presumed. It had the outline of a large turtle in his mind. He might have missed it had he not used more phase, since he was focused forward. Moving to his right to avoid the slow-moving creature, Zane felt a thin steel wire press against his ankle. He threw himself backwards as a blade sliced through the air. He slammed his shoulder into a sharp point on a rocky column, slipped on scree and fell right before the snap jaw. Zane switched his phase from senses to speed and pushed off the ground as if he were doing a push-up, straight into the air and back on his feet, right as the creature's jaws snapped in front of his nose. He backed away carefully after shifting back to his senses, rubbing his shoulder that had sustained quite a blow in his escape. Clever bastard, you were waiting near the trap for an opportunity like that, said Zane, as he stepped over the second and third wire that were stretched across the path. Rather than use his senses like a general purpose beacon, Zane switched between fine focus and broad pulses, first seeing the world as a map, then homing in on the potentially deadly details. This taxed his phase faster, but he wasn't feeling particularly challenged yet, so he amped it up another level, but the picture further than 10 feet out grew fuzzy. So Zane took a deep breath to warm the air in his lungs, then blew out, seeing the heat swirl before him like a colorful flood until it crashed against the obstacles further out. That's better, he said. Feeling more confident, he pushed himself through the maze of caverns, avoiding the traps with more ease. He figured he was about halfway through the course when he heard the scrape of nails on stone again. The devil dogs had entered his cavern, and as he threw his senses in their direction, he could hear their sniffing as they tracked his path through the maze. He considered calling for help, but even if he did, the others wouldn't reach him before the devil dogs, and he'd only give himself away. He thought about trying to climb to a higher place, a rocky ledge or the top of a column, but he didn't know what devil dogs were capable of. Trapped in the dark without a weapon, and being hunted like a rabbit. Great. There were three devil dogs. Two were headed directly towards him, following the path he'd taken, while the third was flanking. The first two would probably try to push him into the third. Clever girls, he thought, wondering if they were even gendered. But two can play at that game. Using himself like a radar station, Zane spun in place, amping his senses to their limits. He found what he was looking for, but the snap jaw was on the other side of the devil dogs. He'd have to get past them somehow, if he wanted to lure them to the armored creature. Zane checked back to the devil dogs, only to find them missing from their previous location. He scanned quickly, looking further out, thinking they might have backtracked or found something more interesting. The thrumming heartbeat of a beast about to pounce was the only warning Zane had before the devil dogs leapt. In a burst of phase, Zane sprinted forward, oblivious to the possibility of knocking himself out on a wall. Frustrated by his escape, the devil dogs made noises that sounded like dying men. Their haunting wails made him want to cower into a ball. Without realizing it, Zane stopped running. His muscles had hardened until he could barely take a single step forward. It was like moving through molasses. He sensed a devil dog creeping around the corner, about 15 feet from his location. 
While the screams of the other two had taken the flight from his limbs, the third was readying itself to tear out his throat. Zane realized why he couldn't move almost too late. Their cries had some effect on prey, and as apt as he was through the imbuement, he was more susceptible. Dropping his senses, Zane found he could move again. The devil dog leapt. Zane threw himself to the left, then blindly sprinted in a random direction. The air rushed by his face. He made it a good twenty feet before the floor fell away. He managed to push off the edge of the pit, and hooked the far edge with his fingertips, crashing heavily into the wall. His fingers slipped, and he slid to the bottom of the pit, landing hard on his heels, snapping his teeth together painfully. At the bottom of the pit, Zane sensed spikes as tall as he was that he'd narrowly avoided. But he couldn't sense the devil dogs. They'd gone silent, and his location confused his ability to see the maze. He wasn't entirely sure that one of them wasn't above him, waiting for him to climb out. Zane tried to form a force bolt, hoping that the anti-magic field didn't extend into the pit, but the spell sputtered at his fingertips. He leaned forward, extending his senses upward. A devil dog was waiting at the edge as he expected. He was trapped without magic, stuck at the bottom of a pit. Think Zane. What do I have that I can use as a weapon? He tugged on a pit spike. It was fastened to the floor. He used his phase strength to bend it back and forth, until he was able to snap it off at the base. While he hadn't trained with the spear in Allgood's dojo, he was familiar enough with the concept. Stab it with the pointy end seemed like a good tactic, but he was aware that he knew nothing about devil dog physiology. For all he knew they could have hardened stone skin, or they naturally repelled iron weapons. But he also sensed the approach of the other two devil dogs. If he didn't deal with the first soon, he'd have to fight all three at once. The one above the pit probably just wanted to keep him in place until the others could arrive. The pit was about 15 feet deep, and he had a short space to run across one side. Zane took a deep breath and sprint jumped off the far wall, catapulting himself out of the pit and behind the devil dog. He stabbed forward only to find the air empty. He almost realized too late that the creature had somehow teleported behind him. Zane spun around in time for the devil dog to impale itself on his makeshift spear. That was how the others had moved so quickly. They could teleport short distances. It probably took a sizable amount of phase to do, which was why they couldn't do it often. Zane put his boot against the dead devil dog's head and pushed it off the end of the spear. The smell of acrid blood filled the air. Zane hurried away before the others arrived. Without their wails in the air, Zane comfortably used his extended senses, moving through the maze. He kept his reflexes on a hair trigger, splitting phase between the two imbuements. The two devil dogs pursued him with vigor, their claws clacking against the stone. They were so close behind he could feel their hot breath against his back. He guessed they were trying to get close enough to teleport onto him, trapping him, and tear him limb from limb. He could practically feel their teeth against his throat. He had to find a place he could defend himself, keep the devil dogs from getting behind him, but the passages were wide. Using the traps against them was out of the question, since they had avoided them with ease. The only warning he had that they teleported was a telltale metallic fizz that tickled his nose. The first arrived ten feet before him, opening its mouth to nail his feet to the floor with a horrible wail. The second was right behind, readying its leap. Zane had nowhere to go. He released the sensing imbuement and leapt straight into the air, as the devil dog flew under his feet and crashed into its brethren. There was a brief scramble of claws and growling, during which Zane resumed his sensing and took off into the maze. But their ambush had disoriented him, and he ran into a dead end. Keeping his back against the cool stone wall, Zane held the spear before him, preparing to drop his sensing should they use their wails against him. Come on, let's get this over with. He heard their silent approach, call used pads scraping along the stone. At first he was confused by what he heard. It sounded like the devil dogs were stutter-stepping, but then he realized what it meant. Two more devil dogs had joined the first pair. Somewhere behind the other two, he heard the low growls of a fifth. The pack surrounded his spot against the wall, blocking any escape. And once the first one used its wail against him, he'd be blind to their attacks. I'm taking at least two of you with me, said Zane, gripping his spear tightly. He heard the beginnings of a wail, then a new figure moved into the cavern, right into the middle of the pack. He heard the sound of knives unfolding, and suddenly blood was in the air. 
At first he thought it was Instructor Pennywhistle, and the outline felt like her, moving through the devil dogs with deadly precision, but he caught another familiar smell that wasn't her. But this thought quickly faded as he charged into the fray, stabbing the nearest devil dog through the neck. The pair of them slaughtered the pack with ease, though Instructor Pennywhistle did most of the work. When they were finished, the smell of hot blood hung in the air. Zane was breathing heavily. Are you well? asked Instructor Pennywhistle. A few scrapes and bruises, said Zane. I'll take that over a ripped out throat any day. Come, let's get to the others where I can see you, she said. Stay on my heels, I'll take you through the safest route. After a ten minute run, they came out into a lighted cave. Even though the light was dim, Zane had to squint and hide his eyes with his hand. The others surrounded him. Are you okay? asked Skylar, touching his arm. I don't think I'll ever look at a rabbit the same way, said Zane. Instructor Penny Whistle examined his wounds. Nothing a soak in the healing springs at the academy won't fix. Her eyes searched his face. That was quite an impressive defense under difficult circumstances. Just trying to stay alive, he said. The instructor had other thoughts hanging on her lips, but she held back. She squeezed his shoulder. Come. Enough adrenaline for the day. You all passed with flying colors. We're not far from a way out of the undercity. We'll be back in the honeycomb in no time, and you can take a break from taxing your imbuements, said Instructor Pennywhistle. No way, ma'am, said Portia. What do you mean, Portia? Portia held her tongue against her teeth. My imbuement is getting a long workout tonight. Chapter 5 Fourth Ward, August 2014 Knowledge is free, but wisdom ain't cheap. From where he was standing on the steps of the city library, the steady noises of the morning rush hour filled Zane's ears like the cicadas of Varna. Tires screeched as a blue luxury Aladdin nearly hit a ghost taxi that had pulled out from the curb, followed by a hammered horn and the muted shouts of an angry driver. I don't think that guy is going to get the satisfaction he wants, said Keelan from the step below, hands shoved in his pockets as he squinted into the morning sun at the traffic on the wide street. Sometimes we have to try something, even when it might not matter, said Zane. Why do you drag me out to the city library? asked Keelan. I swear every time I feel caught up on studying, they dump another truckload of books on my desk. Research, said Zane, heading inside and going straight to the back of the enormous building complex. He'd scouted the library on the internet, so he knew exactly where he needed to go. The inside of the city library had a classic Greek appeal, with nooks for reading along every wall. The quietness was starkly different from the bustle outside, but strangely soothing, making Zane sad that he hadn't had the chance to join a different hall than the academy, one more esoteric or academic. But he doubted that another hall would be equipped to help him with his situation in Varna. What are we? started Keelan, until he heard his voice echo on the endless marble. He tried again, this time at a whisper. What are we here for? he asked, his face scrunched with the effort of being quiet. While you were hobnobbing with the watches this summer, I was busy trying to figure out what's really going on in Varna, said Zane. You still think you can do anything about that? asked Keelan, as he watched a group of women around their age walk past, whispering and throwing glances in their direction. I have to try, said Zane. Keelan put a hand on Zane's shoulder. Actually you don't. You can go on with your life and make the best of it. This other thing is just going to get people killed. Zane searched his cousin's face. I get it. Varna has hit you harder than it has me. We all miss your dad. But that's why I've got to do something. If you don't want to be a part of it, I get that, but don't try to stop me. Keelan pulled away and held his arms around his midsection. The accusation had wounded him. I'm not trying to stop you. I just think you should consider the consequences. It won't be just you paying the price, it'll be your family too. Remember what they did to my mom. But don't you want to know what happened? Nobody in the family talks about it. I've asked my dad, he brushes off my questions. Doesn't it matter how or why Uncle Jesse died? It was as if he'd splashed cold water across his cousin's face. You say that like I wasn't the one there, right in the middle of it, said Keelan. He was my dad, even if he was an asshole. Zane was about to respond, when he noticed other people in the library staring at them. He threw his arm around his cousin's shoulders and pulled him towards the wide marble stairs. 
Even if we can't do anything about the lady, at the end of these five years, we're stuck in Varna. Don't you want to know what's really going on before then? And maybe along the way we can find out what happened to your dad, said Zane. It was the truth, though Zane suspected that the circumstances of Uncle Jesse's death would teach him something important about the Lady of Varna. Keelan put up a half-smile that Zane knew all too well. His cousin had spent most of his lifetime burying his pain, and he knew how to do it without giving too much away. I suppose it wouldn't hurt to know about Varna anyway, said Keelan. Zane squeezed Keelan's shoulder. Great. I knew you'd be up for this. Keelan craned his head in all directions. It's not like you're likely to find anything. The restricted section had a large wrought iron gate that went across the room. A red-haired girl, who was not much older than they were, looked like a cross between a librarian and a security guard. Her blue blazer with the patch on the lapel was at odds with the expression of absolute boredom on her face as she thumbed through her smartphone. He was so amused by her expression that he didn't realize she was taller than him and Keelan until they were standing before her. She was built like a bodybuilder, with powerful thighs and toned arms. Restricted section, she said by way of dismissal. Her grey-green eyes barely flicked up at them. That's good, said Zane, trying to ignore how good her floral perfume smelled, because I'd hate to think the children's section needed such protection. Unless the giving tree is considered socialist propaganda. His attempt at humour did not amuse her, though it got a soft snort from Keelan. Instead, she looked at him over imaginary glasses, even going so far as to hang her finger above her eye as if she were pushing them down. The gesture might have been ridiculous if anyone else had tried it, but she exuded a confidence that helped her pull it off. Standing so close he realised that she was quite beautiful, even with her hair in a messy updo and wearing a standard-issue blue blazer. When she didn't say anything, Zane cleared his throat. May we enter the restricted section? Only if you have authorization, she said, wrinkling her freckled nose. And I can tell by your attitude that you have none. Zane straightened himself. He'd misjudged her, thinking the sarcasm might be appreciated, but now he realized he'd only hardened her opinions against them. My apologies. My first comment was rude. We're second years. We wish to enter the restricted section for research. She rolled her eyes in dramatic fashion. Wonderful. And I'd like to be sitting in a hot tub drinking spiced wine, but instead, I'm here earning less per hour than it takes to buy a crappy coffee. You may not enter. Again, I apologize. But I need to do some important research, he said. Which again you may not, she replied hastily. I'm a member of the Hundred Halls. I should be able to enter, he said. She placed a fingernail against his shoulder. It is not a matter of should, it is a matter of the proper paperwork. You have not applied for or received the authorization for entry. We have rules for a reason, to keep idiots who might fancy themselves as majors from delving into things they are not equipped to handle. If I were to apply for access, where would I do so and how long would it take? He asked. Forms can be found at the spire, the accounting section I believe, though you'll need access to that floor. Don't ask me how to get that. To acquire the forms will require permission from your patron and a personal room, in addition to a safety deposit totaling at least one year of future salary. All of that will need to be turned in to the library inspector general, who is only here every third Sunday from 2 to 4 p.m. due to the dangerousness of the books. You'll also need an abjured binding and a living will, which should include what will happen to your body should a demon eat your eyeballs and seize your soul for down payment. When she was finished, she took her long fingernail and flicked a piece of lint off Zane's shoulder. Now shoo. Frustrated, Zane marched away with Keelan at his side. Wow, she must have gorgon blood or something, said Keelan. Near the marble stairs that went back to the main section of the library, Zane paused and glanced back at the guardian of the restricted section, who was back into her smartphone, thumbing away with bored abandon. Thinking about trying to sneak past. Or climb the bars or something, asked Keelan. It wouldn't work, said Zane. They're covered in protective runes. If I'm going to get in there, it's going to be through her. He pounded his fist into an open palm. She's infuriating. I don't even know what I did to set her off. Maybe she doesn't like mages, said Keelan. Then why work at the hall library in front of the restricted section? Maybe that's the exact reason. 
so she can be a thorn in their sides, said Keelan. She's a thorn in my side, said Zane. I'll never get in. It'll take you forever to get access if even half those things are true, said Keelan. That's the thing. I don't think any of those things are true. He considered his first impressions of her. She acted bored but right away put up roadblocks. Why bother with all of that? What was she after? Then he remembered her comment about the pay. He felt like an idiot that he hadn't heard it the first time. He marched back to the Guardian. She looked at him, like a teenage girl looked at an overly enthusiastic gym teacher. He half expected her to blow a gum bubble and let it pop in his face. What do you want? he asked. For you to go away, she said. To get in, he said. What's the price? At the mention of price the corner of her lip twitched, and her eyes took on a heavy cast as if she were purring inside. If you don't know then you don't get in. Do you need money? An enchantment? Look, it's important that I get into the restricted section. It's personal. I would really appreciate it if you'd tell me what it is I need to do, said Zane with his hands wide. Tell you what, she said giving him a once over. If you strip down naked and make a loop through the library, I'll let you into the restricted section. They'll kick me out first, said Zane incredulous. That's not my problem, she said. Fine, he said, yanking off his shirt and unclasping the button on his jeans to her sudden wide eyes. But a deal's a deal. He had his jeans down to his thighs when a voice startled them from behind. Tally, what the hell is going on? I ask you to watch my station and now you've got young men stripping for you. Suddenly, the reality of the situation became embarrassingly clear. Heat rose to Zane's cheeks as he pulled his jeans back up. Sorry Fran, she said, shrugging one shoulder offhandedly. I was bored. Fran, an older woman with curly black hair, raised an eyebrow at Zane's chest before he could pull his shirt back on. At least you've got good taste, said Fran. I'd better get back to my station. Tally winked at them. See you around, boys. Thanks for the show. Zane had almost forgotten about his cousin until he heard a snort. Within seconds, Keelan was bent over at the waist laughing. Fully clothed again, Zane asked, So, Dot, may I enter the restricted section? Fran screwed up her face at him. Yeah, go ahead. You just can't take any books out of here, and no spells or you'll set off the alarms. Thanks, said Zane sheepishly, tugging his cousin along by the shirt. Come on, Keelan. I can't believe you were going to strip and run around the library, said Keelan, holding his hand over his mouth trying to contain his laughter. By the time Keelan had contained himself, Zane had found the section he wanted in back, where the musty smell of books was thickest. It also had a slight tinge of phase, as if some of the books had been imbued with the scent. Keelan started on one end, while he worked through the other. What am I looking for? asked Keelan, still smiling from the earlier events. Anything about Varna, or well, that seems familiar, said Zane. The section related to magical towns and other locations that had a heavy concentration of mages. His previous internet searches had been frustrating, as it seemed like information about the town was being suppressed. He tried searching the town's history, the names of well-known watchers, the speaker, and the lady herself, though he didn't know her name, but had come up empty. He hoped that by approaching the problem from a different angle, he might find something. He assumed someone somewhere had noticed that a high concentration of mages had come from one small town, and nearly all went on to join the Academy of the Subtle Arts. But after two hours of checking titles and skimming books, they'd exhausted the section. Sorry we didn't find anything, said Keelan, as he was sliding the final book back into place. But we should be getting back to the honeycomb soon. Zane rubbed the back of his head. It feels like Varna is a black hole to the world. There's no mention anywhere, not even tangentially. It's almost like you can't write about it. We're the fight club of magic, said Keelan. As they were walking away, Zane trailed his fingers along the shelf. The polished wood was soothing to his fingertips, but when he hit a rough patch he stopped. There was a carving in the wood, in the form of initials. They read AM. Do these initials mean anything to you? asked Zane. Keelan gave a half shrug like part of him recognized it but couldn't bring it to the forefront of his mind. Does it look like there used to be another book here? asked Keelan. You're right there was, said Zane. Maybe we can find out from the library system. There was a terminal nearby. They didn't find anything about the missing book, if there really was one. 
Can we leave now? asked Keelan. Zane mulled the initials AM, hoping to spark a new direction, but when nothing came to mind he pushed Keelan towards the exit. The mysteries of Varna would have to wait for another day. Chapter 6 The Honeycomb, October 2014 A lesson in sex phase and drowning. The grotto smelled like wet stones and the sweat of young men and women waiting for their instructor to arrive. The second years sat around in their swimsuits, comfortable bearing a good portion of their bodies to their classmates. Modesty was a thing of the past. Their first year in the academy had been a terrifying sleepless adventure, and while their second had even less sleep, there was much more interaction between the teams, especially after they'd received their imbuements. Zane stood in back, watching the covert glances between various partners. Portia was currently sleeping with Charla, Andrew and Marcelo, which overlapped with Vin's interests minus Andrew. Keelan had three or four regular partners. Skylar had two. As intertwined as the relationships had gotten, instructor Pennywhistle had spent a morning teaching them spells for practicing safe sex, and reminding them that they were members of the academy first, teammates second, and their various dalliances should come last. Zane caught his cousin's eye for a moment, giving him a questioning glance. Keelan had a bad history with water. He gave a thumbs up as if to say everything was fine. It wasn't their first class in the grotto, but he knew Keelan stressed out before each one. Zane returned to mentally mapping the relationships between the second years and didn't notice Sophia sidle next to him until her soft shoulder brushed against his, and when he met her gaze she stared back with wide brown eyes. Sophia was Brazilian. Her plush lips had been made for kissing. You don't seem like the shy type, Zane, she said, letting her accent color her words. I'm not shy, he said as her gaze roved across his six-pack. Then why have you rebuked every advance boy or girl, she asked, her dark eyes studying his reaction. I've been busy. Busy? A little fun doesn't take that much time, unless you want it to. I wouldn't cause too much of a fuss. I would visit you, have as much fun as you can take, and be gone before you woke. You're beautiful, Zane, and our gifts, she brushed her fingernails across a rose tattoo on her hip that appeared briefly before disappearing, create such a wonderful experience. Warmth bloomed across his skin, and he did everything he could not to imagine leaning forward and pressing his lips against hers. If they'd been back in his room, he wasn't sure he would have been able to say no. But he was standing in the middle of the grotto, and Amber de Croix's warning last year that any relationship he enjoyed would end in tragedy made him wary. These were his fellow students, his teammates and friends. He didn't want to put them in danger. I? Whatever horrible denial he would have attempted, he thankfully never had to utter, because instructor Noyade slipped out of the water. She was a lithe woman with sea-green hair and eyes the color of emeralds. Good morning, students, she said, her soft French accent like having silk brushed against their ears. My apologies for the delay. Instructor Noyade was notoriously late. She lived in a cave far beneath the surface. Full breaths and into the water. You know how to stay beneath the surface using your imbuements, but now you must learn to use external magic, she said, and she dove into the water like a knife, leaving no trace of her entry. They splashed into the water, attempting grace but sounding more like a truckload of boulders being dumped into the pool. After swimming around and getting his muscles loose, Zane took a deep breath, using his imbuement to capture far more oxygen than he would have been able to contain otherwise, and kicked beneath the surface. The downside to this technique was that the mage didn't experience the aches of oxygen deprivation until it was too late. If you passed out with no one there to save you, you'd be dead. But he was in no danger here, with so many of his classmates around him. They formed a sphere around Instructor Noyade, with Zane at the bottom, where the depth pressed on his skin. She spoke and silvery bubbles released from her lips. The words travelled to their ears as quivering, hollow sounds. The first thing I must teach you is how to speak underwater. There are spells that can impart the ability for a short time, but they require preparation. You will of course learn those spells, but I will be teaching you how to create magic when you aren't expecting to be immersed in water. Maybe you've crashed a plane into the ocean, or you've fallen through the ice on a frozen pond. You never know what dangers your role in the academy will bring. As the instructor spoke, Zane noticed that Sophia had drifted next to him. Her brown hair floated around her head like a halo. 
Instructor Noyade continued, the secret is to subvocalize the words. That the words exit your lips is not important. It is enough that your vocal cords vibrate with the right tones, creating the frequency required for the spell. This is similar to how the Serene Hall and the Stone Singers make their magic. If the spell requires a manual component, you must match the pace of your words with the pace of your finger dexterity. As you all know, the timing of your spells, hitting your syllable marks, the clarity of your fingering shapes, these focus the phase into your spell. So if you fail to accommodate to the resistance of the water, you will not achieve your desired effect and just might cause a problem far worse than whatever has confounded you. I suggest only attempting simple spells underwater, ones with a failure mode that can be survived. In fact, when you return to your rooms, you'll find a list of spells you must learn before tomorrow's class. A barely audible groan traveled through the water. Instructor Penny Whistle had given them until tomorrow to master the Japanese tea ceremony. Every week, they had a new cultural ritual to learn. Zane hadn't even started learning it, since he'd been scouring the city libraries looking for more information on Varna. He'd have to find a way to survive without sleep again. I will show you a simple spell. One that will create a... Instructor Noyade paused as Eddie broke from the top of the sphere to take another breath. She watched him the whole way along with the rest of the class, who wore mirthful grins. It looks like someone hasn't been practicing, said the instructor. You will see me after class to enjoy 30 dives to help you learn how to hold your breath. Eddie both paled and blushed, which turned into blotches on his sallow skin. The instructor's punishment meant swimming from the surface to the bottom, which was 200 feet down, then back up. The first few weeks of class they'd spent learning how to get to the bottom without passing out. It was a grueling punishment. With the distraction out of the way, instructor Noyade taught them a simple spell to allow communication. They paired up to practice. Sophia captured Zane right away, leaving no doubt as to her intentions. Why do you resist me? asked Sophia, floating in the water across from him. The speaking spell required a brief hum at the base of the throat with a touch of phase, before releasing his words through the water. I'm not resisting. I'm busy, he said. You heard the instructor. We have to learn another batch of spells before tomorrow, and I still don't know the tea ceremony. We've been busy but not that busy, she replied. What are you up to, Zane Carter? It's my second year contest group, he lied. We've been meeting a lot. Sophia pursed her lips at him. I know you're not being truthful, and while I do not know why, I know you can't keep this pace up. I'll be fine, he said, though he didn't believe himself. He'd figured out if he kept a low amount of phase running through his sensory imbuement, he could stay awake for long periods of time. He was on the third day in a row, and it was looking like he'd have to risk a fourth. You don't look like it. She wrapped a leg around his, and a pleasurable electricity shot through him. Let me help you take some burden off. Or at the very least let me be a distraction. His face was fuzzy with warmth. He'd never imagined that being seduced would be difficult. His body was desperately trying to betray him. Sophia floated against him. Her skin softly caressed his. As they drifted further beneath their classmates, going deep enough that the distance hid their movements, she pressed her lips against his, and his mind exploded with a shiver that went down to his toes. This was going to be much harder than he thought. The way she was touching his hips, tugging slightly on his swimsuit, suggested she was willing to take him there. You can't tell me that you don't have time now, and this would be a form of practicing our spells. I think instructor Noyade would approve, said Sophia with her lips against his ear. She placed her teeth against his neck, biting down hard, and dug her fingernails into his back. Zane choked for a moment as he forgot to maintain his spells. He had to stammer to put them back in place. He glanced up, seeing the nearest students as only a haze in the water. What was making this harder was that keeping his sensing imbuement running at all times was making him more susceptible to her advances. He nearly gave in, until Amber's predictions floated back into his mind. Why does this have to be so difficult? He dropped the imbuement, and a sledgehammer of exhaustion hit him. All his spells unraveled. He had to throw Faze back into them, or succumb to the water. Sophia had stopped her advances. Her luminous brown eyes were wide with worry. What's wrong? You just went limp all of the sudden like you'd fallen asleep, she said, rubbing her hand gently across his back. 
Don't you want to be with me? Having resumed using his imbuement, the lure of her touch was overwhelming. She'd wrapped her legs around him. He felt like he was being sensually strangled by an octopus. In a desperate attempt to stop the seduction but not fall asleep 70 feet below the surface, Zane shunted the phase from his sense of touch while keeping the sight and hearing which what was keeping him awake. The saturation of her touch immediately stopped. He wasn't sure how he'd done it. It had been a fit of desperation. Now that he was in control of himself, he kicked towards the group. Immediately, he realized something was wrong. No one was in the water except for him and Sophia. Pouring whatever reserves of phase he had into his imbuement, he powered through the water, throwing himself out like a dolphin at a park when he reached the surface. The class had circled around Keelan, who was sitting with his head between his knees, coughing. Instructor Noya Day was kneeling next to him, until she realized the class had surrounded them. Everyone back in the water. Keep practicing. Zane ignored the request. You okay, Cos? he asked. Keelan nodded his head without looking up. I don't know what happened. I'm sorry. If you cannot pass my class, then you will not be able to stay in the academy. While underwater missions are uncommon, they occur often enough that Pre expects everyone to be able to function like they do on land. Keelan rested his chin on his knees. His eyes were bloodshot. I know, I know. It won't happen again, he said as he climbed to his feet and headed back to the water. He dove in as soon as he hit the edge of the pool. Instructor Noyede appraised the spot where Keelan had dove in before frowning. Zane stepped into the pool after his cousin, before he had to answer any of her questions. Chapter 7 The Spire, November 2014 A side trip with implications. A month later, Zane was headed into the Spire when he saw a hooded figure standing inside the archway, leaning with their back against the wall so he couldn't see their face. The passageway leading to the lower level had been warded to only allow Hall students, which meant that whoever was waiting there was a student, but the way that person held themselves made every hackle on the back of his neck stand up. Readying himself to flee at the first sign of danger, Zane called out, You there. What are you doing? When the figure stepped aside, pulling back the dark grey hoodie, his face flushed with embarrassment. Patron Sai, he said, bowing his head. I'm not royalty, so don't treat me like one, said Priyanka, walking out from the archway with the grace of a panther. Her appearance on his way into the spire did not seem like coincidence. Am I in trouble? Probably, but that's not why I'm here, she said. I need the services of a student who can improvise and knows how to keep their mouth shut. Am I correct? Zane took a step back and glanced either way to make sure he wasn't being flanked. How do I know you're really her? he asked. The corner of her lips twitched with amusement. Your caution is well warranted, but let me dispel your concerns. While she stood and smiled at him, he felt a stab of pain like the beginnings of a migraine, right through the conduit he accessed his phase from, the same place he was linked to his patron. He put his hands to his temples, grimacing. That's a neat trick, one I hope to never enjoy again. I'm sorry I doubted you, he said, shaking his head. Never be sorry. Always doubt. Always. Now follow me. He pointed down the passageway. What about my group for the second year contest? They've been informed that you are currently ill and will not be joining their meetings for the foreseeable future, she said, striding back the way he'd come. I can't say I'm going to miss them, said Zane. They cut through a parking garage and entered a door marked as an electrical substation. Inside, a rack of cabinets clearly marked with danger symbols confused him until she closed the door and waved her hand. The illusion dissipated like smoke revealing an obsidian archway that he recognized as a portal in the garden network. Where are we going? Priyanka reached inside the neck of her shirt, pulling out what looked like an obsidian key. You get to learn why they call me the mistress of doors, she said. I'm taking you to Deathbird. Deathbird? That sounds like a thing not a place, he said. It's more of a joke, she said, and the way she said it suggested she didn't think it was that funny. This is a place people in our profession go to retire. You need information. Is this about those mages I saw get killed? Yes. But why not bring Keelan too? Because he's not the one that wanted to investigate the screams in the first place, and he's not the one who took down the goons' alpha network, she said. 
Why do you even need me to go? he asked. Priyanka closed her fist around the obsidian key and closed her eyes. The swirling portal came to life. She opened her eyes and held out her hand. It was calloused and firm. They stepped through the portal. Zayn expected the journey to take a blink of an eye, as it had for every other transit through the portal network. Usually the worst part was the vertigo, but it was brief and dissipated within moments of arrival. When it lasted longer than normal, he thought something was wrong. It felt like he'd been dropped off a mountain without a parachute. They landed hard. Priyanka held him steady when he tried to tumble over. There was a moment he thought he might vomit, but she squeezed his hand. Fight it back with your imbument speed not sensing. The latter would only make it worse, she said. When he was upright and able to move, Priyanka released his hand. He was standing in a room covered in crimson silks. A crystalline wash basin on a table invited cleansing, next to a decanter of sparkling water and glass tumblers. The journey had given him an awful thirst. He surged towards the decanter. Priyanka yanked him back. It's poison, she said. He took a second look at the table. Someone new to this place, having just traveled by portal and developed a thirst, would grab a drink, expecting hospitality. Just like he'd been about to do. The meaning of the word deathbird was coming into focus. She waited until he'd finished taking stock of the situation, leaving the room when he nodded his head. There were things she wasn't telling him, but he assumed there were reasons why. She looked over at him, her eyes creasing at the corners, an acknowledgement that his decision had been the proper one. This wasn't a teaching expedition, she was judging if he could handle himself in more challenging situations. The mistake at the entrance portal when he almost drank the poisoned water burned more deeply in retrospect. He'd failed that test, but since she hadn't sent him back it meant he wasn't finished. He had a good chance to prove himself, which if he could would help with his problem in Varna. Outside the portal room, he was presented with a city that stretched across many hills, nestled against a low mountain range covered in crystalline trees. A stray shaft of sunlight poked through the cloud layer, turning the peaks to brilliant flame. Zane shielded his eyes in reflex but found no discomfort from their glare. He watched for a minute as the shaft of sunlight travelled across one section of the range, filling the air above them with scintillating colours like a rainbow exploding into a million pieces. It's beautiful, he said. And deadly. A jog through that forest would leave you naught but bones. The city was less populated than he first thought. The hilltops, and he counted a dozen or so, were each covered in a Roman-looking villa, except for a fortress structure on a hill nestled against the mountains. Cobblestone roads connected the hills, crossing glittering rivers that meandered through the lowlands. He wanted to ask about who lived in the villas, but decided the time for questions was over. Though Priyanka exuded a calm exterior, he sensed a hair-trigger readiness beneath through the patron link. She kept glancing to places along the road, and he expected to see something or someone, but each time he found nothing but the empty air. It seemed odd that in a city of this size they'd seen not one person. He was beginning to wonder if it was a trick, when he finally spied someone across the second bridge. A man with bushy black hair, a handlebar moustache and a suit that belonged in the Old West, was sitting on a park bench reading a paper in a language Zane didn't recognize. Your kind isn't welcome here, you deceitful chicken-hearted cad, said the man with the moustache. I'd rather breathe the same air as an Iliopian death cloud than your tired, ill-handed corpse. His right arm, the one Zane couldn't see, was held awkwardly, as if he had a weapon. Zane readied a force bolt, preparing to knock the weapon out of his hand should he make a move towards his patron. Priyanka scowled back in his direction and I wouldn't be seen with a rotting skin tag that's uglier than a burnt boot, and has little more brain power than a dead guinea pig. The moustached man folded his paper as he stood, revealing a nasty-looking knife that hummed with a high-pitched vibration that set his teeth on edge. He had to fight to keep his hands from covering his ears, while next to him Priyanka either ignored or couldn't hear it. You're wanted in a thousand realms and each would hand over a small fortune for your corpse, said the man. A small fortune, she asked incredulously. There are a lot of ways I'll let you insult me, Hafton, but that is not one of them. The tension lasted for three whole breaths, until both of them burst into laughter, leaving Zane bewildered. Hafton twirled his knife into a sheath, silencing the horrible vibration, and met Priyanka for a hearty hug. 
They hooked their arms around each other, patting each other on the shoulders. Small fortune? Really? asked Priyanka. Her laughter made her hair dance around her face. If there's one way I know to prick you, it's your pride, said Halfton, a crooked smile on his lips. When Priyanka laid her eyes upon Zane, she looked almost sheepish, as if she were embarrassed about the exchange. Halfton raised an eyebrow with a bemused expression. Is this your new protege? he asked. When Priyanka glanced Askew clearing her throat, he chuckled. I'm sorry, he didn't know he was on the clock, did he? Halfton looked to Zane. Did you? I suspected, said Zane, feeling a kernel of pride in his gut, but also knowing that allowing himself to enjoy it would be dangerous. See, said Halfton, releasing Priyanka. If he couldn't figure that out, then you didn't want him in the first place. I would prefer to inform him on my own time, rather than through the lips of an overenthusiastic rogue who had to retire because he was banned from everywhere else. Halfton bowed gracefully, adding a flourish with his right hand. At your service. He winked at Zane. But I'm a half-wit compared to Priyanka. She's the best. Period. No one's ever beat her or outsmarted her. That's why I'm eternally glad that I'm retired, so I didn't accidentally run up against you. Priyanka crossed her arms. You've gotten soft, Halfton. I can see right through your flattery. What do you want? The three of them continued the journey. Zane followed their conversation intently, feeling both privileged that he was a witness to it and completely out of his element. You're here to see the Black Council, aren't you? asked Halfton. How would you know that? asked Priyanka. You wouldn't have come here otherwise. It's not like they have any love for you. So it must be important, which means the Black Council. Have you been stalking the portal gate? she asked. He raised one shoulder. I keep an eye out for opportunity. I thought the pact forbids getting involved unless someone breaks the rules, she said. It does, but that doesn't mean we don't politic here. It would get boring otherwise. He hesitated. Any chance you'll give me a sneak preview of what you're asking the council? Sorry, Halfton. I'd rather only explain it once, she replied. Fair enough. As they crested the rise, an exquisite horse-drawn carriage crossed the street further up. Purple curtains covering the door ruffled slightly, but never opened. Upon seeing that, Priyanka sighed heavily. Well, I guess they know I'm here. She looked to her moustached friend. What is it that you want? I can't promise anything but I owe you so I'll take that into account. Halfton straightened his vest. It's about a woman. This is my surprised face, said Priyanka deadpan. Let me guess, she's not in the business but you want to bring her to Deathbird. You know the rules, Halfton. Why ask? I'm planning on wearing them down through sheer annoyance, he said. I figure I have more than enough time. Priyanka rolled her eyes. If anyone can do it, you can. No one in the history of our profession has been more persistent. So you'll do it, he asked. Against my better judgment, she replied. Thanks, Pri. Halfton glanced over to Zane. When you're done here, let me take you to the bar and tell stories about her. You wouldn't believe the things she's done. Zane kept his expression neutral, though his mind soared. I'd like that. Absolutely not, said Priyanka. We have to get back to the halls after this. I'm not sure why you have such fealty to that place. It's not like they treat you well, said Halfton. It's my world and my people. I'll protect who I want, said Priyanka, giving Halfton a tight-lipped stare down. He threw his hands up apologetically. Sorry, Pri. I didn't mean to insult you. At least you've got a place to go back to. I probably wouldn't be here if I had one. Halfton clasped Zane on the shoulder. So how'd you do with the welcome water? You figure it out. Or did she let you drink it and administer the antidote afterwards? She warned me before I drank it, said Zane, glad that his dark skin hid his blushing cheeks. Warned you? She really is getting soft. In the early years she let a few protégés die, just as a warning to the other potentials, he said. I never did that, she said quickly. You did some awful things like that, said Halfton. Priyanka gave her friend a questioning glance, but then nodded her head in acceptance. She looked to Zane. In case you do hear some stories, which if they come from anyone but Halfton are probably true, know that sometimes in our profession it's hard to know if you really are the good guys, she said. The cobblestone streets led them to the slate-grey fortress, 
which didn't have an inch of tarnish on its walls. The structure had a weight to it, like it had existed for thousands of years. It was surrounded on three sides by the crystalline trees, leaving the only access through the front. There were no windows, only a door made of sunlight across a simple bridge. As they reached the crossing point, Halfton skidded to a halt. This is the place where I get off, he said. Halfton and Priyanka shared a hug. Don't be a stranger. I'll even buy you a drink or two. Priyanka laughed. How generous of you. She headed across the bridge. Come on, Zane. Before he moved to follow, Halfton stopped him by grabbing his arm. Be careful. Most of her protégés don't live long. But those that do are rewarded, replied Zane. Halfton snorted, squeezing his arm. Maybe you'll be fine. Good luck. Stay cunning. Zane followed Priyanka towards the door of light. She went through without hesitation. When his foot touched the first shafts of brilliance, a presence invaded his mind. It was alien and vast. It felt like something large and winged was descending upon him, as if he were a mouse hiding in the weeds, but there was no hiding from this thing in his mind. Zane knew without a doubt that if it didn't like what was in there, he'd never leave the fortress alive. Chapter 8 Deathbird, November 2014 Nothing ominous about a group called the Black Council. Relief flooded Zane as the presence retreated. He wanted to scrub himself with sand inside and out, even though it had only invaded the outer layers of his thoughts. It felt like something akin to the goon's amulet, except living and vaster, and it made him feel tiny and insignificant. What was that? he asked, rubbing his forearms as if he were cold. They stood in a gilded hall of white marble and golden filigree, which carried his voice in echo. Priyanka watched him with her dark eyes. A sad tale for another time. She gestured to the room. This place is the Bastille, part home to the Black Council, part armory, and part something else. It protects them. He felt less privileged that he'd been invited to join Priyanka, and more worried that he was getting involved with events far beyond his skills. Sensing his discomfort, she said, you can return to the halls if you'd like. No, he said right away. I'm just getting used to things. Good. You didn't seem like the type to run from danger, she said. I'd rather not run towards it either, unless absolutely necessary. He nodded towards the door of light behind them. What was that about a pact? Deathbird is hallowed ground. No fighting, stealing or killing here. It also gives the council jurisdiction over the wares of our tradecraft, when we try to work in realms not our own. Otherwise there'd be a never-ending war of escalation. What keeps people from breaking the pact? 1. If you ever want to retire here, then you have to follow the rules. 2. The Black Council can authorize a whole host of assassins to uphold the pact if necessary, and the punishment as you'll see in a little bit, if they bring you back alive, is ghastly, she said. The marble floor reflected the hard soles of Priyanka's thigh-high boots. He felt like he was marching towards an execution. Along the walls were glass cases filled with weapons of many shapes and sizes. Zane pointed to a jagged curved blade with a blue jewel in its hilt. A showpiece mostly, said Priyanka. The council doesn't keep the good weapons in plain sight to keep people from being tempted. Is everyone a thief? he asked. A glint of amusement flashed in her eyes. Each in their own way. A spy steals information, an assassin steals a life, and a diplomat is the worst of all of them. What do they steal? Empires, said Priyanka, as if the word held a hidden joke. They passed through open doors. Painted frescoes showed all manner of men, women and supernatural creatures dying in gruesome battles. While they were strolling across the marble floor, Priyanka's boots ringing against the stone, Zane caught movement to his right from a hidden alcove. He paused and Priyanka waited with him. Clearly she knew what it was, and was letting him experience it for himself. A creature the size of a man, made entirely of glass except for an internal structure of bright steel to help it move, marched towards them, stopping when it was about thirty feet away. Crimson jewels where its eyes should have been glimmered as it surveyed them. A glass guardian, said Priyanka. There are a dozen of the things in the Bastille. Always vigilant. Deadly to the point of cruelty. They don't look tough. Wouldn't a simple force bolt destroy one, he asked. Their frailty is the point. Inside that glass body is a colorless gas that turns your lungs to ash, leaving you gasping for air until you die. A bullet to the head would be preferable. 
That's diabolical. There's no way to fight it, said Zane as they resumed their journey. In the rotunda beyond the first hall, a spherical shimmering light filled the space at the center of the massive room. At first Zane thought it was a trick to make illumination appear solid, but then he realized it wasn't light, but something that looked like light. Vague shapes moved inside the spherical object, like sailors drowning in a pale sea. A sense of unease trickled down his spine. Are those people in there? Tight-lipped Priyanka answered, they were at one time. Her answer made him shiver, even if he didn't know why. She continued, if you break the pact then you are placed into the stasis field, where you feel immeasurable pain for an eternity. The thought of what he was witnessing made him nauseous. That's awful. It is. She examined the sphere with her chin high, clearly disgusted, but also not looking away. But sometimes maintaining the peace requires drastic measures. A curving staircase took them around the circumference of the room. Zane couldn't help but watch the shapes move in the sphere, wondering what they did that deserved such a fate. At the top of the stairs an imposing door blocked the way. It had to be at least twenty feet tall. Priyanka grabbed him by the shoulder and made him face her. She pulled a tuning fork from a pocket, struck it with a fingernail, and added a breath of phase. Zane recognized the privacy spell. Listen to me carefully. I'll be the only one speaking to the Black Council. They might want to ask you questions but unless I give you the signal, do not answer them, she said. Why did you bring me if I'm not going to speak, he asked. The first reason is that they're KG operators, and since you don't know the dangers, I wouldn't want to put you at risk. Two, I want you to listen and watch the council members, use that nimble brain of yours. She tapped on his temple. Try to learn something from their answers, how they speak, anything you can suss out of their actions. If I do well, can I get Keelan on my team? He asked. The corners of her eyes creased. You're persistent but you know my answer. Focus on the moment. Keep your sensing imbuement running as high as you can manage, without letting anyone know you're using it. Is that illegal here? He asked. When a smirk grew on her lips and she didn't answer, worry flooded through Zane. But as soon as she banged on the door, his adrenaline took over and washed away his doubts. The doors opened on their own. Priyanka marched in with her hands behind her back. The circular room had high seats along the far wall in which three women and two men in black clothing leaned back with practiced indifference. Priyanka took up station at the center of the circle, motioning behind her back for Zane to stay near the door. He settled himself at the edge of the open room and poured phase into his sensing imbuement. Priyanka Sai, said the eldest woman, who had a distinctive sag to her right eye, trouble follows you like a plague, so I do not greet you warmly. Speak your peace, so we may send you on your way as hastily as possible. The woman to her left had lustrous black skin, and spoke with an accent Zane didn't recognize. Eleanor, this is no way to treat an honored guest. When Priyanka decides to retire many eons from now, she will be one of the most accomplished ever to join our ranks. Eleanor slapped her hand against the table. As the longest serving member of the council, I remember far more than you. Her hard expression softened. But your words are wise and thicker. I will temper my mood, assuming the reason she's come to the council do not stir me back to action. Speak Priyanka. Priyanka bent at the waist until her face nearly touched the floor, then slowly straightened. She inclined her head towards each member of the Black Council, starting on the left and speaking their names in turn. Jax Ringer. Lauren Pale. Eleanor Fields. Anthika Drummondana. Tamako. The first four looked entirely human, though Zane recognized that many supernatural creatures chose that form. The fifth member of the council did not hide her differences, as she had smoky pale skin, and when Zane looked at her grand glittering cities appeared in his head. She was a matri, a member of the city elves. Thank you for allowing me to speak, said Priyanka. I bring you unfortunate news. Someone sent the gherkin to collect heads in the city of Invictus. A collective gasp passed through the council. Eleanor pounded her fist on the table. Surely you jest. His fees are so large now that no one has hired him in decades, she said. Murmurs of agreement followed. Zane watched the council. The four that looked visibly human wore various expressions of disgust, while Tamako seemed indifferent, though he gathered that was her normal countenance. Yes I jest. Clearly I've nothing better to do than travel here and waste your time with fairy tales, said Priyanka. 
or I'm here because the Gherkin should not be operating in my city. Either the Black Council granted permission for this, and I want to know why I wasn't contacted, or your toothless old men and women who can't uphold the pact anymore. Through his highly tuned hearing, Zane caught the grinding of teeth, as if one of the council members knew about the Gherkin, but he couldn't pinpoint who it was because of their audible gasps. It possibly sounded like it came from the left side of the table, from Jax or Lauren, but he wasn't completely certain. Eleanor spoke forcefully. You know we would never authorize this. Someone is operating outside the bounds of the pact. She glanced to her fellow council members. We will have to discuss consequences after this. But as for the matter of the attack, can you give us details? As far as Zane could tell, Eleanor seemed to be telling the truth, but he burned Faze more quickly just in case. The Gherkin killed the patron of the smallest eye hall and three students. He put their heads in a stasis box, I assume for extracting thoughts later, said Priyanka. What about the boxes? Did you sense their make? And how did you know it was the Gherkin? asked Anthika. Priyanka nodded towards Zane. One of my students witnessed it. The boxes were made of steel with arcane lashes on the joints. As their gazes fell upon him, he had to hide his surprise at her lie. The boxes had been made of brass with runes etched into their surfaces. But he recovered quickly, focusing on their reactions. If one of the council members had ordered the collection, then they would know the lie and might wonder. But once again, he saw nothing to indicate it was any of them. Curious, said Jax. But that make doesn't indicate anything in particular. Anyone could build a stasis box like that. Was there anything else that told the tale of his hire? Jax leaned his head to the left slightly as he gazed in Zane's direction. The man wore an open collared shirt, and tufts of curly black chest hair stuck out. He had a feral grin, like a wolf on the hunt. Zane stared back, trying to measure the man, to see if he were the one who had been grinding his teeth. If he was closer to Jax, he could sense the man's heartbeat, and that might tell him more, but the room was large and there were enough echoes to confuse his hearing. I couldn't care less about the boxes. They're trivial at this point. What I care about is that the gherkin was in my city, and clearly by your surprise you didn't authorize it. The pact demands an answer, said Priyanka. Eleanor nodded sagely. We hear your complaint and we shall rectify it. Tamako spoke with a silky authority. It will be difficult to find willing souls to go against the gherkin, and though he's never agreed to the pact, he's never acted against it either. This is a matter we should discuss afterwards, said Eleanor, before turning her attention back to Priyanka. If you have nothing further, you may return to your home, so we can discuss what countermeasures we might bring to the situation. Priyanka bowed her head as if she were ready to leave, which meant he wouldn't get a chance to figure out who the teeth grinder was. When Zane spoke, his voice cracked. The gherkin said something before he took the heads. Priyanka's hair whipped around as she faced him, anger on her lips. The council seemed amused by his sudden announcement. I'm sorry, said Zane. I didn't realize what I'd heard until I was thinking about it. Priyanka searched his face with her eyes, clearly trying to determine if he'd gone insane, but Zane wanted to get closer, and he needed a reason. May I come forward? he asked. Certainly, young man, said Eleanor, who was enjoying his disobedience. The others on the council watched him keenly. He tried to control his breathing, but it was hard with their eyes upon him. When he reached Priyanka's side, Eleanor asked, What is your name? Zane Carter. And what is it that you heard? A word, a phrase, she asked. His heart jumped around in his chest. It was hard to listen to their bodily sounds with his own body making a racket in his head. It was a name, he said, hearing the tremor in his own voice. He checked for a reaction, but saw nothing but their luminous faces blocking out his thoughts. It was short, maybe one syllable, said Zane, looking to Jax for a reaction, but he sensed no difference in his expression or heartbeat. It's hard to say. It was a difficult thing to watch, and I was afraid I was going to be next. Maybe my mind was playing tricks on me. The council members leaned back in their chairs. How disappointing, said Eleanor. Maybe you shouldn't have spoken up then, if your patron did not give you permission. Priyanka was not hiding her displeasure. My apologies, said Priyanka, glaring at him. He shouldn't have spoken. I will punish him accordingly when we return home. We shall take our leave. 
they left the Bastille straight away. Priyanka said nothing as he worked to keep up with her quick strides. When they went through the portal, a brief but gut-wrenching journey, she turned on him immediately, the stern expression bent to disappointment. When I tell you not to speak, that means that you should not speak, she said. You asked me to pay attention, and I was. I think one of them sent the gherkin because they ground their teeth when you announced it. But I couldn't tell who, so I had to get closer, he spit out as fast as he could. Is that what the business with the lie was, she asked. He nodded, and she stood straighter, gaze shifted as she considered it. It was a worthy attempt then, she said, her disappointment washed away. And you comported yourself well, giving nothing away. But I assume you didn't learn anything, or you would have already told me. I suspected those to the left of Eleanor, Jack's in particular. But he didn't give any tells, he said. She rubbed the back of her neck. It's doubtful he would give any. Once the initial surprise was over, they would keep their intentions hidden. Did you learn anything else? He considered the encounter, running it through his head for other clues. Eleanor was genuinely surprised and while she doesn't like you, she takes her responsibilities seriously. He paused, catching a twinkle of mirth in Priyanka's eyes to let him know he was on the right track. So if she didn't know, then the Black Council didn't know about the Gherkins hiring, though it doesn't rule out a rogue member. As Halfton said, even while retired they enjoy their politicking. What I have to figure out now is why the Gherkin was hired. What was the purpose of taking those heads and preserving their thoughts, she asked aloud, then glanced back to Zane. Enough intrigue for the day for you. You may return to the honeycomb, but stay ready, I may need you at a later date. Chapter 9 Second Ward Near the Sky, November 2014 Game of Lies Nervous excited laughter carried through the second years like a shiver of pleasure, as they waited for Instructor Pennywhistle to explain the task. Classroom work was intense, but lacked the danger of the challenges the instructors threw at them. It had been a few months since the last one. Zane stood in the back with his teammates, contemplating the scene before them. They stood in a high floor of a skyscraper near the spire around evening time. The mammoth tower was so close, Zane had to press his face to the window to get a glimpse of the blinking lights at the top that kept planes from flying into it. No one had explained what was going to happen, but the ladder leading up through the ceiling to the roof did not go unnoticed. He'd only been in Invictus for a year, so it was strange how used to the city he'd gotten. He looked out the side window to see it come alive with lights as night descended, a far cry from his hometown of Varna, which seemed to fade into shadow as the sun set. It wasn't his home, but he didn't feel like he'd wandered into the wrong place every time he looked out a window. I overheard some fifth years this morning going on about how excited they were to be on the administering end of this challenge, said Skylar in a low whisper. Hopefully they're not pining to see me fly or anything. I wouldn't make a good bird, said Vin, staring apprehensively out the window. But you'd make an excellent rock, said Skylar. I see pain and embarrassment in our future. Portia looked to Zane. You're quiet this evening? He blinked. Sorry, I guess I was zoning out. I was up late studying last night. Zane pushed more phase into his sensing imbuement, which brightened the world around him. His awareness came up, as if he just drank a double espresso, but he knew it wouldn't last. You're up late studying every night. Do you ever actually sleep? asked Skylar. I think he sneaks out to meet up with Sophia. If I was sleeping with her, I wouldn't hide it. I would proclaim it to the world, said Portia, holding her arms up as if she was singing on a stage. For the record, Portia, you have slept with her, and you two were so noisy I couldn't sleep, said Skylar, her lips pursed with amusement. Portia tilted her head, putting a fingernail on her lower lip. She, I guess that is true. She must have been a disappointment for me to forget. Never mind, he's not sleeping with her, but that still doesn't explain what he's doing each night. Zane was saved from having to admit he was actually studying when Instructor Penny Whistle arrived, silencing the chatter. She was wearing a floor-length black denim skirt, a black turtleneck, and her hair in a high ponytail pulled so tight it turned her cheekbones sharp. The dark-rimmed glasses she wore did little to hide the circles around her eyes. You're all liars, but not very good ones. The class laughed in response, though Zane sensed her heart wasn't in the playful joke. Last year you learned how to manipulate people, simple magics to affect your target. 
But as we've said time and time again, not everyone will be as easy. It is one thing to influence the guy driving your taxi or doing your taxes, but it's another thing entirely to compromise someone who is ready for you and has hardened themselves with magical countermeasures. And then there's the other side of it. Detecting the lie. Knowing how to spot a bullshitter. You should have completed your reading of volumes 3 through 5 of the illustrious arts of deception. You will apply what you've learned in today's lesson. This will require balance your senses and most importantly your brain. You'll need to learn how to use them in concert to survive. But I don't want to ruin all the fun with boring explanation. I'll let you figure it out when you get upstairs. She pointed upward, and a queasy feeling went through Zane's midsection. He didn't mind heights, but standing on the top of a 50-floor building was something entirely different. To give you all a little extra incentive, the team with the best score will earn a weekend off from everything, and I mean classwork, dinner duties, everything. A collective murmur of anticipation rose through the second years. Everyone wanted to win the reward. As always, there's a penalty for being last. The team at the bottom gets to pick up the duties of the winning team. Groans were stifled as Instructor Penny Whistle held up a small coin. But if anyone can make it to the end and defeat me, I will give you my portal tether, which can save you in a time of great danger. Though I'm not worried about losing it, since no one has ever even made it to the final station. Zane had been feeling drowsy, but mention of the tether gave him a boost. Winning the group competition would be great for his team's morale, but defeating Instructor Penny Whistle and earning the tether might help him against the lady. He had to do everything possible to win it. The other students spoke quietly amongst themselves, motioning to those around them that they were the ones that would win the challenge. She clapped her hands once to get their attention. Eddie, you're up first. Eddie raised his arms in victory as if he'd already won, receiving hisses from the rest of the class. After moving to another room behind a heavy door, the other second years clustered together and started talking about the challenge. We have to win, said Skylar. I don't remember what the inside of my eyelids look like. They look like this, said Vin, closing and opening his eyes very exaggeratedly. I might sleep an extra hour or two, but I think I'd use that time to get ahead on classwork, said Portia. It's not like it's going to go away. Don't remind me, said Skylar. But at least for a few short days I could forget. What about you, Zane? What would you do? Zane glanced around at the other teams. Everyone was talking about the weekend off. No reason to talk since we haven't won anything, he said. Skylar was about to give a retort when her name was called. Damn. Either Eddie won quickly or he lost quickly. Do we really have to wonder, asked Vin. Wish me luck, said Skylar skipping towards the ladder. After Skylar left, everyone went quiet. Every few minutes, another name would be called. Before each one, Zane's stomach roiled like the ocean in a storm. He tried not to look out the window to see how high up they were, but it was hard. At the quarter and half marks, Vin and Portia were called to the ladder. He gave them each a fist bump before they went up. Almost two hours passed before he was called. He was one of the last second years to go. He wiped his hands on his jeans before climbing up the ladder. A gust of wind made him squint as he reached the roof, immediately looking around for where he needed to go. It wasn't completely dark, but the dim light had blurred the edges of everything distant. He made it a half turn before he saw his destination, and his stomach dropped into his knees. A fifth year named Justin was standing on the building across from the one Zane was on. Justin gave a friendly wave with a stupid grin on his face. When Zane reached the edge he saw two thin boards that went across the gap. There was about eight feet between them. Zane had a good idea of what he needed to do, but just no idea why there were two boards. He climbed onto the ledge between the two boards and looked down, but as soon as he leaned forward, he had to pull back because the yawning expanse seemingly tried to suck him over the edge. He stepped away, reeling from the experience. His hands were sweaty and his breath came in labored heaves. He tried to shake the adrenaline from his arms, but they quivered with nervousness. It's really far down, said Justin. I can see that, said Zane. Take my advice. This goes a lot smoother if you don't think about how far it is to the bottom. Or look, definitely don't look. Zane resisted the urge to flip him off. So what's the catch? Two boards and I have to pick the right one? You got it. 
One of them is designed to fail when you're at the center. The other is perfectly safe. Assuming you don't lose your balance, said Justin. At that moment, a wind gust moving between the buildings blew in his face, coaxing the hairs on the back of his neck to stand up. So which one is safe? asked Zane. That's for me to know and you to find out, said Justin. But know that you only have ten minutes to reach instructor Penny Whistle, and there are three stations including this one before her. You can't modify the boards and you can't try and jump the gap, but otherwise everything else is fair game. The nature of the challenge became clear to Zane. So I can ask you questions about which board to take, and then I have to figure out if you're lying or not. Bingo, said Justin. Great, Zane muttered to himself. He blew a big breath out and surveyed the two boards and then Justin. The fifth year had a smirk on his face. He was enjoying this far too much for Zane's liking. Zane amped up his sensing, listening to Justin's heartbeat through the veins on his neck, watching his expression for little ticks. Figuring out if someone was lying wasn't hard if you knew what to look for and had a baseline to check against. A lie detector machine worked on that principle. He would have to do the same, though at an unfortunate distance. It would have been much easier up close. Hey Justin, what was your last name again? Nichols. Justin Nichols. When Justin spoke his heartbeat stayed relatively calm, which was to be expected. If this were controlled circumstances he might have asked more questions but Justin knew the lying game as well as Zane, so he couldn't push too far. Thanks Justin. I just wanted to know who to thank when I get past you, said Zane. Justin made an exaggerated coughing laugh. Ha. Huh. Not only are you not getting past me, but your team is in last place. Once again his heartbeat stayed steady, which didn't bode well for his team if that was true, but at least was another data point for the real question. He thought for a moment before he warded the question. Which board should I use to cross the gap? Justin blinked, turned and pointed to his right which was Zane's left. That one. Though it didn't change a lot, Zane detected a jump in his heartbeat, which suggested a lie. To further test it, Zane moved first towards his left and the board Justin had suggested, catching a twitch at the corner of his mouth and a brief rightward glance from his eyes. Thanks Justin, said Zane, moving back towards the right board. While Zane was fairly confident he was correct, there was enough doubt to make his traverse emotionally perilous. Zane took a deep breath and looked at the board, which suddenly looked much smaller than it had a few moments ago. He tried to concentrate on where his feet would go, but all he could see was the tiny street so far below. You can always give up, said Justin. No harm in quitting. Some of your fellow classmates did. A bird cawed to his right, hovering on the wind. He could taste bile in his mouth as he fought the urge to step away from the ledge. But the smirk on Justin's face kept him steadfast. He stepped onto the board, immediately having to stabilize with his arms out when a gust of wind pushed him. Zane stopped and stared at the board to muster some courage. His whole body tingled with numbness, as if he were having an out-of-body experience. When he realized he still had his sensing imbuement amped up, he backed it off, which reduced the terror that was lurking at the corner of his mind, waiting to seize control. With every detail in full focus he centered himself, but right as he stepped forward another gust of wind hit him crossways. Zane growled under his breath, using his imbuements to keep his balance. Each step was its own struggle, a personal battle not to slip to his knees and cling to the board for life. But once he was a quarter of the way out, he realized there was no reason to go back, and he wasn't sure he wanted to try and pirouette. As he neared the center the board bowed, bending a good foot downward. The hair on the back of his neck rose in anticipation of the snap and the rapid plunge to the earth. But step by step he made his way across until his foot touched the roof on Justin's side. Hoping I would fall, asked Zane. Justin scowled, shoving his hands into his pockets. You won't get much further. The whole way to the far side of the building, Zane mulled Justin's behavior over in his head. Why would he want to see a fellow student fall to their death? While there were certainly some edge cases in the hall for the most part, the other students were pretty sane, a bit risk-hungry, but definitely not the kind of sickos that wanted to see someone plummet 50 stories. He wrote it off as a defect of Justin's and approached the next section, his heartbeat increasing as he saw three boards rather than two. Another variable in the lying game was not what he wanted. At least before, he had a 50-50 shot. Now his random chance of picking the right path was only at a third. Brittany D. Loud, 
a cocoa-skinned girl from the suburbs of Detroit, stood on the other side. She gave Zane a friendly wave and shook her mane of healthy black hair. Hey Zane, baby. Hey, Brittany. She gave him the biggest grin, and he knew what she was going to say before she said it, because she'd let him know in very clear terms that she was open to testing out his imbuements. I'm not above giving you a free pass if you're willing to take a trip on the Brittany Express, she said. Zane blew a breath out his nose. Having a fatal prophecy attached to his love life was not making his life any easier. I'm sorry, Brittany. I can't, he said. You gonna be a Jesuit priest or something? Or you one of those guys who thinks holding it back makes you more powerful? Don't you know that's why we got this magic baby? I am aware and it's for none of those reasons, said Zane. She sighed and shook her head. You know how to disappoint a girl, don't you? Sorry, Brittany. You can still tell me which board if you want, he said. She pointed to the middle one, an answer that he believed right away because he'd been monitoring her like he had Justin. Thanks, Brittany, he said. Making the first few steps made his palms sweat, but at least the wind had died down. He kept his attention at the ready for a surprise gust, and was so focused on the board that he didn't look up at all until he was almost at the middle. A brief glance to Brittany warned him that something was wrong. As soon as he stopped about five feet from the exact center, her smile died. He wasn't sure where he'd gone wrong, but he knew he was on the wrong board. You almost had me, said Zane. I tried. I tried, she said. But you still don't know which board is good. No, I don't, said Zane, doing a pirouette and making his way back to the building he'd just come from. Brittany had her arms crossed and was shaking her head and humming. You ain't getting past Brittany D. Loud, so you might as well just give up now. Zane paced along the edge of the building. He couldn't understand why they were so blasé about another student potentially falling to their death. He didn't know Justin that well, so he couldn't speak to his sense of morality, but he knew there was no way Brittany would treat his death so coldly. It was almost as if there were no real consequences to failing. He looked over the edge at the city far below. He could see cars, tiny little blocks with pinhole lights shining from the front, cruising through the streets. It was enough to give him vertigo. It wasn't a false view, he knew that much. The complexity of an illusion that large would require multiple majors to create and maintain, and would violate one of the basic teachings of the academy. Simple is better. He recalled Justin taunting him to look down, which was also a recipe to get him not to look. What was he supposed to not see? When he unfocused his eyes, he caught the edges of something below the boards. Looking closer, he realized what he saw, a see-through platform ten feet beneath the boards. It would be strong enough to hold his weight, but far enough down to give him a dreadful scare. It had probably been enchanted to make it hard for him to see it. He took one look at Brittany's expression and knew he wouldn't get past with simple questions, and it would likely get harder. He needed a way to get to the truth, but the solution he came up with gave him the shivers. Three successive blasts of force magic directed at the place the barrier connected with the brick wall loosened it until it broke away and fell against the far building, held by the other end like a door on a hinge. Zane, what are you doing? asked Brittany, mouth open, looking down at the now truly empty space below. Which one is it? I don't have a lot of time. I'll pick one at random if you won't tell me, he said, putting his foot on the leftmost board. She stared agape at him until she shook herself back alive and said, Stop. Not that one. Zane. What are you doing? He moved to the rightmost board and began his traverse. Before, the pit of space beneath him hadn't been as imposing as if his subconscious mind knew that the instructors wouldn't truly put him at risk. But now that he knew for sure he was one misstep from death, his senses were amped to eleven. When he reached the other side, he gave Brittany a kiss on the cheek. Sorry, I need to win. She stared back at him. You need a lobotomy is what you need. At the next station he found another gap, three boards, and a fifth year staring across the expanse at him. Hey Cece, said Zane. Her lips were already squeezed together. What did you do back there? Did you have pets as a kid? asked Zane. She lifted one shoulder in a half shrug. Sure. Two cats and a toy poodle that slept in my bed. What does that have to do with anything? Just making sure you're not a sociopath, he said, then proceeded to blast the barrier away from the building, leaving Cece even more flabbergasted than Brittany. 
Which one is the safe path? he asked. Cece squeezed her arms to her chest as if the thought of answering was a horrifying thought. I don't even want to tell you the correct one. What if you fall on the way over? she asked. I won't, said Zane. So tell me. No way. If I don't tell you then you won't try, she said. That's not the way this works. She squinted at him. Why are you doing this? He knew she wouldn't believe the truth, and he didn't have time to tell her, so he appealed to the common thread of all academy students. I want to win. So which is it? Cece paced away, then back to the edge. She looked behind her, to where instructor Penny Whistle was waiting at the last station. He couldn't see her because of the staircase blocking the view, but he knew Cece was deciding what she'd get in trouble for more, telling him or not telling him, and risking his death. It's the middle one. Congratulations, she said, throwing her hands up. To be sure, he'd been monitoring her, but the signs came back that she was telling the truth. Still, as he reached the center of the board, the place where it might snap, his feet quivered as he set them down. But once he was past, he ran across the final length, trusting in his imbuement to keep him steady. Thanks, Cece. She shook her head incredulously. You sure know how to take the fun out of a challenge. When he reached the gap leading to Instructor Penny Whistle, the fear and nervousness that had been with him at the first station returned in double. There were four boards extending between the two buildings. Instructor Penny Whistle's hair blew into her face, but she made no move to knock it out of the way. The cloudy sky was nearly full dark. Well done, Zane. No one's ever made it this far, she said. She wasn't using the bright, fun voice she gave them at class time, as she playfully mocked and simultaneously inspired them. This one was level, serious, the kind of voice a surgeon used as they were digging through a person's guts. How many students even attempt the first crossing, he asked. Only half. And of those that attempt it, only slightly more than half pick the correct board, then even more give up when they have to pick from three. It's the fifth year's favorite contest to help with, because they get to watch their fellow students think they're going to fall to their deaths, only to hit a clear platform just 10 feet below. Sounds like a real treat. But why have a contest that no one is supposed to win? He looked behind him, thought about the experience of crossing. Unless the contest is the lesson itself. She nodded, and the wind calmed enough that he could see her face again. Second year students are the worst because they think they know what they're doing, but haven't truly learned enough not to be dangerous to themselves. That sounds vaguely familiar, said Zane. Hubris will be the death of you, said Instructor Penny Whistle. I've heard that before, he said. Is the deal still the same? The tether, if I make it over, do I get it? She hesitated before answering. Yes. He stepped to the edge and blasted the clear platform away. When he reached out with his senses, he found little information, as her clothing had been enchanted to mask her biosignals. Which one should I cross? he asked. I'm not telling you, she said. You have to, said Zane. It was hard to see through the hair hanging over her face, but he caught a smirk beneath it. No, actually I don't. That's not one of the rules. I can refuse. Zane picked one of the boards at random, moving towards the one on his left. I've got a 25% chance at least. Wait, she said, so he stopped. Are you going to tell me? No, I'm not going to tell you, and you can't blackmail me like you did the others. I don't care if you fall, she said. Of course you care, he said with his foot on the board. That's why you're a teacher. I know teachers, my dad's one. He'd never want harm to come to one of his students. I teach because Priyanka asked me to, and I'm good at it. It's also a lot safer than being in the field, and as much as I loved it, it's nice to have a break for a while, she said, reminding him that she was much older than she looked, one of Priyanka's oldest friends in the academy which also meant she was less likely to be swayed by his argument. He started moving up the board. Which board is it? You don't even have to tell me the truth, but I've got to have something to work with. You want to know about lessons. What if your death is a good lesson for your classmates? This will be even better than going through it themselves to know what you did, she said. He kept creeping forward, but not fast enough that he'd reach the middle too soon. It was more than likely that he was on a board that would break, and he wondered if he could jump to the board next to him if he needed to. If you turn back now I'll give your team the highest score, she said. That's not what I want. 
Give me the tether and I will, he said. Why are you doing this? Is this because of Varna? Are you trying to die so you don't have to be a watcher? Asked Instructor Pennywhistle. He paused, wobbling a moment as the wind picked up, pushing him to his right. He looked down, seeing the miniature cars far below him. So you know what happens to us, he asked. Of course I do, she said. How do you feel about it? What's going on? Priyanka forbade us from being involved. And before you get all righteous on me, I'm well aware how crappy that is, but in our profession we have to make deals with horrible people sometimes, said Instructor Pennywhistle. They stared at each other, Zane wobbling on a board above the empty air, Instructor Pennywhistle on the edge of the building, hair half in her face. Go back Zane. You've done well to get this far. Don't risk your life for a worthless trinket, she said. He looked at the four boards, including the one he was standing on. Was he really that crazy, that he was willing to risk his life for a magical trinket? Nevia would kill him if she saw what he was risking. Zane rotated, right at the moment a gust of wind blasted him in the face. He rocked backwards but caught himself right away. But in that moment, he noticed Instructor Pennywhistle's hand going out, as if she were going to try and save him. It was only a tiny gesture, the first two fingers flexing outward, but it was enough that he knew what she was thinking. She did care if he fell, she didn't want him to die. But she also didn't want him to take her trinket. He thought back to what she'd said. She was willing to offer him anything to keep him from going forward, except the trinket. Had he picked the correct board, and she was trying to bluff him back. Her fear had risen only when he nearly fell, which suggested he was in no danger currently. The chance to own a tether was too good to pass up, but was it worth his life? He searched his feelings, and found that he was sure she was trying to get him to turn back. That this was the correct board. Zane turned back towards Instructor Pennywhistle, moving forward one step at a time. She watched silently, arms hanging at her sides. When he reached the center, each step was like walking across a minefield, but once it was passed, a nearly overwhelming sense of relief flooded into his limbs. He barely registered the last few steps, and then he was standing on the other side. He wanted to collapse. Or have a shot of whiskey. Or both. His knees were shaking. Instructor Pennywhistle pulled the tether out of her pocket, and held it out. It was a circular obsidian amulet, like a tiny portal. There was an ache in her eyes. However she'd acquired the tether, it had come at some cost, and now she was giving it up to a second-year student, and that caused her pain. But there was also pride, a creasing at the corner of the eyes, lips that curled at the edges just so. The academy thus far had felt like a means to an end. A place he had to survive for five years so he could return to Varna and save his family, or die trying. The way she looked at him with a keen warmth, suggested the Academy could be more than ruthless assassins or Machiavellian agents. They were a family of a different sort, a sometimes murderous one, but they did seem to relish their involvement with the games of death. Congratulations Zane, she said, placing the tether on his outstretched palm. A sense of calm came over him, and though he'd been at the Academy for a year and a half, it was the first time he truly felt like he belonged. Chapter 10 Undercity, November 2014. Even the Beatles didn't have a fifth member. It was Sunday afternoon, and they were hanging out in their rooms studying. After winning the contest, they'd been freed from regular duties in the honeycomb, so during the times they weren't in class or sneaking off to quiet places for sex, everyone except Zane, they tended to fall into a comfortable routine. Skylar usually had her earbuds in, listening to the Garbage Kings or some other band like them while she paced around the area behind the couches, miming her spell work. Vin sat at a vintage desk he'd hauled up from the basement of the honeycomb, the kind with a rolled top and locked drawers that had no keys, so he had to pick his way into them every time. Portia claimed the other half of the beige couch Zane was on. She rested her back against his bent knees as she scribbled in her notebook. A knock at the door followed by a tentative opening brought an exclamation from Skylar, prompting the others to look up. He'd been expecting his cousin, or Elena, who'd been hooking up with Portia for the last week, but not Priyanka Sai. Zane climbed to his feet, along with Vin and Portia. Priyanka crossed her arms. You need to stop treating me like royalty. That kind of deference will only get you killed. Sorry, said Zane, rubbing the back of his neck. 
It's just like having the principal show up to your dorm room. I'm not the principal. I'm your patron. I don't want your deference or admiration. What I want is your excellence. Priyanka paused. So well done beating Marilyn at her game. I've always thought it was a little cruel. Is she still mad about losing her tether? He asked. Of course she is. But that's the least of her worries right now. A friend of hers was killed yesterday. A mage from the Aura Healers Guild, said Priyanka. Was it a beheading? He asked. Priyanka nodded, glancing at his teammates. I assume, despite my requests for secrecy, that you've informed your teammates about what happened at the Black Council. Zane sunk into the couch, wishing he was a turtle so he could put his head inside his shell. His teammates suddenly couldn't make eye contact with their patron. Zane nodded reluctantly. I knew you were going to tell them the moment I told you not to, said Priyanka like a parent worn out from scolding their children. But in this case, it saves me time from having to explain the stakes and eventually all students learn about Deathbird and the Council. Just know that if I ever tell you something important enough, it will come with an unbreakable binding. Zane scrunched up his face. Yes, Mom? I've learned a few things since our trip. It appears that someone is collecting information for what, I don't know, but that's why the heads are being taken, to get at their thoughts. The friend of Marilyn's was an expert on how phase works, and the smallest eye dealt in molecular arcane biology. I don't know what they're trying to learn, but I don't like the outline of what it suggests. Zane glanced at his teammates. They looked like kids trying to remind their parents that they were up later than their bedtime. They'd all been jealous of his trip to Deathbird, so he was relieved they were getting to hear this directly from the patron herself. What do you need us for? asked Zane. I checked with the mages at the Oculus Hall to see if they could see anything in the future that might help us. The more important an event, the harder it is to see the true future, because its impact might veer off in small ways upsetting things dramatically. So they weren't able to offer much, except a glimpse of you working in the fish market on the west side of the 10th ward. Isn't that near the Metallum Nocturne Hall? I bet they're going to hit them next, said Portia. A twinkle shone in Priyanka's eyes at Portia's comment. I was thinking the same thing, though I wish I understood what they were after. I don't yet see the thread that connects these halls. We'll do it, said Skylar from behind him. Priyanka raised an eyebrow. I haven't asked you anything yet. You're going to ask Zane if we can keep surveillance on Metallum Nocturne for you, said Skylar too fast, then realizing she might have overstepped her bounds, she added, or at least that's what I'm hoping. Priyanka chuckled. You are correct. That's what I was going to ask. I guess I shouldn't be surprised by the cleverness of this team. Careful, Ms. Patron, said Vin. Zane's head is already too big for this room. I'm aware, but for some people, their own failures are the only teacher they're willing to listen to, said Priyanka, looking directly at him. But yes, I would like you all to watch that hall. Find a place you can keep an eye on it, without drawing notice to yourself. Well, I guess I'm working at the fish market, said Zane. Easy enough. I could probably get a job teaching aerobics at the gym nearby. It faces the street so I can keep watch during classes, said Portia. No way am I going to work at the fish market, said Skylar, wrinkling her nose. I love sushi as much as the next girl but show me the scales and guts and I'm out. There's a boutique on the south side of the hall that sells the most divine dresses. I'm sure I could get a job there. When they looked at Vin he startled as if he hadn't been listening, but then a secret smile hovered on his lips. I know the perfect job, but I'll have to see if they have an opening first, he said. Priyanka's eyes lit up. You've chosen your teammates well. Remember that you're providing surveillance only. Rotate your schedules so someone is watching the hall at all times. If the gherkin arrives, do not engage. You wouldn't even dent him. Zane attacked him, said Portia. Priyanka gave an exasperated sigh. He was foolish but lucky. Don't expect that to work for you. What do we do if he shows up? asked Vin. She pulled a dozen small discs from her pocket and threw them on the table near the couch. They looked like plastic dimes except thicker. Ask instructor Noya Day to teach you the spell that activates them. They'll help us track where he's taking the heads, she said. Any questions? Zane raised his hand tentatively. I have one small request. It's never small when someone asks that way, said Priyanka. We need a fifth member, said Zane. 
especially with our class load. It's going to be hard enough keeping up while maintaining surveillance. She tilted her head to the right, letting her silky black hair fall partially into her face. If you can't handle it, I can find another team. What about the Oculus Vision? asked Vin. Priyanka raised one shoulder in the semblance of a shrug. They make mistakes. And who knows, maybe his presence is a precursor to his death. What about everything Instructor Allgood taught us last year? Everything was based on a five-person team. If we're going to learn it, shouldn't we get to practice it? You don't always get to have the perfect tools for the mission, replied Priyanka. Sometimes you have to make do. But you can adjust the teams and give us a fifth. As soon as he saw the way her lips thinned, he quickly added in his Jamaican patois, respect. She looked like she was going to say something, then she squinted. He put a lot of money on that she was examining, with her sensing imbuement. Priyanka walked up, grabbed his jaw, and turned his head left and right as if she were examining an antique. When's the last time you slept? she asked. He blinked. A week ago, I think. His teammates gasped. She grumbled under her breath. I was going to suggest the sensing trick, to help you gain a few more hours a night, but you've already been using it. Who taught you how to do that? Zane looked at his sneakers. I sort of figured it out myself. Once again, leaping before you look. This recklessness is going to be the death of you. She looked to the rest of the team. Of all of you. She jabbed her finger in his direction. You get some sleep. A full eight hours. That's an order. And if you're going to continue to use it, no more than two days in a row without at least two hours of sleep. He's been staying awake using his imbuement, asked Portia. Priyanka nodded. If you keep a low level of phase running through it, the extra inputs will keep you awake. What happens if you do it for too long, asked Portia. Priyanka gave him a good hard look. You die. So stop messing with things you don't understand. She sighed, shaking her head. It appears you're already stretched thin, so I will allow a fifth member, and I have a guess who you're hoping to have. Keelan would fit perfectly into the group, said Zane. He's a team lead. How will that look to the others? asked Priyanka. With Jacob dropping out of the academy, there are enough four-person teams to fill everyone back up to five. And someone has to get Keelan. It might as well be us, said Zane, giving her a smug grin. Fine, said Priyanka, shaking her head but only because you're going to keep annoying me about it, until I do it. Vin coughed exaggeratedly into his fist. I wouldn't have said that. She raised an eyebrow in Vin's direction. You wouldn't have, she asked. You just encouraged him to not listen to you in the future. Trust us he won't give up as it is, said Vin. Before she left, Priyanka let a slow smile build on her lips. Good. I wouldn't have it any other way. Chapter 11. Sixth Ward, November 2014. Family. I don't know why you screwed up my team for your quest, said Keelan, as cars drove past them on the sidewalk, spraying muddy water in an arc. Zane ignored the slushy solution of ice, mud and water splashing across his jeans. Since they were in the city as academy students, they could protect themselves from the elements with simple enchantments. This allowed him to notice the way his cousin's forehead knotted. The veins on the side of his head were like snakes rippling through the skin. It's your problem too, said Zane as he shoved his hands deeper into his coat pockets. Your team doesn't like me, said Keelan. How can you tell? You've only been on it for two whole days, said Zane, looking up at the sky as if an answer might be written there. It's just... Keelan couldn't meet his gaze. Across the street, a group of pre-teens stumbled out of an arcade, laughing and drinking enchanted slushies that turned their voices squeaky like mice. It was a nicer section of town, where parents let their kids wander the streets without supervision. They'd passed numerous high-rise apartments with uniformed doormen. I thought you'd want to be on my team, said Zane. That was the plan last year. What changed? Keelan walked with his hand on the back of his neck. Last year, I wanted that badly for us to be together. But I spent last year and part of this year working on my team, making them and myself better, and now that's all gone. Zane found it hard to take a full breath. I'm sorry. I didn't think about that. But I do need you, and so does Priyanka. So now you're on first name basis with our patron, asked Keelan. Zane didn't answer right away. He didn't know how. 
He heard that jealousy in his cousin's voice, the same one that came up whenever something unintentionally made the differences in their families obvious. It's probably going to get me killed, said Zane. Halfton warned me that working directly for her wasn't always the best choice for long-term survivability. I'm supposed to thank you for putting me in your team, asked Keelan. We're going to need allies when it comes to Varna to help us figure out what to do about the lady and whatever happened to your dad, said Zane. Keelan conjured a ball of flame in his hand, then crushed it against his palm. What if I don't want to know what happened with my dad? What if the past is best left buried? Working for the lady might not be my first choice, but it's better than the alternative. Keelan. What? His cousin turned on him. You wanted to know what happened to him at one time, said Zane. I do and I don't, said Keelan, scrunching up his face in anger. A woman walking past went wide around them as if they were contagious. Some days I think he's alive somewhere, like he figured out that mythical shortcut to fame and fortune he was always looking for, but the bastard couldn't take us. Other days I know he's dead, bones rotting at the bottom of whatever pit the lady keeps below her plantation. But most days I just don't care and want to move on. I'm sorry Keelan. I really am. Keelan rubbed his face with his hands, shaking off his anger. I thought this was about Varna anyway. Not my father. We went looking for a book. Yeah, said Zane, stopping and facing his cousin. That's what I thought too. Maybe. You see I found that book, and I think I know who has it. It's called The Ecological Webs of Arachnids, How They Bind Their Communities. Someone wrote it back in the 40s. Sounds like a snoozer, said Keelan. What does it have to do with my dad? You know how he knew everything about anything to do with animals, and he was always going on about ecology. He taught you everything you know about the Papura domina arania, said Zane. The ubiquitous purple spiders were generally called the lady spiders by everyone in Varna, but Zane used the formal name to prove a point with his cousin. So, try and find anything about them on the internet or in a book anywhere. Outside of Varna, they don't exist. Trust me, I tried, said Zane. So you're saying because my father knew their Latin name that he's connected to this book, asked Keelan, not hiding his skepticism. Yeah, I know it's thin. I'm not entirely sure this book even talks about them, but a couple of places make coded references, as if they're afraid to mention them by name, said Zane. What are we doing here then? asked Keelan, gesturing to the tall buildings around them. After talking to a few rare booksellers, I found one who knew a guy that might have a copy, maybe even the copy that was in the library, said Zane. I'm guessing he lives around here, said Keelan. Yep. And get this, his name is Alex Malice. A.M. Like the initials carved into the shelf, said Zane. Seems pretty stupid to carve your initials into the place you stole a book, said Keelan. That's what I thought too, but maybe he had a good reason. He's an alumni of Animalians Hall. He graduated in 2007, the same year your dad died, said Zane. Seems like an unlikely coincidence, said Keelan. You with me on this, asked Zane. Keelan took a deep breath before answering. He met his gaze cleanly. I am. Zane hid his sigh. He hadn't been sure if Keelan would come along. They went into the high-rise at 435 Crystal Avenue, bypassing the doorman with a simple charm. The security was decent, but nothing like the Degastine office building, and they were able to make their way to the 17th floor. After a few knocks on the door, Keelan said, it looks like he's not home. Didn't you contact him first? I don't know his relationship with the lady. For all we know, he could be on her payroll, said Zane. Then we'll have to come back later, said Keelan, starting to walk away. Or we can take a look around, said Zane, pulling out a handful of knock beads. You were planning on breaking in the whole time, said Keelan, crossing his arms. Not entirely, but I thought it'd be best if I were prepared to, said Zane. He stuck the beads around the electronic door swipe. After an activation word, the little light went green. Keelan moved to grab the handle, but Zane stopped him. Check the door first. A reveal spell brought out faint runes. They look old. He hasn't renewed them in a while, said Keelan. Or he hasn't been home in a while, said Zane. Keelan deactivated the protective runes, and they went inside the flat. It was clear right away that this Alex Malice was a collector. 
Various decorated African calabash pots lined a nearby shelf, along with Sami reindeer totems, woven Peruvian llamas, and other items from around the world. The room was filled with expensive furniture, and the walls showed off massive paintings that must have cost thousands. This Alex is doing quite well, said Keelan as he wandered through the flat and into the kitchen, full of marble countertops. He used to work at some zoo on the west coast. Now he writes books about his adventures, typically about other countries by speaking with the animals in those regions to find out things that no one else could learn, said Zane. In the main room which had a large picture window, they found a bookcase. The top two rows were filled with books by Alex. The bottom row contained books with old bindings. Squatting on his heels, Zane spied the ecological webs of arachnids, how they bind their communities. It was in better shape than he expected. You gonna take it? asked Keelan. With his hand hovering over the book, Zane replied, I really hope this is worth it. When his fingers touched the binding, he found it surprisingly warm. Zane pulled the book out, and it started shaking in his hand. He threw it away from him, and something large and hairy exploded from the inside. A spider as big as a horse landed halfway on the couch, smashing the glass table with a claw. It had the purple striations of a lady's spider. Zane dove out of the way as it leapt towards him. It smashed into the wall, shattering clay pots and wooden carvings. Keelan threw an earth bomb at it, but the exploding rock barely slowed the giant arachnid. Zane rolled onto his feet, a knife appearing in his hand to which he gave a glance, realizing that it wouldn't touch the supernatural creature. The academy taught them countless ways of fighting other humans, but they hadn't showed them how to fight giant spiders. I didn't know they got this big, said Keelan. I think it's been enchanted, said Zane. What do we do? asked Keelan as he leapt over the marble counters, dodging a spray of web. Zane blasted the spider with a flame spray, but it only pissed it off and filled the room with the horrible scent of burnt hair. The giant spider chased them around the apartment, smashing furniture and works of art in its careless advance. Only their imbuements kept them alive, though Zane didn't know how long he could keep up with it. Damn thing is guarding the door, said Keelan. The errant webs were becoming a hazard. Zane leapt out of the way of the spider, but landed on a strand behind the shattered couch. He was stuck to the floor. The giant spider came right for him. Zane roasted his foot with flame, torching the web and freeing himself to sprint to the other side of the apartment. The enchantments on his clothing had saved him from the worst of the flame, but he had no hair left on his leg. We can't keep this up forever, said Zane, breathing heavily. I think that's the point, said Keelan, who was leaning over on his thighs. The giant spider had paused by the door, staring at them with its many eyes, lifting its legs one by one in a slow dance as if it were taunting them. At this point I'm thinking about just leaping out the window and taking my chances in the fall, said Keelan. That's a great idea, said Zane, snapping his fingers. It is. We can't hurt it but I bet a 200 foot fall would do some damage, said Zane. But it'll be loose on the streets, said Keelan. If it survives, and it's not like we have any other choices, said Zane. Before Zane could take action, the spider scurried forward. He had to bounce off the wall to avoid the dripping fangs, but as he landed by the window, a sheet of webbing caught him around the legs, fixing him to the floor. A simple flame spell wouldn't burn through the mass that had him. Using a sonic burst, Zane blew out the giant windows, hoping the noise would warn people from standing below when the glass rained down. The giant spider, having turned and faced him, prepared to leap. There was no way to get out of the way, it had him dead to rights. Zane held his knife in his fist, hoping to get in a killing blow before the spider punctured him with poison. As the spider leapt, Keelan rammed it from behind, pushing it over Zane and through the window. Zane would have followed right behind had it not been for the webbing, gluing him to the floor. The spider scrambled to catch itself, but Zane and his cousin slammed it with earth bombs sending it spinning through the air. Zane was afraid it was going to hit a vehicle, but the giant spider narrowly missed a delivery truck, and as soon as it landed, the spider shrunk to a more normal size, disappearing from view. Using his knife, Zane cut away the webbing. They grabbed the book and left the apartment. Surprisingly, no one was waiting for them outside. Must be enchanted for quiet, said Zane. When they reached the lower floor, they found that no one was hurt. Only a few people had minor cuts from the glass, and in the chaos of approaching sirens and a gathered crowd, they left the area. 
Once they were a few blocks away, Zane stopped and prepared to open the book again. Are you sure you want to do that? asked Keelan. I think we used up the protection spell, said Zane, and I really want to know if all that was worth it. Sure enough, a second spider did not leap from the binding. A table of contents revealed a section on Papura Domina Arania. Keelan read along with him, peering over his shoulder. There's nothing more in there than what we already knew, said Keelan. Maybe that's proof that your dad talked to Alex Malice. How else would he have known that stuff about the lady spiders? asked Zane. I think you're reading too much into that, said Keelan. There might be other books out there, other sources. And it's not like we're going to talk to this Alex after trashing his apartment. I can't even imagine how much all that cost. Zane wished he had a way to put it all back together, but it was too late. He should have checked the book for enchantments before opening the binding, though at this point he was just happy to be alive. Thanks man, said Zane. You really saved my ass back there. Keelan rubbed his arms as if he was suddenly cold. Don't I always? Chapter 12. Varna, July 2004. The Perils of a Little Sister. Zane stumbled through the undergrowth while rubbing his forehead where his sister Nevia had smacked him with a black walnut. The suffocating Alabama weather only stoked the rage in his chest. Nev. I am so going to kick your ass, he said, wiping the tears from his cheeks. A laughing sing-song reply drifted through the vine-choked trees. You can't catch me. Zane oriented himself to where he thought she was located and ran after her, ignoring the stinging branches as they whipped him. The weather was so hot and sticky from the storm that had passed through a few days before that wisps of mist felt like the breath of a ghost on his face as he ran through them. The forest felt like it was being strangled by humidity. He crashed over a rotted log, coming face to face with a dead possum. Its guts spilled out into the dirt to be a feast for maggots. Zane punched the soil, snapping a twig in the process, before raging to his feet. Nevia, he screamed with his hands at his sides. You little twit. Somewhere in the back of his mind, he remembered his mom telling him that he was supposed to be watching his seven-year-old sister, but when she'd hit him in the head during the three-way game of tag, making sure she was safe was the last thing on his mind. Come and get me, said Nevia, whose voice seemed to come from everywhere. Zane saw a glimpse of the pink strap of her backpack, the one she wore everywhere, and went running in that direction. I'm gonna make you eat maggots when I catch you, he screamed. He lost sight of her but kept running, knocking leaves and branches from his face. He caught the edge of a patch of nettles, and his right thigh blossomed with stinging pain, which infuriated him further. In his haste, he barely noticed the ground falling away from him in time. The storm-swollen creek boiled with brown water. He grabbed a sapling, yanking himself to a stop before he fell. He knew the lazy water was dangerous. The Barnes kid drowned two years ago when he was playing by the creek during a storm. Zane remembered the picture in the paper of the bloated body, puffed up like a sausage. A massive tree blocked the creek further upstream, catching all manner of smaller trees and junk, creating a blockage. Downstream, the water was 15 feet below the edge of the wide creek, but before the dam, the water was nearly spilling over. Zane saw a glimpse of pink near the natural dam. His sister was standing at the edge, throwing rocks into the water. I've got you now, he said, sneaking through the trees towards her. He tackled her face first into the soft soil. He'd planned on pinning her arms down and giving her a round of spit torture, but she reacted like a caged cougar, flailing with fists and knees. Zane barely jumped away in time, but he managed to snag her pink backpack in the process. Nevia immediately leapt to her feet, fists at her side, her messy afro littered with grass and dirt from being smashed into the ground. Hey, that's mine, she said, trying to grab it. But Zane was taller and had longer arms. He kept the backpack away from her. You hit me in the head, he counted. Give it back. Give it back. She started punching him in the stomach and kicking him in the shins. A sharp knee caught him between the legs, nearly doubling him over. In a fit of rage, Zane launched the pink backpack in a high arc towards the dam. As Nevia screamed, it landed at the edge of the water, hanging on a limb right above the swirling foam. Without hesitation, Nevia climbed onto the massive tree stretched between the two banks. Memories of his responsibilities came rushing back, chilling his anger and leaving a knot in his gut. Nev, I'm sorry, said Zane, thinking of all the ways he was going to get punished if she fell in. Please get off there. 
It's too dangerous. But my ponies are in there, she said, climbing carefully through the branches still stuck to the massive tree. I'll buy you new ones, better ones. I'm sorry, Nev. I shouldn't have done that, but you have to come back, he said, thinking about the bloated body of the barn's boy. Rustling leaves sounded behind him, followed by the thwack of a walnut hitting him in the back. Gotcha, said Keelan, his face draining of excitement the moment he saw what was happening. Nev, you gotta get out of there. I need my ponies, she said, nearing the location of her pink backpack. She won't listen to me, Zane said anxiously. I'll get her, said Keelan, climbing onto the tree. Zane moved to follow but Keelan pushed him back. Stay downstream in case she falls in. Zane started to argue that it wouldn't matter if she fell in, because the water beneath the dam would probably pull her below and trap her in the trees beneath the surface of the brown water to drown, but even thinking that sucked the words from his lips. I'm coming too, he said, following Keelan, who moved nimbly through the branches as if they were a jungle gym. Zane's hand crunched down on a beetle fleeing from the shaking, but he ignored it. Sweat ran into his eyes. His heart was a rabbit in his chest. The brown water swirled hypnotically. He missed a handhold and dropped a few feet, before grabbing a bendy limb. A crack rendered the air followed by a scream and a splash. A branch his sister had been using had split, knocking her into the water, which was tugging at her legs bobbing her dangerously. The limb was still connected, but slowly tearing under the weight. Nevia, hold on, said Zane, looking over his shoulder. As the green wood stripped away, unreeling Nevia further into the foamy brown water, Zane couldn't shake the picture of her bloated corpse on the river's edge from his mind. Nev came the strangled word from his lips. When the limb finally ripped away, her scream was cut off as she slipped under the water. Zane looked for a branch to grab and reach out to her, but there was nothing within reach. He couldn't see Nevia. From the spot beneath him, Keelan leapt into the river, going under before coming back up right away. Zane saw a tuft of afro sticking out of the water near Keelan. Over there. He pointed. Keelan reoriented himself, dove beneath the water, and came back up right away. He had Nevia in his arms, but he was struggling to keep her lips above water. She was gasping and sputtering, taking in more water than air. She stuck trapped, he said with fear in his eyes. Zane leapt, feet hitting the cold water, blinding him with a world of swirling beige. Something caught his ankle, and he felt himself being tugged further down. He yanked his foot out and came back to the top. He paddled to them, then had to fight the current to stay in the same spot. Keelan must have found a branch under the water to stand on, probably the same one that she was trapped in. Zane swam under the surface and found Nevia's legs. He had to grab onto the limbs to keep from being dragged downstream, but once he had a hold, he worked down her legs to find where she was stuck. A V in the branches had caught her ankle, another limb bound it in the back, and the force of the water was keeping them there. The air was bursting in his chest from the effort, but he kept going. Zane curled himself around, using his body like a spreader to free her ankle. Once he did, the weight of Nevia pulled her and Keelan past him. Zane burst from the water, barely avoiding a log that had broken free. Together, Zane and his cousin dragged Nevia to the muddy bank, pulled her up out of the water, and squeezed her around the stomach until there was no more water coming out her mouth. They lay in the mud for what seemed like hours. Then they had to make the arduous climb up the bank, which refused to cooperate. Each time they dug their hands into the soil, it slumped away. By the time they made it out, they were covered in mud, and it was near dark. Zane held his sister's hand. The darkness normally would have frightened him, but his sister's near drowning had scared the fear out of him. Dad's gonna kill me, said Zane with stark realization. Yep, said Nevia in a faraway voice. It's not so bad, said Keelan. When my daddy whoops me, I just imagine he's beating someone else. You get used to it. But I ain't ever been hit before, said Zane. You will now, Nevia said matter-of-factly, as she squeezed his hand with a confusing show of support. No one spoke after that. The impending involvement of the adults had put a weight on them. When they neared the stack he heard his mom, Sella, calling for them. Zane gave a strangled response and suddenly all four parents were there shining flashlights into their faces. His dad, Masio, shook his shoulders. Zane, what happened? Did someone fall in the river? Zane had every intention of explaining what had happened. He'd been practicing it the whole way home. 
But when he opened his mouth, a wailing cry came out, and his father pulled him into an embrace. With snot pouring out of his nose and his face streaked with muddy tears, Zane heard Keelan speak plainly. It was my fault, said Keelan. I threw her backpack into the river because she made me mad, and when she went to get it, she fell in, and Zane had to save her. Zane had no chance to counter his cousin's lie before his dad, Jesse, grabbed him by the shoulder and dragged him into the woods. Zane and his sister were marched to the pump outside the stack. As Keelan howled in the darkness, his father sprayed them with freezing cold water from the well. Shivering, they scrubbed the mud from their bodies. Don't think for a second that you're not both in trouble, said Masio, glancing into the darkness with a frown hooked to his lips. But not tonight. Tonight I want you to forget about the horrors of what happened. I'm sure whatever I have to say in this moment does not compare to what you've experienced. I'm just glad the three of you are alive and well. Zane was listening, but it was hard to pay attention because Keelan's screams kept punctuating the night air. Guilt rose up like a volcano. His lips moved without sound. He'd always known that his uncle Jesse hit Keelan. The bruises were as plain as a wart on a frog to see, but he'd always deluded himself that his cousin was clumsy. Do you have something to say? asked his father as he intently studied his face. Before Zane could form the first word, Jesse, red faced and tense, marched past them into the stack. Nevia looked at him with wide eyes, her afro matted to her head. That same realization was evident on her face as well. It was like they'd both gotten five years older in a few hours. No, came his squeaked reply. Sella and his aunt Lydia appeared with towels and collected Nevia. When they moved to embrace him, Zane claimed he had more to clean. They left him outside. Before the cicadas resumed their droning chorus, a final broken sob faded from beyond the edge of light. Zane found his cousin huddled against a tree, holding his knees to his chest. His jaw looked swollen. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, was all Zane could say. Keelan's bloodshot eyes flicked up. There was no accusation in them, just an empty stare. Sometimes the world don't make sense, but that doesn't mean it stops being hard, said Keelan. Guilt rose up in Zane like a miasma flooding his head with an ache that threatened to snap him in two. He moved to Keelan's side, put his arm around his shoulders. It felt awkward, like he was at the movies with a girl. I should have spoken up. I should have taken the blame, said Zane. No, said Keelan, leaning his head on Zane's chest. The surrender let him know how much he needed it, and so Zane hugged his cousin harder. You're the good one, said Keelan. If someone's gonna find a way out of this place, it's gonna be you. I know my place. That's not true, said Zane with tears pooling. You're good too. We'll both find a way to get out. Together. Zane. He paused before answering. Yeah. Promise me something. Anything, said Zane. You know I'm here for you. If you ever get a chance to escape, do it. Don't look back. Never look back. Just go, said Keelan. Whatever Zane had wanted to say, it was annihilated by the force of Keelan's words. There was something almost prophetic about it, as if Keelan had seen the future. So Zane leaned his head against his cousin, and they sat beneath the wide canopy, and above that a blanket of stars, and tried to forget that this world would never be for them. Chapter 13 The Honeycomb, December 2014 A man, a plan, a mascot, espionage. I'm a bat, said Skylar, hanging upside down from the bottom of the lower room cubby. Her skin-tight, royal blue gymnastics clothing made her look like she was trying out for a superhero movie. Even knowing about the imbuements, Zane was impressed with the trick. Vin lobbed an orange at Skylar, which she caught and winged back. Did you enchant octopus suckers on the bottom of your feet? asked Keelan. Gross and no, she said. Maybe you've reversed gravity right below my pod, said Portia. Not even close. Also that's impossible, said Skylar. Zane had no idea himself, and he would have enjoyed standing around and speculating, but he had to get to his job at the fish market. It was completely unglamorous, but it was also his first team mission. You guys can guess at her trick while I'm gone, but I need to check your identities before I go, said Zane. Are you my mom now? asked Skylar in an exaggerated teenage voice as she threw the orange at Zane. You'd be lucky to have me as a mom, said Zane, winking. If being suffocating, and I told you so, and making little huffy noises every time someone makes a mistake makes you a mom, then you definitely are one, 
said Keelan. Vin leapt onto the couch next to Keelan. Oh, Zane stories. After he leaves, can you tell us some? Keelan gave Zane the biggest grin. I might. He tapped on his chin. Have I told you the one about the librarian? Zane was about to object, but he realized it would be good for bonding between the team and their newest member, even if it was at his expense. Instead, he snapped his finger at Portia. Quick, who are you? Portia threw one hand in the air like a dancer hitting her final pose, flipping her hair back and stretching her lips to the heavens with a dance kid smile. She spoke at a thousand miles an hour with a nasally accent. Gemma Harvez here, and I am your newest body pumping instructor. She gave herself a little clap. Today we're going to be doing burpees, leg thrusts and extenders. Tomorrow you're going to hate me, because those glutes are going to be burned to the max. Zane had to hold back a laugh that turned into a cough. She'd gotten a job at the gym near Metallum Nocturne called Brawnies. How's your sister? he asked. She's so mad right now, what with me totally kicking ass in Invictus, and she's just a waitress in Sacramento with her asshole husband Chad and two-year-old daughter Savannah. We haven't talked in weeks, said Portia. When were you born? he asked. Like last week, she said, tilting her head. So you're a Capricorn like my little sister, said Zane. Sagittarius, you mean? Portia stuck her tongue out. Did I pass? With flying colors. Keelan. Jack Johnson, said Keelan in a soft East Coast accent. I clean offices at the nearby building during the night, so I can get my online degree in biology. I'm studying to be a nurse, a real one, not like these magical knuckleheads they teach here. I own a terrier and have a saltwater fish tank, which I can tell you about for hours. Oh Merlin, said Vin, you're one of those saltwater fish tank people. No one is going to bother you about anything. My uncle has one of those, and I'd rather talk to a serial killer than have him tell me again about coral reefs. That's Mr. Saltwater Fish Tank person to you, and that's the idea, said Keelan. What about you, Vin? asked Zane. The big man snapped his fingers. I'll be right back. He nimbly disappeared into the group bathroom and within moments it sounded like he was battling a herd of bison. Zane looked up to Skylar, who was still hanging upside down. How's the boutique? Patty Yun, second-generation Korean-American, loves clothes and blah blah blah, she said. But that's just you, asked Zane. Sometimes you have to fall back on the classics, said Skylar, and anyway I wanted to spend some time checking out the latest fashions. But we're supposed to be watching Metallum Nocturne, said Zane. Skylar rolled her eyes. And I will be. But if I'm going to be the team's wardrobe guru, I've got to stay current, and this class load is hell on my couture budget. This way I can find out if the Parisian Chong Sams are going to be high-waisted or empire this season. Zane blinked a few times before responding. I'm going to assume you just spoke English. Try to actually watch the hall while you're doing research if you can. This is important. Skylar switched to a southern drawl. I believe, sir, you have impugned my good name with your accusations. Zane had no time for a response before the bathroom door flew open, revealing a giant purple mushroom holding a pair of novelty wands that spit sparks. It took a moment to realize what he was seeing. Are you the mascot for psychedelic Sam's silly wand shop? asked Zane. A muffled voice came from inside the giant costume. The one and only. Zane could only stare and scratch his head. I don't know what to say. If you sort of squint, he looks like an engorged penis, said Portia. Wow, said Keelan with his eyes wide, and now I cannot unsee it. Where did you get that thing, asked Portia. Was there a tryout, or did you steal it? A muffled voice came from inside the giant mushroom. I bought one for myself. I thought it'd be a great distraction for a heist, since there are wand shops all over the world. There was a general eye roll in the room at mention of a heist. It was Vin's dream to be part of a heist, and Zane wondered if that was the real reason he'd joined the Academy. Clearly he'd watched too many magical heist movies as a kid. Aren't you going to ask it, I mean him, any questions, said Skylar. I think the giant talking erection is safe from any interrogations. It's a little unorthodox, but I'm guessing that's the best possible disguise for this situation, said Zane. The giant purple mushroom bent at the middle. At your service. On that note, I think it's time I take my leave. You guys have a great time, said Zane.
The new town fish market was an open-air building filled with stalls covered in ice and fish. Since he'd only worked at the market for a few days, Zane was relegated to the back, unloading crates of fresh fish from the trucks that came in daily. The fishmongers stood in the stalls, selling salmon, crab legs, halibut, snapper, walleye and a hundred other varieties to the crowds. The work was hard, especially because he didn't allow himself to use his physical imbuement. Zane figured they'd suspect something if he wasn't exhausted and sore at the end of each workday. He worked as an extra hauler on the weekends, when they needed more strong backs. He couldn't see Metallum Nocturne except when he hauled the crates to the fishmonger stalls, and since he was the new guy, and likely only temporary, no one really talked to him. Zane used the time when he was chin-deep in boxes to practice the spell work in his head. Since he wasn't going days without sleep, and the classes hadn't gotten any easier, he had to find a way to keep up. He had to frequently remind himself the reason why he was at the Newtown Fish Market, which was surveillance on the hall, but he felt like, despite the prediction from Oculus Hall, he wasn't likely to see the gherkin again. It was only a condition that he was at the fish market, not that he see the brutal assassin. So it was to Zane's great surprise that his enhanced senses picked up the sharp smell of phase behind the hall. This by itself wasn't unusual, but what was unusual was that it came with a low hum that he could feel in his gut. Zane had the same experience when he'd first encountered the gherkin sword. Zane grabbed his stomach and grimaced. Hey, can I take an early break? Those kimchi raviolis I had last night are doing a number on my pipes. His foreman shook his head. Can't you hold it? We get charged for how long this truck is here. Zane let his eyes widen a little, as if his stomach had just sent a second warning salvo to his brain. I'd really rather. Fine, said the foreman. Damn kids these days can't be counted on for anything. Go. And wash your hands twice before you come back. Zane ran into the market, skipping right past the bathrooms and to the side street that led to Metallum Nocturne. The hall was a circular building with a cupola at the centre, which spat black smoke at all hours of the day and night. In the evening, a reddish glow from the forge shone on the nearby buildings. Faint banging could be heard if the market was quiet, which only happened after hours. But it wasn't after hours, and even with his imbuement, it was hard to pick up where it was he needed to be. At the street side he couldn't sense the vibration anymore, and phase itself wasn't unusual. Judging by the front of the hall, massive iron doors beneath an arch, there was nothing happening. But looks could be deceiving, so Zane decided to get a better view. Zane found an apartment complex and scaled the outside wall, using the windowsills. He went past a woman in one apartment, with a cigarette hanging from her lips, while she was performing Tai Chi. From the rooftop, he could see the cupola at the center of the building, sticking up about 30 feet above the rest of the structure. Only wisps of smoke trickled from the black opening at the top. When the wind blew his direction, he caught the scent of sulfur and formaldehyde. Behind the hall was a series of courtyards and slanted metal roofs. He hadn't realized they were part of the hall until he saw how they connected to the main circular building. When he concentrated his sensing towards that area, he picked up the hum again. Zane moved down the other side of the building, being careful not to rush and fall to his death. He dropped down on a lower roof, sprinted across it, and leapt a gap to the next building. The jumps were easy, not even blue course level, and he could easily do the purple course. When Zane reached the slanted metal roofs he went slow not for safety but for silence. Corrugated metal had a tendency to flex and pop, and that would give him away if he stepped wrong. He used the peak, where the structure was strongest, to nimbly reach the courtyard behind the hall. He couldn't see anyone, but he felt the humming in his gut. The scent of phase was stronger here, overcoming even the metallic smells from the many foundries inside. Someone was moving beneath the roof he was standing on. Using his heightened hearing he could tell they were tall, and though each step was made lightly, the individual was not small. It could easily be the gherkin lurking outside, waiting for its intended victim. Zane pulled out a tracking disc and let it rest in his palm. It would only take the flick of a wrist to place it on the gherkin, before he sounded the alarm and escaped as quickly as possible. He crept down the edge with his heart pumping hard in his chest. He'd made it halfway down when something hard slammed into the bottom of the metal roof, knocking him off his feet. Normally he could have flipped himself right back up, 
but a second impact shook the structure with a jarring hum that made his teeth rattle in his mouth and turned the slick roof into a slide. Zane went right off the edge, landing directly on his back, which knocked the air from his lungs. He flooded his limbs with phase so he could bounce back to his feet and flee the area, but a girl with a giant hammer in her fist stood over him. What are you doing on my roof? she asked, holding the head of the hammer against his chest. It felt like a truck had parked on him. The pain from the impact was still reverberating through Zane, so he could only muster a groan. Recognition dawned on both him and the girl. She was the red-headed librarian who had messed with him outside the restricted section. You, she said, her face crinkling with displeasure. Are you trying to get some sort of sick revenge? He coughed out a no and held his hands up to show that he was harmless. As quick as he was, the hammer could do some damage before he could slide out of the way. I didn't know you were under here, he rasped. Then what the hell are you doing creeping across our roof, she asked. I can explain but I'd like to get up first. I think there's a rock in my back, he said. Fine, she said, backing away, setting the hammer handle first on the ground and holding it right beneath the head. As he climbed to his feet, he got a good look at her. She was built more powerfully than he'd noticed before. It helped her shirt was sleeveless. She looked like she'd thrown the hammer in track and field, and her red hair was tamed into a functional braid that hung over her shoulder. She was undeniably beautiful. He had to remind himself not to stare, and that she'd just asked a question a moment before. Wow, that's a big one, she said, glancing downward momentarily. What? He couldn't believe what she'd just said, and his mouth hung open in surprise. The rock you were lying on, she said, pointing behind him. All right. She pursed her generous lips together. You were explaining? I was. He paused when he noticed the low hum again, then looking to his left realized where the vibration was coming from. Sitting on a table connected to a strange octagonal motor that emitted a pale blue light, was a sheet of metal set across a forge. I was, I thought I heard something troubling and came to investigate, he said. She glanced back to the humming motor. That caused you concern? Her face screwed up with anger. What are you trying to pull? You're lying to me, aren't you? I don't even know your name or what hall you come from, but here you are climbing over my roof and spying on me. I know, I know. This doesn't look good, he said, coughing. Then start explaining. Like start with your name. When he paused, she added, don't forget I can find out from the library. It's Zane Carter. I'm from the academy, he said. The skin around her eyes creased for a moment, before smoothing out as her eyes widened with recognition. I see. That explains why you're wearing a Newtown Fish Market apron and you stink like cod, she said. Zane wrinkled his nose at himself. He wished he was meeting her again under different circumstances. Less smelly ones. What are you, undercover or something, she asked. It's for class. We take jobs in the city to learn how to blend in, he said, feeling guilty that he was explaining hall methods. Nothing special. What's your name? Talian Vidalia, she said. But everyone calls me Tally. Like the onion, he asked. Yeah, it's a smelly plant, she said, clearly exasperated by years of comments. And it's layered, delicious, and tastes sweet when you cook it down, he said, thinking about how Nevia used them in the kitchen. She paused as if she were trying to decide what he meant by his comment. Sorry, my sister's a cook, he said. You still haven't explained why you freaked out about a little humming. What are you making, he asked trying to devise a metal that strains toxins from the air while still keeping its resilient properties, she said, then her green eyes flicked back to him. Stop stalling. Zane looked around trying to figure out a reason why the humming motor had caused him concern. Every answer he conceived would result in more questions from her. Eventually she would figure out that he was spying on her hall. When he looked back to her, Seeing the constellation of freckles across her nose, the intelligent cast to her gaze, the shapely curve to her hips, his face grew warm. I was practicing silent movement on difficult surfaces. I'm on my break and I heard the humming and thought I'd use investigating as an excuse, he said. The mean of disappointment crossing her face was a dagger to his pride. Not very silent, she said. Clearly not. He squinted. How did you even hear me? I was moving without sound. Tally pointed to a patch of faded shadow from the roof. I didn't hear you at all. 
Oh crap, he said, checking back at the overcast sky. There was enough sun to give him away. Good thing my instructors aren't here to see that. I'm sorry about interrupting your work. Her expression softened. You guys really sneak around and do magical ninja stuff. That's only a small part of the hall. I mean we are magical ninjas, but we're also much more than that. I spend a lot of my time learning about other cultures and their etiquette. For diplomacy stuff. He paused. So why do you work as a librarian if you're a hall student? Because books, said Tally as if that should explain itself. If I could live in a library, I would. It's filled with knowledge, you never get bored. It's the perfect home. Her green eyes sparkled as she looked him up and down. So you must have a long break. Panic set in. If he got fired, it would ruin his surveillance, more than he already had. He glanced around. Look, would you please keep this quiet? I really don't want to get in trouble. This would look bad to my instructors. A mischievous smile lurked on her lips. What's in it for me? Name your price, he said. A date, she said. I pick. You buy. The request was like a velvet uppercut. He didn't know what to say, as much as he knew exactly what he wanted to say, which was an emphatic yes. But Amber's prophecy came boiling back into his mind, burning away the pictures of them pressed against each other. If he truly liked her, the best thing he could do was to stay away. Her eager smile deflated. I can tell by that look on your face that you're not going to give me the answer I'm looking for. I would, trust me I would, but there are complications. A girlfriend? A boyfriend? Both. Celibate. I'm sorry, I can't explain. If things change I would, but I don't expect it to. He shoved his hands in his pockets. Name something else. She lifted her massive hammer easily. Nah. But don't worry. I'll keep this quiet. It's not like I'm friends with academy professors or anything. I wouldn't even know who to tell. Great. Thank you, he said as he walked away from her. I really appreciate it. And good luck with your project. Good luck with your magical ninja stuff. Don't forget about shadows. She winked at him. His face grew tingly. The whole way back to the fish market, he thought about the prophecy, and if there was any way around it, but he knew that was a fool's errand. He was destined to be alone. Chapter 14 The Honeycomb, January 2015 Blackjack might have been a better choice. Zane was on his way to a class with instructor Allgood on feigning death, when Priyanka stopped him in the hallway. She was wearing a flowery sundress, a blinding white hat with a huge bow on it, and white high heels, and she held a clutch purse made of what appeared to be bone. She shoved a black clothing bag into his chest. Put this on and meet me at the portal, she said. He hurried back to his room and unzipped the bag to find a pastel-colored suit that fit perfectly when he put it on. When he met her at the portal she removed his tie, unhitched the top two buttons, spread his shirt to expose his chest more, and then stepped back to take a look at him with her hand resting on her chin. I think you'll do, she said. Do for what? he asked. Priyanka dug into her bone purse and pulled out a tube of lipstick. To Zane's surprise, she placed the cool lipstick against his face and drew bold lines across it. Her surety kept him from questioning the odd behavior. When she was finished, she said, go look in that mirror. Zane let out a noise of surprise when he stepped in front of the reflective surface. The change was subtle, but he didn't look like himself. His cheekbones were sharper and his lips thicker. In his tight-fitting suit, he felt like a fashion model. No one, even his teammates, would recognize him. How does that even? The words died in his throat. The woman before him was no longer Priyanka Sai, the patron of the academy. Instead, she had the smoky pale complexion of a matri, a city elf. Many of the facial features were the same, yet no one would ever confuse the two. Are you up on your studies about the matri? He nodded. Good. I am Sabella, an old consort of the Diamond Queen. You are Fabriai, my current lover. She is well known for seducing humans. Try not to be noticed, but if you are, you'll have to improvise details about our relationship. Any questions? How can you be a former consort? Don't they only mix with others of royal blood? He asked. The real Sabella is retired to a realm far from the Matries. Queen Zaire has a capricious side, and she thought it was best to move on if she wanted to live a long life. 
I get to use her persona from time to time with the promise of giving her warning if the Diamond Queen ever decides to harm her. She paused and dug back into her bone purse. I almost forgot. Real matri have a strong effect on mortals. It wears off after a few decades, but I can't have you standing around staring blankly at them. Hold out your tongue. Zane felt like he was receiving communion when she squeezed an eyedropper's worth of clear liquid onto his tongue. It tasted like almonds at first, then grew increasingly bitter. Yuck, he said. So are we going to the Eternal City? Yes, unfortunately, she said with a heavy sigh. The Matri's realm is the closest one to ours, and easiest to reach. They are cold-hearted under the best of circumstances. While they tend not to meddle in our affairs, their conflicts sometimes bleed into our realm. In this case, we are going to find out who might have hired the Gherkin, or what information they might have desired from those heads. We will be attending a party thrown by one of the Diamond Court, in honor of the Queen. It will be in a casino, but not one you are used to. If you're curious enough to try any games, keep to the small stakes. You can draw from Sabella's account. She threw him an ornate bracelet made of bone with gold etchings. This will be enough to get you access, and is proof of your relationship to me if you decide to experiment. What is my job? he asked. Mostly as my arm candy. Lady Sabella is never seen without her lovers. Use this as a good first experience of the matri. In our profession, we frequently encounter them, due to that aforementioned closeness of realms, and because they are an excellent resource for morally questionable services. The journey through the portal was much shorter than when they'd visited the Black Council. They arrived in a gilded octagonal room. Through an open archway came a cacophony of sound, laughing, rattling, shouting. The ceiling of the vast hall beyond the archway was held up by massive columns, their pale surfaces etched in golden runes. It took a moment for Zane to recognize the structures as bone, but what gargantuan creature they could have come from staggered his imagination. Across the room, various games were in progress, and though they used familiar accoutrements like tables, dice and spinning wheels, there were other stranger contraptions that made his guts squirm. Like himself and Priyanka, the other nearby guests were dressed in blinding white and soft pastels. The majority in attendance were Matri, though he saw enough humans and humanoid beings to not feel completely out of place. Zane caught the side-eye glances at Priyanka or Sabella as she surveyed the crowd with detached amusement. She turned to him, offered her hand and said, Amuse yourself, my dear Fabrii, I must pay my respects to the Queen. He took her hand and kissed the back of it. Once she was gone, he headed towards the many side rooms off the main one, relieved that their faux relationship hadn't required a more intimate public display. He chuckled to himself that he was prepared to impersonate people, manipulate them, or outright steal from them, but the thought of making out with his patron gave him the cold sweats. Zane moved amid the people, keeping a bored expression as if he'd been to the casino many times and was unimpressed by the decadence. And while he understood the general structure of matri life, he could easily pick out if they were from the diamond, ruby or jade courts, he wasn't as up on the finer points of their social stratifications, nor his place as an adjunct to the former lover to the queen. At times he felt whiffs of adoration, as if he wanted to throw himself at the feet of the nearest matri, but the loss of control faded quickly. The liquid Priyanka had given him was working as intended. He stopped at the various games, trying to get a sense of their rules. At one table, each of the participants had their hand in a box at the center of the table. A wager of coins made of bone and etched with gold, a common theme of the room was pushed forward. Upon a wheel was a series of symbols that Zane recognized as the Matri's pictograph written language, though he only knew a few symbols. After the spinning wheel came to rest on a symbol he thought had to do with fire, the eight participants' faces went through various stages of grimacing. One by one each removed their hands holding it against their chest as if they'd been burned, the skin was unmarred, suggesting the flames were only in their head, until only one remained. The winner, a matri wearing a three-piece white suit and having his jet black hair slicked back like a gangster, collected his pile of coins from the attendant. Wheel of Hazards is a gruesome game, don't you think? asked a human woman next to him, who was clearly drawn to him because he was a fellow human. She had a short, ample figure, and wore what amounted to a white bikini. Her generous bosom was practically falling out of the dress. Only if you lose, said Zane, wandering away from the table. 
He kept moving through the room, listening to conversations, watching the games. Unlike in a human casino, there were no pure games of chance. In the Matri games, they played with pain or pleasure frequently. He watched as one table of participants held onto an octopus-like creature in a tank, their eyes rolling into the back of their heads, tongues lolling with ecstasy. The winner in this case was decided by who released the tentacle first. He considered playing that game since the price of losing wasn't all that bad, but the tentacled creature in the tank made him uneasy. The successive oddity of each new game drew him forward until he was in a distant section of the casino, populated by the lesser class of Matri. The theme of whites and pastels was supplanted by darker colors, signifying they came from the lower classes. Zane was busy watching a group of six Matri, one human, and a woman who wasn't quite human by her pebble-black eyes inhale swirling smoke through a hooker, when he saw a familiar face out of the corner of his eye. He silently swore it was the Matri from the Black Council, Tamako, slipping into a side room that was guarded by a casino worker in a white jacket. His thoughts ricocheted around in his head. What is she doing here? He didn't think they were supposed to leave Deathbird, though his knowledge of their rules and the pact was quite limited. But either way, he knew Priyanka would want to know what Tamako was doing. The attendant grabbed his arm when he tried to go through the door. The black-eyed matri said, you can't go in there. Zane shoved his bracelet in the attendant's face. His eyes narrowed, the smooth skin across his forehead wrinkling the barest minimum. He released his grip and looked back to the crowd haughtily. When he went through the door to find a smaller room with only a half dozen tables, he felt many eyes upon him and wondered if he'd made a mistake. But the goon had always taught him to act like he was an owner, even if he was only a janitor, so Zane thrust out his chest and strolled into the room confidently, and they went back to their games. Zane strolled around the tables looking for Tamako, but she was nowhere to be found. He switched on his sensing imbuement, and was immediately rewarded with the sound of her talking to another matri behind a row of curtains in the back of the room. The room boss, a matri with his black hair pulled into a bun at the base of his neck, handed Zane a long-stemmed glass of clear liquid. He leaned in close and spoke in a whisper. There are no spectators allowed here. Please choose your game quickly, or return to the general gaming area. Zane gave a nod of understanding, spied an open seat at the table closest to the curtains, and took it. Seven sets of matri eyes looked back at him. They performed the impressive feat of smirking without moving a muscle on their smooth faces. The table boss moved next to him. Your bracelet. Zane held it up. The table boss waved a black box over it. How much? His gut clenched. He had no idea what the coinage structure was. He tried to look annoyed as he said, whatever everyone's playing with. The table boss let a tight-lipped smile curl onto his lips. You don't have that much. He thought about getting up at that very moment, but he could hear Tamako in back still talking. He needed to know what she was saying. Then everything I've got, said Zane, hoping Priyanka would forgive him if he lost it all. The table boss set a meager stack of chips next to him. The others had multiple stacks twice as tall as his. He'd never been inside a human casino, but he was starting to recognize the signs of a high-stakes room. What was worse was that he didn't even know what the game was going to be, so he stared at the center of the table for clues. The center of the table was walled off with a hole in the front large enough to put his arm in. Various shiny pieces of metal were scattered about the area, with loops that made them look like oversized metal novelty rings. Wages please, said the table boss. Zane had never heard the word please sound less like a request and more like a nihilist's beat poem. As everyone set a stack of bone coins into a small square, Zane realized the bet would consume nearly all of his coins. The other bettors seemed amused by his presence, and he found their eyes drifting across him constantly. Beneath the table his knee bounced nervously. He tried to use the moment to concentrate on Tamako's conversation, but the impending contest left him hearing only snippets, nothing of the sort, you have my word, and it appeared she was being truthful. Wages set, said the table boss. Prepare for battle. Everyone's arms went flying through the holes like trains into a tunnel. They grabbed the metal implements quickly, like children fighting over favorite toys. By the time Zane realized what he needed to do, the metal items were taken by the others. He put his arm through the hole, his naked fist looking out of place. 
This wages match is Deathhead Scorpions, said the table boss. The name, while imposing, meant nothing to Zane, but what twisted his guts even more was the uncomfortable glances between his competitors. The matri were notoriously stone-faced, but the announcement of the scorpions left many throats swallowing. Remember, said the table boss, if your elbow leaves the battle area, you are out. A thin matri from three down looked Zane straight in the eyes and said, the agonizing pain from the sting lasts for years and the only remedy is death. There is no shame in removing your arm from the table. Though there is wisdom in removing your head from your ass first, quipped Zane, to the amusement of a matri woman across from him. The table boss said, the match may begin. The hole in the center of the table disappeared as a platform rose from below. Zane heard their chittering even before he saw them. There were at least two dozen black scorpions the size of his palm. His plan had been to use the game as a cover for listening to Tamako's conversation, but now that he saw them, he realized how foolish he'd been in joining the table. As soon as the center section was level with the table, the scorpions spread out, moving unerringly towards the eight competitors. The purpose of the metal implements became abundantly clear as the other competitors did battle with the scorpions. Within seconds, a thin matri on the other side of the table yanked his hand out of the center, forfeiting his stack of coins but saving himself from further damage. Zane had little time to observe, as two scorpions came skittering towards his unprotected hand. Using his speed imbuement, Zane darted his hand forward, flicking the nearest scorpion across the table, then dodging the stabbing stinger of the second. The death-head scorpion he'd flicked landed on the arm of the matri three to his right, the one who had taunted him at the beginning of the game, stinging him immediately. His competitor yanked his arm out so quickly that he fell over backwards in his chair. His high, reedy screams brought attendants from a hidden side room. They gathered him up, and he was carried out of the room, but not before Zane noticed that his arm was already puffed up like a grey sausage. Two more of his competitors removed their arms from the arena, shaking their heads with distaste at the brutal stakes of the game. There were only four remaining, and by chance they were each at the points of the compass. The matri across from Zane had four dead scorpions in front of her, killed with a metal spear no longer than a finger. Zane had acquired a tiny metal shield, which he was using to block stinger thrusts. Half the scorpions were dead, but the remaining ones were more wary, making their attacks in groups of three rather than one at a time. He was caught in a dilemma. If he stayed in the match and was stung, he'd probably be sent back to Varna to live out the next few years in misery. But if he removed his arm, they'd make him leave the room since he had no more coins, and he wouldn't hear what Tamako had to say. So Zane split his phase, half to the sensing imbuement, and the other half to speed, keeping out of the way of the scorpions, knocking them back into the middle rather than killing them. Hasn't left his realm in decades. Two scorpions came dashing towards his hand. He blocked one stinger into the other, and bent his arm away from their thrusts. When four scorpions attacked the matri on his left, he removed his arm from the battlefield. This caused a problem for Zane, as the remaining scorpions were being herded towards him by the matri across from him. She had angular cheekbones and a sneer that could have been etched in granite. She was clearly the fiercest competitor, having killed the most scorpions, undaunted by the threat of their stingers. The curtains behind him rustled. Zane sensed Tamako was leaving. He switched his focus to their conversation. They scattered through the known realms like a virus. It would only be... Zane was so intent on Tamako that he almost missed the matri across from him, dropping her spear and flicking a scorpion across the field. Before the death-head scorpion could land on his arm, he yanked it out of the hole. The match lasted for only a few seconds longer, when a half-dozen scorpions converged on the matri to his right, and he withdrew his arm, leaving the matri woman across from him victorious. Zane's gut sank as his stack of coins was collected and given to the victor. The table boss wasted no time, touching him on the shoulder. I'm sorry, you'll have to leave now. As Zane got up from the table, he collected the two remaining coins and shoved them into his pocket. The matri woman across from him gave him a nod of respect, which was bittersweet considering he'd lost nearly all the money in the account. Before he left, the curtains parted for a moment, and Zane caught a glimpse of Tamako talking to another matri, this one with a glowing tattoo on the side of his shaved head. Back in the main area, Zane's adrenaline caught up with him, 
and his arms shook for a good 30 seconds before he could control them again. The screams of the matri who'd been stung would haunt his dreams for the foreseeable future. He wandered around the tables, until suddenly Lady Sabella was by his side. He almost forgot that it was Priyanka, until she said under her breath, How did you lose all the money so quickly? I said to play cautiously. He didn't want to say Tamako's name in the open casino, so he hung his head down. I'm sorry, my dear Sabella. I made a foolish bet on black, and it came up on a five, and this is all that's left. Her expression went from anger to recognition at his coded words. We're going home, she said, marching towards the portal. Zane tucked his chin to his chest and followed Priyanka. Once they went through the portal back to her office in the spire rather than the honeycomb, she said, were you implying you saw Tamako? He nodded, then proceeded to explain what had happened. It was strange talking to Lady Sabella, because Priyanka let her human expressions color the matri's face during the explanation. The raised eyebrow and inhalation of breath at the mention of death-head scorpions was followed by Priyanka pacing away. That was a huge risk you took, said Priyanka. I realize now, but I thought it was important. The risk of a few years of pain was worth it. His hands trembled again at the price of the match. He was asking as much for himself. For the matri, it's a few years, said Priyanka. For a human, you would have endured pain for decades. Zane was left speechless. But, she said, nodding her head, you did good work. I didn't think Tamako could leave Deathbird, said Zane. With the full council's permission anyone can leave, though anyone can also leave if they're clever enough, but I assume that Tamako was sent because the Black Council is also concerned about what has happened, said Priyanka. May I ask what you learned? A hint of a smile coloured her lips. A source inside the Diamond Court claims the Gherkin has not left his realm, and that no one has hired him. I'm inclined to believe they're lying, though I have no proof. Also, someone is plotting against the halls. I don't know what they're after or what they intend to do, but the pieces moving are worrisome enough. The surveillance of the Metalum Nocturne is even more important now. What do we do next? asked Zane. Priyanka looked into the jungle interior of her office. You and your team keep watch. I have some thinking to do. Chapter 15 13th Ward, January 2015 The Sting of the Night Air after the trip to the Diamond Queen's casino, Zane was relieved to focus on his studies. The end of the game had been too close a call, and it left him shaking when he thought about it. The instructors had warned him that his hubris would cost him, and up until then he thought he could handle it, but that game was a window into how much more dangerous things could get. To shake his lingering unease, and to keep their imbuements honed, Zane convinced his team to take a few laps on the parkour course that Allgood had introduced them to the year before. Though it had only been a year since he'd first run it, Zane found the purple course not as challenging. It helped that he'd run it enough he had every jump memorized. Even in the dark, with only the distant light of the city reflecting off the cloud layer, he never felt in danger. Instead, he felt a sense of great joy. Zane sped across the rooftop close on Skylar's heels. They were playing follow the leader, which required matching the leaders, which in this moment was Skylar, every step, twist and leap. Keelan had come up with the game on a previous visit, and they'd taken to it like a calf to milk. To an onlooker, Zane imagined that it looked like they were running on trampolines, the way they bounced off brick buildings and soared through the air with ease. Skylar did a back handspring off the roof to a lower one, landing into a cartwheel. Zane matched her even though he thought the flipping was a little excessive, since real-world situations wouldn't require such moves, but it was definitely fun. The others came behind, hollering and whooping like a pack of nimble hyenas. While there weren't any businesses or housing around, Zane had seen some people in the nearby industrial park, gathered around burn barrels, and he wondered what they thought of the noise, though he supposed if they'd chosen to live in the city of sorcery, they shouldn't be surprised by anything. When Skylar's lap finished, they took a break on the building where Zane had fallen. He thought it appropriate, as a reminder of his failing. Vin had his leg at an obscene angle as he stretched. A man your size shouldn't be that limber, said Zane. A man my size should absolutely be this limber, as it keeps me from being hurt. Big people need to stretch more, said Vin with a too proud grin. Hey, said Portia, us little people need to stretch too, especially for... Skylar rolled her eyes as she said, sex yes, we get it. 
Portia placed her palm over her heart. I am very hurt that you would say that. I was going to suggest something else, but your rude interruption made me lose my train of thought. Portia stuck her tongue out playfully at Skylar, who returned fire with her own, adding crazy eyes and shaking her head. Come join the fun, Keelan, said Vin, when he noticed Keelan standing on the edge of the building, looking at the soft glow on the bottom of the clouds. He glanced back, a wry smile on his lips. Sorry, just thinking about home. I still ain't used to the big city. The others looked to Zane as if they expected him to say something, but he feigned interest in adjusting his running shoes. After a long pause, Vin cleared his throat. I think it's the greatest place in the world. Though it took a little getting used to. Always feels like this crazy right around every corner. It's not the city itself, said Keelan, gesturing ahead. It's I don't know, like looking at a picture of home rather than being home. Zane's heart tore at his cousin's words. He'd hoped having him in the group would help Keelan, but it seemed that it wasn't working. He caught Skylar looking at him, and realized that he'd let his emotions cloud his expression. She looked back to Keelan. I know the transition from your team to ours has been difficult, said Skylar. And I can't say that I was happy about it at first, but you've been a great addition to the team. I'm glad you're with us. Me too, amigo, said Portia. You're all right for a southerner. There was a pregnant pause when everyone looked at Vin. He threw his shoulders in a shrug. I already told him how happy I was he's here. You mean you made a pass at him, said Skylar with a wink. Well, of course. I'm not blind, am I? Joked Vin. Keelan smiled back. I regret that I had to say no. As it were, even if I was inclined, I wouldn't for the sake of the team. He put his hands on his hips. I'm sorry to be all maudlin. I appreciate what you're all trying to do. I do feel welcomed, but you know these things take time. I'm sure by the end of the year, I won't want to return to Varna. Mention of their hometown brought dark glances from the others. Vin and Skylar looked to Portia, as if they expected her to say something. Fine, I'll ask. It's as good a time as any, said Portia. What's the deal with Varna? Why do you two and the instructors get all weird when that place is mentioned? And why does a little town in Alabama have so many students in the halls, and all of them in the academy? A tightness coiled around Zane's chest. He'd avoided this conversation for nearly two years. He knew it couldn't last, but he didn't know what to say. You can't help us with it, said Keelan. We don't even know what it is or why it matters, said Skylar. But we're your teammates, we'd like to know. Keelan's right, said Zane. There's nothing you can do to help us. He had in the past debated telling them his plan, but decided that it was unfair of him to burden them with his problems. Especially since their patron knew about it, and had let it continue to exist. How could they help? We're your teammates. We have a right to know, said Portia. It's this secret you two carry around with you. If you want us to be a better team, tell us. Maybe we can't help, but maybe we can better understand. Zane started to open his mouth, but Keelan signaled for him to be quiet. It's better you don't know. But the way they crossed their arms told him they weren't going to take no for an answer. I can tell you this much, said Zane, spreading his hands at his cousin in apology. The patron, the instructors, they all know about it and do nothing for good reason. Because there's nothing you can do. This didn't seem to satisfy them, so he continued. Have you ever noticed we go see instructor Allgood about once a month? They nodded. We go to receive poison, or antidote, however you look at it. If we don't, then pretty soon afterwards, we die. That's awful, said Skylar, mouth twisted with disgust. Tell us who is doing this and we'll hurt them for you, said Portia with fists at her sides. Keelan said, if you kill the Lady of Varna, then no one can receive the poison anymore, and we all die. Everyone. Down to the smallest babies. Vin looked like he was going to be sick. And Priyanka knows this, asked Skylar, gasped. Yes, said Zane. Skylar stalked away, looking towards the city. This is terrible. I don't want to be in the academy if this is what it is. I will tell her this is wrong first thing when we get back to the academy, said Portia, snarling with rage. Guys, please you can't, said Zane. This is why we haven't told you. And please don't say anything to Priyanka. I don't know why this relationship exists, but it's complicated. I don't think she wants it willingly. 
As he said the words, he knew he had no reason to think that was true, except that he liked the patron. Was it because she'd made him her protege? He caught a funny look from Keelan, suggesting that he didn't have the same opinion, but his cousin declined to say anything in front of the others. Do you know why she allows this? asked Skylar. No, said Zane, shaking his head. But I don't think it's as simple as it seems. Anyway, it's not all bad. At the end of our five years, we return to Varna and work for the lady. No one dies. We're trapped, but at least we'll have our families. Keelan kept a stone face. Zane had purposely left out how the returning mages were turned into bland automatons, subservient to the lady. It would only make things worse. It was enough they understood their burden. Vin approached Zane with tears in his eyes and gave him a bear hug. I'm so sorry. Then he moved to Keelan and did the same. When Vin backed away, Keelan wiped the tears from his own eyes. Is there anything we can do to help? Like anything, said Portia. I'll pull someone's fingernails out, or put like a really nasty scratch in their new car door. Zane looked to the emotion-racked faces of his teammates. You can help by being your awesome selves, which will make these five years in the academy the best ever. Everyone nodded. We'll come visit you, said Skylar. That would be nice, said Zane, though he knew it wouldn't happen unless he found a way to kill the lady. Wanting to get them out of their crappy mood, he said, and you can eat my dust. Last one around the course has to scrub the bathtub. Zane leapt away from them, a ripple of laughter following. Gross, Portia shaves her legs in there, said Skylar from behind as she leapt into a sprint. But Zane didn't let them keep up with him, like he had when they played follow the leader. He wanted to wash away the last conversation with a flood of fays and endorphins. Within the first three buildings he'd lost most of his team. Only Keelan was half a building back. Zane glanced back to see his cousin soaring through the air, and though it was mostly dark, he sensed a grin on his face. When they rounded past the industrial park, Zane saw the vagrants huddled around the burn barrels warming their hands. In his speed he nearly missed that one of them, tall, hooded and standing in back, was staring directly at him, which shouldn't have been possible with the firelight. The strangeness of it lingered in his mind, slowing his pace. It was probably the only thing that saved him, that and a yell from Keelan. Zane sensed something moving fast towards him from the left. Rather than land on his feet, he ducked his head and rolled onto the next building. Claws and swift wings flew past, followed by something long that ripped through the heating vents to his right as if they were made of paper mache. Keelan threw two globs of fire at the creature. As the flame left his outstretched hands, Zane saw a second creature descending on his cousin. It had a body the size of a horse, leathery wings, and a tail that ended in a huge stinger. A force bolt over Keelan's head forced the flying creature to veer away at the last moment, but the stinger caught him, spinning his cousin into a brick wall. Zane's heart stopped for a moment. Zane leapt the short gap separating him from Keelan, ignoring that the first flyer was probably winging back around to attack again. He grabbed his cousin expecting to find his guts spilling out, but found him intact instead. The force bolt must have deflected the creature enough that the tail missed impaling his cousin. Keelan groaned from pain but otherwise looked healthy. Watch out! Zane spun around, realizing that he was too late. The beastie was upon him, the stinger lunging towards his chest. Then a trio of elements, earth, water, air, knocked the creature away. Their teammates came leaping onto the rooftop, firing elemental magic at both creatures, who quickly decided they were outmatched and winged away into the darkness. Remembering the hooded figure, Zane sprinted back to the building by the industrial park, finding the vagrants staring at the buildings as they'd clearly seen the magic being flung into the sky. But of the hooded figure, he saw no sign. His teammates caught up to him. What did you see? asked Skylar. He's gone now. Who? asked Vin. Zane rubbed the back of his neck. The gherkin, maybe? I don't know. I didn't see a sword. What were those things? They're called stingtails, said Portia. They live in the jungles in southern Mexico. They need a warm climate and tend to stay away from people. No way they were up here in this cold place on their own. Do you think that guy you saw had something to do with them? asked Keelan. Probably, though I don't know for certain. Either way, we need to tell Priyanka. It could have been the Gherkin, or maybe another assassin sent to stop us, he said. In his gut, he worried that he'd screwed up when Tally had knocked him off the building. He doubted that she could have had anything to do with it, 
but maybe whoever was watching Nocturne had seen him and figured it out. Or maybe he was wrong about her completely. I think we have to assume that our surveillance has been compromised, said Zane. Portia gave a heavy sigh. That's disappointing. I didn't realize how much I was going to enjoy torturing people with burpees and planks. It's really amazing that people pay me money for that privilege. We should head back, said Zane. And from now on, we need to be careful about going out alone. I'll talk to Priyanka and let her know about the attack. Keelan was rubbing his chin and staring at Zane. You look like you have something else in mind. I do, he said. I made a mistake a few weeks ago, and now I've got to figure out if that's what gave us away. Skylar gave him a questioning look. And how are you going to do that? I have to go on a date. Chapter 16 Sixth Ward, February 2015 Operation, the date Preparations for the date with Tally mirrored the planning for an extensive field operation. He let his teammates help him with the details, which turned into a whole lot of friendly arguing over the best location, proper conversational strategy, appropriate clothing, defensive spells and the like. The early version of the date had him taking Tally to a play or a comedy show, so the others could steal her purse during the event, to place a tracking beacon, and otherwise rifle through her belongings looking for items that might give her away. Portia had contrived a flight to New York, so they'd have to go through the security scanners at the airport that might indicate if she was a shapeshifter or doppelganger, but there was no way Zane could convince her to go on such an extravagant first date without coming off as pretentious. Zane decided on the Museum of Magical Artifacts as the location for the date, since it was public, would give them a lot of time to talk, and he'd always wanted to visit the magical art section. There was also much discussion of clothing, in which Skylar took preeminence, suggesting all sorts of spell-hardened suits that would make him feel like he was wearing armor. In the end, Zane decided to follow the keep it simple principle. It was highly unlikely that she was an agent, or had anything to do with the attacks. And though he hadn't told his teammates, he knew most of the reason he decided to ask Tally on a date was to have a way to see her again, without possibly triggering his prophecy. If he was taking her on a date for surveillance operations, rather than as a love interest, he could enjoy the time with her without fearing for her safety. That was the theory anyway. Tally had been a little surprised when he'd called her at Metallum Nocturne, but she'd immediately said yes, so enthusiastically that a stone sunk into his gut with regret that he couldn't be completely honest with her. Zane was standing in front of a mirror, examining the clothing Skylar had picked out for him. He wore dark slacks and a dark jacket over a white button-down. I look like a secret service agent, he said, turning this way and that while Skylar stood behind him with a bemused look on her face. You can guard my body any time you want, she said, switching into an almost British accent. Zane darling, you look hot. Capital H-O-T. Hot. The others hadn't been paying attention since this was the 18 bazillionth outfit that Skylar had made him try on, but a trio of heads came up, followed by gasps and whistles. Portia said something low in Spanish that made Zane feel dirty for even hearing it, even though he hadn't understood a word. You are criminal hot, said Vin, shaking his head. Damn cos. With that fay dot wow. I should take a picture and send it to Uncle Massio and Aunt Sella. They would be impressed, said Keelan. And Nev would call me a city boy or something. She already makes fun of me for losing my accent. He glanced at his watch. Damn. I'm running late. Are you sure you don't want anybody to come along? Asked Vin. She won't notice a thing. No, I'm good, said Zane. The MoMA has tight security because of the artifacts. And I really don't expect anything weird to happen. Mostly, I want to figure out why the Gherkin might be targeting her hall. I figure the artifacts in the museum will give her enough inspiration to keep talking, without having to ask her questions. Skylar shoved a tracking disc into his hand. At least take this on the off chance that you see the Gherkin. We should all be carrying them wherever we go. Maybe we could have got one on that guy who sent the stingtails after us last week. Reluctantly, but generally agreeing with her logic, Zane shoved the disc into his pocket. They sent him off with their affections. As he rode the train to the sixth ward, he couldn't find any place for his hands. 
an older woman with her pink handbag on her lap eyed him from across the seats. Going on a date? He nodded. She must be nice for as nervous as you are, she said. A lump formed in his throat. He realized how much more he was hoping for from the date than just information. She is, he said, then added, I hope. The old woman gave him a wink as he left the train. He made it to the steps of the MoMA right on time. He spun around looking for her, his heart tapping on his chest like an energetic drummer when he didn't see her at the bottom. A two-finger whistle brought his attention to the top of the stairs, where he saw Tally. She practically knocked him over from fifty feet away. She wore a sleeveless cobalt blue dress that looked painted on. Her bright red hair had been braided and hung over her shoulder. If fashionable Amazon was a trendy look, she'd nailed it. When he reached the top of the stairs, an intoxicating floral perfume wrapped itself around his head like a constrictor, squeezing out all thoughts. You look, and his brain blanked for a moment amazing. Zane instantly regretted that his compliment was so lackluster, but she beamed a smile at him, and he forgot about it. You look delicious. As soon as the words came out of her mouth her eyes went wide, and a rosy blush appeared on her cheeks. Thank you, he said laughing. An awkward silence intruded, and all thoughts about the gherkin or the moma or anything else in his head flew out like a birdcage upended. The only thing he could see were her bright green eyes staring down at him amid a constellation of freckles. He noticed a tattoo of an ancient ship design with initials in the hull on the inside of her forearm. I like your boat, he said, and his fingertips accidentally brushed her soft skin bringing goose bumps. It's for my grandfather, she said and her eyes took on a misty quality, so he swallowed away his questions. Shall we enter? After paying, she slipped her hand into the crook of his arm. His whole body broke out in tingles. Zane led them into the magical arts section. It was a Saturday afternoon, and it was full of chattering families, and a group of kids being led by an adult with a headset. The first hall displayed paintings that had been created using magical paints or brushes, sometimes purposefully, sometimes accidentally. Wordlessly they stood before a lifelike painting of a goat perched on a fence post until Zane cleared his throat and said, Can you hear the goat? She wrinkled her nose in confusion until he gestured to the placard. Supposedly you can hear the actual goat that the painting was based on, since the painter mixed its hair, along with other alchemical agents, into the paints. Let's listen, she said, mouth open, resting her tongue on the bottom of her teeth. Her eyes roved while she listened, and Zane found himself too distracted to pay attention, until a faint bleating sounded at the edge of his hearing. That was weird, she said, and then her eyes alert as if she had an idea. Her expression brightened. Let's go to the foundry section. Tally grabbed his hand and led him into a huge room filled with suits of armor under glass cases. She went straight to a suit of colorful samurai armor with lacquered plates stitched together with silken cords. The metal splints linked with chain-covered sleeves of blue brocade fabric, while a red figure dancing across blue waves was painted on the curved chestplate. Achala armor, she exclaimed breathlessly, the same way a child might speak about a favorite toy. She placed her forehead on the glass and took a deep breath as if she were trying to inhale the armor. It was made in the Edo period by an unknown artist. Armor? I thought armor went into the artifact section, he said. They keep it here because its magic is mostly latent, nothing dangerous for modern times. She pointed at the placard, and as she spoke her face lit up like a fireworks display. Supposedly it's lucky, but I don't care about that, it's downright beautiful. Look at the fine weave of those links, a master made them, and the Achala painting. Achala was a guardian spirit, the immovable one. If I could make one thing as beautiful as this, like ever, I'd be happy. Is that Bunjinga styling? he asked. She tilted her head at him. How do you know what Bunjinga styling is? I was going to go to art school before I came here, he said. Her face wrinkled with confusion, making the freckles on her nose dance. You sound regretful that you didn't get to attend art school. Did you not want to come to the halls? Or maybe not to the academy specifically? I wanted the academy, but I wish I had time for art again. Before I left I was making a working miniature carousel out of stuff I found at the junkyard, he said. Her eyes widened. That sounds awesome. I'd love to see it. He looked at his shiny shoes. It's only half finished and it doesn't spin. 
but I had half the miniature horses welded together out of nuts and bolts. She put a finger under his chin and gently lifted. Why are you embarrassed about it? I'm not embarrassed. She shifted her lips to the side. You're blushing and you won't meet my eyes. He sighed. Maybe I am a little. I hate not finishing things. I know that feeling, she said. When she stopped speaking he raised an eyebrow. And? Tally went still, as if the air had been sucked out of the room, then she glanced at Zane and blushed when she realized she was no longer talking. Sorry. It's my dad. I love him, but he only ever thinks about how my schooling benefits him. The classic mage dad, said Zane. Can he, you know, do magic? He's not hall trained if that's what you're asking, she said. What's he like, asked Zane. Her eyes sparkled with thought. He's a great dad. I'd do anything for him, because he'd do the same for me. Family is everything, you know? Zane nodded. You look a little sad about it. Tally made a throwaway shrugging gesture. He's too serious these days. I miss when we used to go on vacations. There was this amazing ski lodge he would take me, it was called the Ice Hold. My favorite memories are from there. Why don't you ask him to take you sometime, he asked. Maybe, she said glancing sideways. It's only open during short seasons due to the extreme weather, which probably wouldn't be bad, then we'd have the place to ourselves. Zane didn't know anything about skiing, only that it looked cold. Sounds fun, said Zane, thinking about how it'd be interesting to try skiing. Yeah. She looked at him funny as if she'd forgotten who she was talking to. Can I not talk about my dad? He nodded. What are your parents like, she asked. My dad likes to say he's a philosopher artist with a daytime teaching habit, and I think that fits him pretty well. If I could make art even a tenth as good as his, I'd be happy. And my mom is an architect, or at least tries to be, when she can find a job. They sound really cool, said Tally. He nodded. I got lucky when it came to the family department. Tally's shoulders slumped with the suggestion that hers wasn't so great, so he pointed across the room to another set of armor, this time an elaborate French armor suit with a plumed helmet. Check that one out, he said, hoping to distract her. They wandered through the halls, discussing the sculptures, statues and other art installations littered throughout. They had a particularly grand time examining the tiny tea sets a mad mage from the 1500s had created by reducing human sizes down to mouse size for his pet critters. He was having such a great time that he forgot he was supposed to be figuring out why the gherkin might be targeting her hall. They were staring at a hunk of flame frozen into stasis by an enterprising mage, and he said, so you know a lot about my hall, but I don't know much about yours. What does your hall do, besides develop ripped biceps for its mages? Tally flexed her muscles as if she were on stage. It's certainly a perk. I was on the lifting team in high school. Can you make magic weapons or armor, he asked. Her forehead nodded. I mean we can, but why? No, we're more like metallurgical nerds talking about grain sizes for metal matrixes, or how to alloy with alchemy, the best way to improve thermal yields on fey hardened steel. I don't even know what you said, except the fey part, and I thought they were allergic to iron, he said. She stuck her tongue out playfully. Shows what you know. Not a lot, apparently, he said, searching for another way to get her to talk about her haul. What about that thing you were working on when I dropped in on you? She coughed out a laugh. Dropped in? You mean you fell on your ass? The word ass echoed through the marble hall, bringing around heads. She ducked her head and held up a hand in apology. Tally spoke again, this time a whisper but keeping her playful smirk. I knocked you right off that roof. Dropped in. Ha. Huh. You sure know how to knock a man off his feet. He looked at his hands. So did your project work? The one you were hammering on before I made an ungracious entrance. I'm trying to make a porous metal that filters impurities in the air using reverse osmosis. She bit her lower lip. Everything I've tried so far hasn't worked. Spells, transmutation agents, I even considered summoning a demon. I feel like I'm so close yet so far. What's the problem? She hung her head. It only works for a few seconds, and then the impurities overcome the filter rendering it useless. Don't most filters use charcoal or something similar, he asked. I'm trying to make a universal filter. That's the challenge my professor gave me. 
He said it would help in hospitals and with aura healer work, she said, rubbing her arms as if she were cold. Can't you put something sticky inside of it? he asked. It has to be able to withstand significant stresses as well. There's nothing that's both strong, flexible, fits in small places and is also sticky. Spider webs, he asked. Her eyes expanded with excitement, then she grabbed him by the shoulders and mashed her lips against his. When she pulled away, the lingering taste of strawberries was on his mouth. Oh my god. Thank you. Why didn't I see that before? It's perfect. He was still reeling from the kiss, which had hit him like a jackhammer. Tally seemed to catch herself, as if she hadn't realized what she'd just done until well afterwards. Oh, was all she said. I'm sorry. Nothing to be sorry about. It was nice. Unexpected but nice. Only nice. You sure know how to wound a girl's pride, she said with a hand on one hip, sassing her head to the side. I'm up for a do-over. You really have to get these kinds of things right, he said. She beamed a smile back at him and winked. I'm a bit of a perfectionist when it comes to things like this. Zane stepped forward until their faces were only a few inches apart. In her heels, she was taller than him. Her green eyes sparkled with flecks of gold, like a mossy stream in the land of Fae. Her lips then her teeth parted, half in anticipation, half in a smile. He leaned in, delaying the touching of their lips as long as he could, their mouths opening hungrily the closer they got, until they pressed against each other from lips to hips and down to their toes. It felt like falling into a warm pool. His body was one big goosebump. And when her wet tongue flicked against his, he slipped his hand onto the back of her neck and pulled her into an embrace. He didn't know how long they stood next to the displays of tiny tea sets, but he could have stayed for a month. When Tally pulled away she was panting. Zane had to remind his hands that they were standing in the middle of a museum. She bit her lower lip. The guard is giving us the stink eye. I think we'd better move on. They walked hand in hand into the next hall. Zane felt like he was floating ten feet off the ground. All he could think about was the way her body felt against his. As if a magnet pulled them there, they found a cul-de-sac between two display areas and pressed themselves into it, re-engaging their kissing in earnest. Suddenly she pulled away, a confused look on her face. Something's digging into my leg, she said. Well you did say it was big when I fell for you, he said, chuckling. No, she said, forehead wrinkling. Your pocket, something sharp poked me. He looked down, seeing something straining out of the left side of his pocket. Somehow he'd activated the tracking disc. He tried to turn it off inside his pocket, but slipping his hand inside only gave it a chance to spring out and attach itself to Tally's waist. What the hell is this? she asked, clearly alarmed, pushing at the disc as if it were burning her. It's nothing. A tracking device. Something from a lesson I must have left in my pocket. But the way she glared at him told him that she didn't believe it. Were you planning on putting this on me? No, he said, yanking the tracker from her hip. I swear. I forgot it was in there. He quickly turned it off and shoved it back into his pocket. Tally crossed her arms. Then why were you asking me so many questions about my project and what the hall is doing? This isn't a date at all, is it? This is some project of yours. A sick joke, isn't it? No, I swear. I really like you. We're on a date, he said. She shook her head as she paced away. My friends told me I was stupid to go out with you. Your guild is nothing but thieves and liars. You're just trying to get information from me. Or it's some sort of sick game. Why did I ever allow myself to like you? She had tears in her eyes as she stuck a finger in his face. I bet you planned that whole library thing, and the fall, and then calling me out of the blue when I thought there wasn't a chance. Why was I so stupid? The heartbreak in her voice was worse than the accusations. He could barely muster a word because while she'd gotten some of the details wrong, she was right about his intentions. But he had strong, uncontrollable feelings about her too. Shouldn't that count for something? Tally stomped off, wiping her eyes with the backs of her hands. A couple of older women shot him the glare of death, correctly assuming he was the cause of her tears. Long after she was gone, he stood against the wall, trying to remember what it felt like to kiss her, and wondering how he'd let it go all wrong. Chapter 17 11th Ward, March 2015 At least it's not Chucky. 
A week after his botched date with Tally, Zane was downtown picking up spices from an international market to send to his sister Nevia when he received an urgent text from Keelan. Keelan, meet me in Ward 11 ASAP. Zane's questions back were met with silence, so he abandoned his quest for spices and hopped on the nearby red line, feeling twitchy and bouncing his knees the whole ride. When he reached the 11th ward, he stood outside the station, busily checking his phone for messages from Keelan and worrying about what might be wrong. He cousin hadn't explained where they'd be headed, but the only place he thought it could be was the smallest eye hall, the same place that they'd first seen the gherkin. Zane was about to head off to the hall alone when he heard Keelan's voice from behind him. Hey Cos, said Keelan as they embraced. Keelan had his red and black leather jacket on, along with shades. He looked like he was ready to head out to a bar, rather than an emergency. What's going on? asked Zane. Keelan gave him the covert signs for lying and follow me. Instructor Penny Whistle had suggested that their teams develop hand signals to use, when someone might be eavesdropping to communicate without being overheard. Thought we could get out, enjoy a day off and play some pool at the bar up the street, said Keelan. Concerned about the obfuscation, Zane fell in with his cousin as he headed down the street, amping his senses to detect anyone who might be following them. The trash pickup services looked like they hadn't been through the streets in weeks, so the whole area had a fetid smell. Once they were a couple of blocks from the train station, and the only person close by was a homeless man lying on a city bus bench with a blue tarp over him, Zane said under his breath, What's going on? Are we in danger? While keeping his mouth from moving, Keelan said, Being cautious after attack. We'll explain later. At first, Zane thought they were going to the smallest eye, but Keelan brought them to the west, away from it. The sun had slipped over the horizon with little fanfare. This was a bad area of town, and though they were a couple of hall-trained mages, without bullet-hardened clothing, a spray of gunfire would take them both out in an instant. When they turned the corner across the street from a convenience store with metal bars in the windows, Keelan leapt on top of a brick wall, and then climbed up a three-story brownstone as if it were a ladder. Zane followed, trusting that his cousin would explain in good order. They leapt from roof to roof in near silence, and a few minutes later, landed in the courtyard of the smallest eye, the same place they'd seen the gherkin take the head of a mage. The place hadn't changed much since the last time, except that the building was boarded up, and yellow signs from Invictus City Police announcing that trespasses would be prosecuted had been stapled to them. If anyone was following us, I assume we lost them, said Keelan. Was anyone following us? I don't know, but after the sting tales, I didn't want to take a chance. I will assume that our current location suggests that you learned something, said Zane. It's a wonder you never beat me in grades with logical acumen like that, said Keelan. I could only take so many art and philosophy classes. While Zane had taken his share of advanced placement studies, Keelan had maxed out on them. Had he been able to attend college, he would have had his pick of the best ones, based on his grades. Keelan pulled the boards from the back door, the place where the gherkin had knocked them off their feet. I guess we're not worried about those signs, said Zane. When have you ever been worried about breaking and entering? asked Keelan. Since we got arrested here five months ago. A second time won't look good, even with our special privileges as hall majors, said Zane. I'm not too worried about it. With the head patron dead or missing, the city doesn't seem to run as well anymore. This crime scene is an example. They should have cleaned it up months ago, said Keelan. Why? There are no new halls. As you said, Invictus is dead. Until someone figures out how to take his place, the Hundred Halls is on a long track to eventual extinction. Not in our lifetimes, said Keelan with an ambivalent shrug. Stepping through the space between the boards, they entered the hall. A pair of floating mage lights appeared. So why are we here? asked Zane. I was doing some research at the library, stuff I gleaned from the ecological webs of arachnids. Don't worry, I stayed out of Tally's section. Basically, I was trying to find other works about Papura Domina Arania, using the text from the book as a guide, but never actually looking for the explicit passages. Kind of like doing an internet search on porn, but never actually writing the word into the browser, so no one can prove that you were searching for it. It was then I started finding other books that were talking about the spiders, but never naming them as if other researchers had run into similar problems.
A lot of them had to do with the Animalians Hall. That's cool, but what does that have to do with the smallest eye? asked Zane. I'm getting there, said Keelan with his hands out. I was sitting in the back of the library trying to daydream myself around the problem, when I started thinking about the Gherkin problem and how we still don't know why he's taking heads. It occurred to me that maybe whoever hired him is after specific information that you can only find in those halls, but didn't want to reveal they were looking for it, so they took the heads. Like how I'm looking for information about Papura Domina Arania, but not using that name because the lady has somehow blocked it. Okay, so someone hired the Gherkin to gather information they could have found more simply. It doesn't really add up. Why hire an assassin that hasn't left their realm in decades, at an obscene price, if you could have done the same thing by stealing it or bribing someone? Keelan tapped on a table. I don't have it completely worked out but something about it feels right. Which halls have been targeted so far? asked Keelan. Zane held out his hand and ticked them off as he said, the smallest eye, aura healers and metallum nocturne. And what do they have in common? asked Keelan. Aura healers are doctors, smallest eye is into microbiology, and metallum nocturne are blacksmiths. I don't know, got me? said Zane. A secret smile formed on Keelan's lips. They're researchers, generally into using magic to create a better society. So the gherkin is taking the heads of researchers? asked Zane. To what end? The excitement in Keelan's eyes dimmed as he looked around the ruined hall. I don't know. That's why we're here. To prove my hypothesis. Look for anything that they were working on. Zane was going to bring up that even if they found something, there was no way to know what was taken from the aura healers, and since Metallum Nocturne hadn't been attacked yet, they were blind there. But it warmed his heart that his cousin had gotten involved with the investigation. Bringing him into his team had been the right move. While Keelan searched in another part of the hall, Zane moved through what looked like a laboratory filled with expensive alchemy equipment, microscopes and small machines on a stainless steel counter. Three separate tables contained rows of glassware connected by sagging plastic tubes filled with a crusty blue dust. Zane recalled last time he'd seen it, the mixture was bubbling as it moved through the tubes and puffing out a white gas at the end. Everything looked newish, though it was currently covered with dust from sitting unused for so long. He took a tentative sniff, catching the faint scent of sweetness, but kept looking. Without a background in arcane chemistry, he had no way to know what they'd been trying to do. He needed to find books or other notes. An office behind the lab looked like it might have been used by the patron of the hall. An open laptop remained in a pile of curled papers on a desk surrounded by bookshelves. The keyboard was sticky, clearly from the drink knocked over in haste as the patron probably hurried to the source of the chaos. Zane tried to start the computer, but the direct hit from the soda had fried its electronic components. He wiped his fingers on his jeans and was moving to the tall shelves on the right, when something lurched out of the darkness at him. He leapt out of the way, spells on his fingertips, expecting to do battle with some supernatural creature or drug-addled vagrant who'd squatted in the office, landing on top of the coffee table. The legs gave way with a loud snap, sending him unceremoniously to the floor, while out of the corner of his eye the creature moved after him. Abby. A misshapen being about two feet tall stepped out of the shadows, the mage light casting shadows across its lumpy face. Abby, it asked again, its soft confusion enough of a clue to its benign nature for Zane to hold his fire. Keelan came crashing into the room. The creature looked up to him, asking a third time. Abby. Keelan started laughing. The creature looked like a piece of clay formed into a lumpy child. Its shoulders were tilted and it moved with a limp. I heard your scream and the crash and thought something got you, said Keelan, leaning over on his knees, laughing. What is it? asked Zane, looking into its amber-colored eyes. I think it's a homunculus, said Keelan, squinting in the dim light. Don't worry, little buddy, we're not Abby, but we're not here to hurt you. A red glow formed in the homunculus eyes. Not Abby. The childlike face transformed into a menacing goblin as its clay arms morphed into sharp knives, attacking Zane's legs in earnest. After crab walking backwards, Zane kip upped and shifted to the side of the desk to keep it away from him. Keelan brought a ball of explosive earth to his hands, but Zane shouted at him as he dodged the murderous homunculus. Don't kill it, we can question it, said Zane, dancing away from the knives. Are you crazy? asked Keelan. 
That's some horror show business right there. I'm gonna have nightmares for weeks. The homunculus kept coming, but with his imbuement and the desk, it wasn't hard to keep away from its blades. Don't these things have command words? asked Zane, continuing around the desk as if he were playing tag with a toddler. Search the desk while I keep it busy. Standing in the doorway, Keelan shook his head. This is like Chucky or that one movie you made me watch when we were kids, Attack of the Dolls. I hated that movie. That was Nevia. She loves horror movies, said Zane as a knife swished past his calf. But hurry up. Having this thing chase me is giving me the heebie-jeebies. Where am I going to find a command word? asked Keelan, shrugging. I don't know. It's probably like a computer password, and he has it written down on a sticky note in a drawer, said Zane. Fine. Keelan let his spell fade into sparkles of golden phase. He jumped onto the desk, kicking papers everywhere. From his perch, he opened the drawers one by one, until he pulled out a yellow sticky note from the inside of a schedule book. It's got like 30 passwords on here, said Keelan. Try all of them. Keelan started shouting out words, most of them gibberish because he had to add special characters, so meatball ampersand was unlikely to be the command word. But as soon as he said Billy Billy Billy, the homunculus stopped, letting its knives fall by its side, transforming back into lumpy arms. Are you named Billy? asked Keelan. Billy the homunculus nodded his head. Zane examined the homunculus from the other side of the room. Why would anyone own such a thing? It was just sitting in the corner, waiting to creep. Keelan rubbed the back of his neck. It actually makes a lot of sense. People used to think that babies came from a tiny microscopic version of themselves called the homunculus. The smallest eye hall is all about cells and genes and biology. Abby probably made it because of that. Or he's just generally a sick human being. Billy, can you tell us what Abby was working on? asked Zane. The homunculus stared at Zane. Keelan put his hands on his hips and repeated the question, Billy, can you tell us what Abby was working on? Abby was working on magic and life. That's good Billy, said Keelan. But what about it? Abby was working on magic and life. Keelan sighed. Was he making something? Abby was working on magic and life. Damn thing is like a song stuck on repeat, said Keelan. You keep questioning it, I'll search the room. While Keelan asked questions receiving the same answer every time, Zane studied the bookshelves. The titles were mostly like How to Modify Cellular Structure with Arcane Methods and Magical DNA. Do we have it? A couple of the books were written by Abby Scarlin. Zane opened up a hardback to find a picture of Abby. He looked like he was stuck in the 60s with a Grateful Dead tie-dyed t-shirt and a long graying ponytail. The bio talked about how he'd been backpacking through the realms for the last few decades, before returning to the Hundred Halls in 2001. Ask about Billy, suggested Zane. Billy, what about you? Did you help Abby? Billy loves to help Abby. Keelan sighed with relief. What did you help Abby with? Magic and life. Keelan massaged his forehead. Do you help with the magic or life more? They are one and the same, said Billy. As soon as he finished speaking, a chill went through Zane. He met his cousin's gaze. What does that mean, Billy? asked Zane, and then Keelan repeated it when the homunculus didn't answer. Magic is life. Life is magic. Zane looked at the books for inspiration. Did Abby find the DNA markers for magic? After Keelan repeated it, Billy answered, Magic is life. Life is magic. I feel like we're not getting anywhere, said Keelan. We've got to keep trying. It knows something that can help us, said Zane as he searched the desk, looking through the notes for something that might indicate the correct line of questioning. Keelan paced away before coming back. He looked like he was going to say something, but then he threw up his hands and paced back out of the room. Zane dug through the desk looking for interesting writing, but most of it was related to Abby's few students. It seemed like he was running his hall more like a professor with assistants than a teaching establishment. It wasn't like there was a board that controlled the halls. Kids died learning magic all the time, so Zane supposed a hippie mage with a creepy homunculus wasn't so terrible. When Zane found a note referencing a study about how the brain shaped spells, he dug through the rest of the papers looking for the study, but it wasn't there. Then he examined the shelves, which didn't have it either. He did find one section that was missing about five or six books. He explained what he found to Keelan, 
who after a moment of thought snapped his fingers and asked, Billy, does Abby know how to mess with how we make magic? Is that what life is magic, and magic is life is all about? Yes. Was Abby successful? asked Keelan. Yes. Zane looked to his cousin. Is it just me, or is everything in this place new? Like it was purchased in the last year. Keelan nodded. Making a homunculus is really expensive. This guy doesn't seem like the type to have been concerned about money, said Zane. Which means he had a benefactor. What if that person asked him to figure this out? And then killed him to hide their tracks, asked Keelan. Seems rather expensive and complicated, said Zane. Ask Billy what Abby was making. When Keelan did, the response chilled Zane. A solution. A solution to what? asked Keelan. Magic is life. Life is magic. I don't like the sound of that, said Zane. Neither do I. We should take all of this back to Priyanka, said Zane. Maybe she can figure out who's paying him. That might be who hired the gherkin, though that still doesn't make sense to me. Me neither, but it's a start, said Keelan. Should we take everything? Nah, let's leave it here, but take pictures. I think these books are all stuff you can find on the internet, said Zane. What about Billy? asked Keelan. We leave him. Priyanka will probably want to come back and question him, but I don't want to bring that creepy thing back to the honeycomb. Keelan nodded, and they started documenting the contents of the room with their phones. Zane was working on the desk while Keelan had the shelves. Halfway through, Keelan made a soft exclamation. What? asked Zane. Find something else. Yeah, said Keelan, but not about Abby or Billy. When he saw what his cousin was looking at on the top shelf, Zane's stomach sunk into his knees. He hadn't recognized it when he was looking through the books, but Keelan had right away. Is that? Keelan nodded, his lips squeezed flat. A National Arcane Scholarship Award. Yeah, the same one. It looked like a glass fireball, with the details of the award etched on the front in gold filigree. It would glow faintly if the command word was spoken. They both recognized the award because Jesse had won one when he was in high school. The test was given to seniors across the nation. Had Jesse been born in any other place, he would have gone on to the halls with a full scholarship, probably in Arcanium or Coterie of Majors. Let's get the hell out of here, said Keelan as his jaw pulsed with anger. They weren't finished cataloging everything, but Zane nodded. If Priyanka wanted more information, she could return to the hall. Nothing had happened here for six months, so it was unlikely that it would in the next week. But the award had dredged up old memories. Memories Zane had forgotten, but clearly Keelan hadn't. Before they left, he caught his cousin looking at the award. Keelan's lips were condensed to a point, his face snarled with a mixture of grief and rage. No matter how many years had passed, it seemed like the past was right there with them. Zane hoped Keelan could someday learn to forgive his father, or he was destined to be consumed by regret. Chapter 18 Varna, October 2006 For some people high school was their best days. When Friday came and Madison Elementary School let them out, Zane, his younger sister Nevia, and his cousin Keelan shot out of its doors like bees after an intruder. The Castlewood trailer park was a mile from the school, less if they went through the woods on the north side, using the culvert to bypass an old chain-link fence with a barbed wire top that was long forgotten from before the trailer park went in. When they reached the culvert, they stopped at the top of the concrete embankment. It had been raining all morning, and the water was up to the sides, leaving a narrow path beneath the barbed wire fence. Should we go around the long way? asked Zane, catching the look of distrust from Keelan at the swift water. Nevia whacked Zane with her backpack. No way. It'll take another 20 minutes to go around, and Mom said I could watch Alien again if I got my chores done. You're going to wear that disc out, said Zane. Keelan was staring into the water, his forehead hunched. I'm not afraid. Nevia shrugged and went first, scooting down the steep embankment, blowing a fat gum bubble and letting it pop against her face before sucking it into her mouth. Her normally wild hair had been tamed into cornrows, which made ducking under the bottom of the chain-link fence easier. Zane let Keelan go next, readying himself to grab his cousin should he slip. After the incident at the dam with Nevia, he was skittish around water. When they reached the fence, Keelan paused. What's wrong? asked Zane. Nothing really. We're taller than your sister. Harder to duck is all, said Keelan. 
but Zane knew different. They used to go swimming in the pond behind Doc's junkyard, but since the dam, Keelan always made an excuse why he couldn't go. Yeah, said Zane. Looks tricky, especially with that backpack full of books. Why don't you hold my hand while you scoot through? They grabbed hands holding tight. Keelan's was wet with sweat, even though it was a cool day. Together, they maneuvered through the gap. Nevia was waiting at the top of the culvert. Finally. So slow you two are. I'll race you back to the stack. Nah, said Keelan. I don't want to haul this stupid backpack everywhere. I'm going back home, goof off there, play some handheld football. I'll stay with Keelan. Tell mom and dad, said Zane. Nevia stuck her tongue out, before taking off on the path that led along the culvert. Zane knew the real reason Keelan didn't want to go to the stack. Getting across the culvert required walking over a big pipe that was run by some gas company. It wasn't hard, as a smaller pipe provided a handrail, but it would mean crossing the water again. They raced back to Castlewood, dodging around the trailers. The place was empty as they were the first kids to make it back, and the high school hadn't let out yet. Ms. Gardenia waved a lit cigarette at them as they raced past. By the time they hit the trailer, they were jostling each other. No one was home, so they went straight to Keelan's room, which was only slightly larger than the bed. Keelan kicked the pile of clothes off the side and rescued the handheld football game from his pillow. When the game booted up, it made little beeps like a bugle charge. Why do you like that game? asked Zane. It's like from 1910 or something. Keelan stayed enraptured by the device as it beeped. He made a one-shoulder shrug. Mom found it at a garage sale for a dime. It's not like we can afford a real game system. Zane pushed his cousin's foot. Let's go outside. Throw the football or baseball or rocks into the water at the culvert. You don't like hanging in the trailer, said Keelan with a cutting glance. It's stuffy, said Zane. A wild look appeared in Keelan's eyes. You want stuffy? I'll give you stuffy. I'll stuff your face into my dirty laundry. Laughing, he leapt at him like a playful cougar. Though he was a year younger, he was as strong, making them equal as they wrestled. Zane briefly had Keelan in a headlock before he kicked out and tackled Zane off the bed and into the living room. With the air knocked out of Zane, Keelan climbed off. You okay? Zane coughed a few times and took a deep breath before leaping at his cousin, who fled into the back of the trailer where his parents slept. He leapt on the bed, held his arms out in a wrestling stance and said, I'm king of the bed. You can't knock me off. Zane swiped his feet on the Berber carpet like a bull getting ready to charge. Incoming! He took two strides and threw himself at Keelan like a battering ram. His shoulder caught his cousin right in the stomach, driving him backwards to slam into the headboard while he was still laughing. Two things happened in this moment. The first was that a car door slammed shut. The second was the Glass National Arcane Scholarship Award that Uncle Jesse kept on the shelf above his bed, rolled off. Both Zane and his cousin reached out to catch the Glass Award, but they were tangled together and couldn't reach it in time. It fell, catching the corner of the nightstand, shattering into shards. From outside the trailer came what the hell? Both boys were up and off the bed before Uncle Jesse came into the trailer. His eyes shot to the back of his room, to the empty spot on the shelf where the award used to be. Keelan had shrunk to half his size. He squeaked out, I'm sorry. We was just playing. In a low menacing tone, Uncle Jesse pointed his finger at Zane. Get. Out. Zane started to move towards the door, until he saw his cousin's face. His chest threatened to cave in from concern. No, said Zane, his voice quivering and his hands shaking. Uncle Jesse grabbed Zane by the back of the neck, digging his fingers in until he was crying out from pain. Zane was shoved out the door despite his attempts to hold on to the frame, landing unceremoniously on the gravel. The door shut and locked. Zane threw himself at it but there was nothing he could do. Through the door, he heard Uncle Jesse's muffled voice. You wanna screw with stuff that ain't yours? I'll show you what that earns you. To Zane's confusion, he heard the water turned on in the sink. His concern turned to agony when a breath later, Keelan screamed. Then the scream turned into a gargle. And though Zane had watched his sister's horror movies, usually between his hands over his face, he knew the screams they made weren't real. Keelan's screams were real, and struck Zane like a blow to the chest until he was kneeling at the door begging his uncle to stop. By this time the other kids from the elementary school were arriving home, but they heard what was happening, 
because nothing in a trailer park was private and found reasons to disappear. Zane pounded on the door until his knuckles were bloody. Then he realized what had been going on inside had stopped and only quiet sobbing remained. Zane collapsed in front of the door, burying his face in his hands. After a while, Uncle Jesse appeared in the open door. He smelled like whiskey. His eyes were puffy and red. Go home, Zane, said Uncle Jesse, throwing his backpack onto gravel. Zane looked up into his uncle's eyes. He expected him to tell him not to say anything to his parents, but there was a measure of self-loathing in his gaze, as if he expected that's what Zane would do. He gathered his backpack and was going to skulk away, but rage formed in his chest. He turned around before his uncle could retreat into the trailer. You're an asshole. Uncle Jesse stared back blankly. I know. It was just an award. A stupid glass award. His uncle could no longer meet his gaze, and he looked into the distance. His mouth squeezed shut, danced as if words wrestled within, but he stayed, as if he knew he deserved this rebuke. It's not Keelan's fault you gave up, said Zane as his hands clenched and unclenched by his sides. You could do something, even now. It's never too late. Uncle Jesse looked back at Zane. He blinked a few times, almost waking up. He wiped his grease-stained hands on his face as if he expected tears, then looked at his fingers with surprise that there were none. There was a brief moment when Zane thought his uncle might speak, but no words came, and he slipped back inside, the door closing on the trailer as silent as a tomb. Zane stared at the door until he realized it would be night soon, and he didn't want to cross the pipe over the culvert in the dark. He collected his backpack, slung it over his shoulder, and trudged out of the trailer park. Maybe he would watch movies with his sister. They didn't seem as scary as they did a few hours ago. Chapter 19 Second Ward, March 2015 Narrowing the Search Zane and his cousin stood in a large room, with a massive stone table in the middle. Windows on the north side revealed the spire, reflecting the sunny day, while the south side was filled with blank monitors. Instructor Pennywhistle had brought them to the room an hour ago without explaining why, and then disappeared to another part of the complex. Zane and his cousin had been quietly chatting, wondering about the reason for the secrecy, when Instructor Allgood burst through the door in his duster with his claw-headed staff in hand. Aren't you two like a couple of whores in church, he said, marching up to them with a grunt. Everyone slept with you but no one wants to admit they know you. Zane shared a glance with Keelan, wondering where this was going, and if they'd gotten in trouble again. He opened his mouth to ask a question, when Instructor Allgood's gruff exterior broke with a smile, and he burst into laughter, a deep baritone that echoed in the window-filled room. So we're not in trouble, asked Zane. Instructor Allgood grabbed Zane by the shoulder, shaking him. Hell no. I think you've done this hall proud. And while I had my doubts about you at times last year, you proved me wrong with that sex toy thing. Ever since then Priyanka has been calling me Captain Dildo. He broke out into another round of hearty laughter, which made Zane a little uneasy after spending his first year with him, but when the instructor didn't relent, Zane joined in cautiously. I thought you were mad at me after that, said Zane. Instructor Allgood leaned his staff against the window, grabbed one of the leather seats, plopped into it, and set his scuffed black boots on the stone table. I was mad. Real mad. A few decades ago, I might have put a fist through your neck, but I've mellowed some. Not a lot, but some. He paused, tapping on the table. Can I give you both some advice? Advice that I'm sure you're going to ignore, due to the false invulnerability of youth. But I'd like to impart it just the same. Enraptured by his unexpected candor, they both nodded. Zane felt like he was witnessing a rare event, like a triple supernova, or a unicorn doing Zumba. You're both damn impressive. After you took down the goon, I re-evaluated the year, found that I hadn't properly understood what you were doing, he said, clearly indicating Zane. I worried that you'd gotten lucky, but you've done more of the same, maybe better, in your second year. These are the kinds of things that impress Priyanka, and earn consideration for more important responsibilities. He chewed on his words for a moment, as if he were deciding how best to say them. But it occurred to me, there might be another explanation of what you're doing. I am well aware of what happens in Varna. I've been picking up aspirants from your town for decades. Sometimes the students that come with me to the halls have one desire, to burn themselves out in a blaze of glory, so they never have to return to the ladies' embrace. 
I want to know, and I want to know it straight. Is that what you're after? Zane shook his head right away while catching a slight delay from Keelan. No. No way. I came to the halls to learn and to use these skills in the best way possible, said Zane. Keelan nodded along but offered no verbal response. Good, said Instructor Allgood. I like you both. I want to see you succeed. I just wanted to make sure that it wasn't going to be a fool's errand. Other instructors filtered in through the door. Don't let me down, said Allgood with a wink. Instructor Pennywhistle walked past Allgood, patting him on the head. Don't tell me that he's trying to schmooze you with his soft side. Don't believe him. He's bone and gristle all the way down. And your candy and martinis, said Allgood with a snort of laughter. Instructor Pennywhistle gave them a salacious wink. Enjoy his good mood while it lasts. It's like an eclipse, it doesn't happen very often, nor for long. When Pennywhistle moved to sit down, Allgood stuck his tongue out behind her back, flipping her off for good measure. I can see the reflection in the window, Karen, she said drolly. As intended, he replied, chuckling. The other instructors took seats around the table, motioning for Zane and Keelan to take a place. The only other one that Zane recognized, Maggie O'Keefe, the Scottish instructor for the upper classes, sat next to Zane and gave him a welcoming pat on the arm. She smelled like spent explosives and gasoline. Zane didn't recognize the three other instructors at the table, but he didn't have time to study them as the patron entered the room. He resisted the urge to stand, but he must have moved slightly because Priyanka's eyes sparkled with mirth in his direction. Thank you for joining me on such short notice. Instructor Zhang was not able to extract himself from his current duties, and Noyede of course preferred to stay in the grotto, but I will relay our discussion to her later, said Priyanka. She paused as if she were waiting for a response, but when none came, she continued. The other instructors, while attentive, seemed highly relaxed. Zane couldn't decide if that was their natural state or cockiness. I'm afraid there's no good way to say this, but I have extremely bad news. Thanks to these enterprising young men, we now know what the gherkin and whoever is behind him is after. A wellspring of pride bubbled up in his chest. Keelan sat up straighter as well. Priyanka made an arcane gesture in the air, and the monitors on the wall came to life, showing various handwritten and typed notes zoomed close enough to read the text easily. Zane recognized some of them because he and Keelan had taken them from the smallest eye. These are the documents from patron Abby Scarlan. His was the last hall created after Invictus' death. Before the attack from the Gherkin, I'd honestly never heard of him, said Priyanka, drawing nods of agreement from the others. There seemed to be a general sense that this was strange. It appears that Scarlan's research had to do with the biological nature of our access to magic. I can't say that I understand his reasoning, the science is far beyond me, but it appears he figured out how it is accomplished. The earlier interest turned to rigid attention, and chairs shifted forward. Instructor Allgood's boots hit the floor with a resounding thud. The implications of the research reverberated through Zane's mind. He could imagine how such knowledge could be very dangerous. Yes, you all understand. What can be understood can be manipulated or destroyed. Which leads me to the second set of documents recovered. Thank you, Marilyn. I appreciate that you were able to get over your friend's death to acquire these. Instructor Pennywhistle still didn't look like she'd gotten over it, but she gave a respectful nod, keeping her ruby red lips tight. Dr. Abelock was doing some cutting edge work with viruses. A little too cutting edge, I'm afraid. These documents, including some samples, were taken from his lab after his death. The samples are of a magically modified virus that can be designed to enter particular parts of the brain. Wait, said Zane, and all eyes turned to him. He'd forgotten he was surrounded by his instructors. He cleared his throat and continued. Why take his head if everything was on the notes? Keelan chimed in with his own question. And how did you get those documents? The corner of Priyanka's lips curled with a secret smile. The other instructors nodded with thought. The documents were copies that he had in a safe. As for the heads I thought the same thing, said Priyanka but it's possible there are aspects of his research that weren't contained in the documents. The gherkin can preserve a head and all the knowledge within it for later retrieval. The beheadings may have been for insurance. Instructor Allgood slammed his fist on the table, his earlier jolly mood lost beneath a mask of righteousness. 
This smells like weak old fish. I see what you're suggesting, but there ain't no way that someone can just mash these two things together and make something dangerous. Science like magic doesn't work like that. There are rules, he said. Unless dear Karen the same person funded both studies, said instructor Pennywhistle. Is that true, asked Allgood. Priyanka nodded. The details that we have are damning to say the least. It appears this has been planned for quite some time. I wish I could tell you not to be worried, but they're well funded and patient. How dangerous is this virus? asked Zane. Priyanka squeezed her lips tight. It could end magic as we know it in the human race. A few expletives from the instructors followed. Zane found his heartbeat soaring as if he were perched on a tower in the sky. A general sense of disbelief permeated the room. If the virus does what we think it does, it would attack the part of the brain that allows certain humans to utilize magic. This means we have to stop whoever is making this. Destroy it before it can get out. The Hundred Halls has been in danger many times before, but never by a threat that could attack it at the very root of its existence. Mentioning the halls reminded Zane how important the university was to the functioning of the world. Few wars were fought anymore because of the devastating effects of magical warfare and because the network of alumni kept the balance of power out of individual countries' hands. Not only would the loss of magic be devastating to the individuals, but it would upset the structure of the world's governments. Not to mention the other realms near this one that would certainly invade if they knew the halls were no longer. I hope for Merlin's sake you're about to tell us who's behind it, said Allgood grimly. I wish, said Priyanka heavily. I truly wish. There has to be something more in Scarlan's documents. Maybe something the lads didn't get, asked Instructor O'Keefe in her thick Scottish accent. Unfortunately, that hall was burnt down to the timbers two days ago. The same with Dr. Abelic's apartment. They said it was a gas leak, said Priyanka. Allgood pounded the table again. How'd they know to cover their tracks? It's like they're ready to launch whatever plan they've got cooked up. Tally, said Zane a little too loud. The girl from Metallum Nocturne. She was working on a universal filter. Something that would work on a virus, I imagine. Working on is one thing, finishing is another. If it's only a student, then maybe we have time, said Allgood. Zane put his hand to his mouth in horror. She may have figured it out, and I might have supplied the answer. That's why Oculus saw me at the fish market. Not to stop her from being beheaded, but to give her the idea that would help her complete it. It's all my fault. If it is, then it's mine, said Priyanka. But in reality, it's neither. Prophecies and forecasts are malleable. There's no point in fighting them because they could just as likely turn up false. At least she's alive, said Zane. I should let the team know so they can keep an eye out. As soon as he saw Priyanka's face, he knew the answer. She was found beheaded and mutilated this morning, at a location away from the hall. She seemed to be watching for his reaction, so he kept a stoic expression, even though his face was numb. The memory of her kiss was like a brand on his lips. He could almost taste the strawberries. Keelan knew the truth of his feelings for Tally, even though he hadn't explicitly expressed them, and gave him a sympathetic nod. The room sunk into quiet reflection. The potential existence of a deadly virus, one that might possibly interfere with their use of magic, kept everyone busy thinking about the apocalyptic repercussions. We need to know who has those virus samples, said Instructor Pennywhistle. If we knew that, Marilyn, we wouldn't all be sitting here now, would we? asked Instructor O'Keefe. Pennywhistle's forehead wrinkled with displeasure, but she didn't rise to O'Keefe's bait. Zane wondered what sort of history they had, but clearly it didn't bother Priyanka, because she was staring at the documents on the screen. The centrifuge, said Keelan suddenly, drawing everyone's gaze. Go on, explain, said Priyanka. Keelan rubbed his hands on the table, a sure sign his mind was whirling with thoughts. Abby Scarlin had new lab equipment, lots of it. But he didn't look like the kind of guy that had money. Maybe there's a trail leading to whoever hired him. It's a good idea, Keelan, but I already checked that. There were no large purchases in his bank records which means he was probably given cash, said Priyanka. Right as the thought appeared in Zane's head, he saw Keelan's eyes light up. He let his cousin speak so they would know how smart he was. Billy had to cost a lot of money, said Keelan, 
Then realizing that the instructors couldn't follow him, he added, Billy was Scarlin's homunculus. They're way more expensive than a piece of lab equipment, more than you can purchase with just cash. If there were no large purchases on his bank account, then it must have originated with whoever hired him. There's only one place to get a homunculus in Invictus, and Maggie knows the maker, said Priyanka. Instructor O'Keefe was already standing, wearing a sly grin. I'm already on it. I'll have an answer within the hour. While they were waiting, Zane used the bathroom. Keelan joined him as he was washing his hands. Sorry about Tally, said Keelan. I barely knew her and I was watching the hall, not her, said Zane. I know you, Cos. Even if you didn't like her, it still sucks knowing someone you were just hanging out with died. I feel like we did her wrong by not protecting her. Me too, said Zane. Further conversation was cut short when Instructor O'Keefe's thick brogue cut through the bathroom door. They followed her into the room. She chanted for a few seconds with her hand on the table, and suddenly a vision of the city appeared on it like a miniature holodeck. That's the eighth ward, said Instructor Allgood, rising to his feet. Enchanted Thread's garment factory to be exact, said O'Keefe. They make fancy spelled knickers. Priyanka held a private smile. We're leaving in five minutes. Ready yourselves as you can. The other instructors filed out past Priyanka. When it was just the three of them, Zane asked, Are we coming too? We wouldn't be here if it weren't for you too, she said with a wink. After she was gone, Keelan gave him a big grin. This is everything I hoped the Academy would be. He paused. Minus the magic eating virus, of course. Of course, said Zane, feeling like he'd just jumped out of a plane with a parachute that might not open. If we're gonna die, at least we'll go down fighting. Chapter 20 8th Ward, March 2015. Even magic can't stop everything. The nine of them fanned out on the street. They'd reached the 8th Ward through a portal in the back of a coin-operated laundromat. A little old lady smoking on a bench inside the store, even though there were multiple signs that read no smoking, barely gave them a second glance as they marched out from the supply closet. Trailing behind the instructors, Zane felt like a superhero. The Enchanted Threads garment factory was two blocks from their location. The instructors seemed to know what they were doing, leaving Zane feeling like the little brother their parents made bring along. Keelan raised an eyebrow, but otherwise looked like he was trying to hold back a grin. It was strange to feel excited, terrified, and completely out of his element at the same time. Zane took a couple of deep breaths to calm himself. Instructor O'Keefe threw a handful of metal rings into the air. They fell briefly, before flattening out into a hover about three feet above her head. She whispered softly for a few seconds before the sharp scent of phase filled Zane's nose, then the rings shot out like UFOs, zinging through the air and quickly disappearing from view. I'll head up Alanon Street, said O'Keefe, circle around the back. Try not to destroy any buildings, said Priyanka. Sorry, I couldn't hear ya, lass, said O'Keefe as she jogged away. Priyanka looked to Instructor Allgood, who only said, Eye in the sky. She nodded, and he strode across the street, took a giant leap onto the wizard burger, and then continued on to the higher buildings until they could no longer see him. Instructor Pennywhistle had a tube of clear liquid that she placed into a spray nozzle that she'd pulled from her coat. No one will remember a thing, she said with a wink, before heading towards the wizard burger. What do you want us to do? asked Keelan. Priyanka considered them for a moment. Move up the street but no closer than two blocks. You don't know what kind of magics we're using, nor do you have the defenses for them. And if the gherkin is here, he'd cut through you like tissue paper. She paused. Do you still have those tracking discs? They both nodded. Use them if you see anyone suspicious, said Priyanka. She took a couple of steps down the street, ignoring the delivery truck speeding right past her, and cracked her neck to one side. Two knives appeared in her fists as if they were spring-loaded, and she sped forward, blurring past the delivery truck as if it was standing still. Did you see that? said Keelan, shaking his head. Either she's got better imbuements than us, or she's crazy loaded with Faze, said Zane. Either way, I'd never want to mess with her. Do you think they'll find anyone inside? asked Keelan. Doubtful, said Zane. Why set up shop in the middle of the city, right in Priyanka's territory? It's the perfect location if you want to spread the virus, said Keelan. Zane didn't respond because he knew his cousin was right. 
If the virus was spread here, the whole world would have it in a week. If there was a capital of the world, it was the city of Invictus. Spread out, use your senses, said Zane. Keelan took up position on one side of the street, while Zane took the other. He knew it was unlikely that anyone would get past the instructors and Priyanka, but he didn't want to let them down either. Amping his senses hammered him with sensory details. A dumpster full of trash in the alleyway assaulted his nose until he dampened it. It seemed like every third car was using their horn, which made picking out the important sounds using his hearing difficult. He wished it was a less busy section of town, not only for the sensory reasons, but to keep any bystanders from getting hurt if things went sideways. Keelan headed up the cross street, while Zane stayed in place, using his senses like a satellite dish. He was scanning front to back, not finding anything interesting, when he caught a hint of vibration beneath his feet. At first he thought it was the nearby train station or a distant jackhammer, but the vibration had a central point and was moving in a direct line. Zane quickly focused underground and caught the sound of heavy boots splashing, along with a faint vibration suggesting someone was running through the sewers. He followed the noise which was headed away from the garment factory and wished he had a moment to get Keelan's attention, but he didn't want to lose the trail. The sound of boots went south, and Zane followed, dodging around other pedestrians on the sidewalk. He nearly knocked over a lady jogger when he crossed the street, then froze when a car screeched to a stop two inches from his knees. The driver leaned into his horn, forcing Zane's hands around his ears in agony, until he could dial back the phase and get out of the street. The driver flipped him off as he sped away. When Zane focused his hearing again, he couldn't find the sound of the boots. He ran up the street scanning but nothing. When he realized he was two blocks from the blue line, Zane sprinted towards it, thinking whoever was fleeing the factory might use it to get away. He almost tripped over his own feet to stop when he saw the gherkin step out of the Merlin's creamery three doors up. The tattoos on his slate gray skin rippled like waves. He carried a massive broadsword on his back and a tray of six glass and stainless steel cylinders suspended on a hook in his left hand. Screams erupted as everyone nearby scattered except for one teenager with big red headphones on and his face in his smartphone. The kid nearly ran into the gherkin, and when he looked up, he fell over himself, scrambling out of the way. The gherkin looked right at Zane, and his knees turned to water. But then he remembered that the otherworldly assassin had killed Tally, and that fear was replaced with a white rage. He screamed before sending two force bolts at the gherkin's head. You killed Tally? The seven-foot-tall assassin ducked beneath the bolts, sliding his broadsword from his back in one smooth motion. Far up the street, he heard Keelan shouting, but Zane wasn't about to back down, not when he had a chance to slow him until the instructors arrived. The gherkin blocked his next two bolts with his sword, absorbing the magic as simply as if it were drops of rain. When the tip of the sword pointed at Zane's chest, a blast of sonic energy knocked him into a trash can, spinning it into the street. With the air knocked out of him, Zane floundered on the ground trying to find his feet, but he couldn't even get his hands to work enough to push onto his knees. The blast had knocked the sense out of him, probably worse than it normally would have, because he had his imbuement on. As the gherkin approached with his sword, Zane was painfully aware that no one was close enough to save him. Keelan was the closest, and he would do no better than Zane did. As the seven-foot assassin raised his broadsword, Zane made a silent prayer that his actions might lead to the virus being stopped. The blade rose high, reflecting the sunlight. The gherkin paused, his dead eyes looking right through Zane. He flinched when he thought the blade was descending, but the gherkin had slipped the broadsword into its sheath on his back. The assassin fled the other way. Though part of Zane realized he had been granted a miraculous reprieve, the other part still understood what danger the gherkin presented. Zane made it to his knees and fired another force bolt at the back of the gherkin's legs, hoping to trip him up, but the assassin veered into an alleyway at the same time, throwing his aim off. He hit the edge of the tray instead. Glass shattered at the impact, leaving a fine mist in the air as three of the virus cylinders exploded. The wind was headed south, right at him, and Zane felt the droplets of water on his face. He turned to yell at Keelan to tell him to stop, but it was too late. His cousin came up beside him, out of breath. The mist continued into the crowd of gawkers on the other side of the street, leaving no doubt that the virus had been released. Keelan's eyes were wide as he stared at the broken shards of three cylinders on the sidewalk. 
Zane's force bolt had snapped the wiry frame holding them, sending the three containers to shatter against the concrete. When he saw Priyanka and the other instructors sprinting towards him, he shouted at them to stop. But it was too late, as they were headed right into the wind getting a face full of the virus. Where's the gherkin? asked Priyanka when she came up. It doesn't matter, said Zane, crestfallen. She followed his gaze towards the shattered glass. Is that? Half of it, said Zane, shaking his head. I'm sorry. I tried to stop him but my shot went wide. He expected anger from her, but she only nodded. The virus is loose, she said absently. He clawed at the back of his neck, frustration filling him like a balloon until he was ready to explode. His shot had gone wide. If he just aimed better, or not gotten involved at all, then he wouldn't have put the whole world at risk. Strangely, it didn't bother him as much that the virus was coursing through his veins, a virus that would silence his magic forever. What worried him most was how it would change the world and end any chance he had to stop the lady forever. Chapter 21 Second Ward, April 2015 Some people have eyes in the back of their head. The city of sorcery had lost its luster, like a jewel dropped in cigarette tar. Zane was wandering down Orpheum Avenue with his cousin, trying his best to enjoy the spectacular illusions doing battle overhead, but he couldn't help but feel like it was all about to come crumbling down upon his head, because it was. A lifelike Chinese dragon swooped down, breathing butterflies at a group of squealing kids right across the street. Their laughter was empty and hollow to Zane, like the painted backdrop of a school play. What do you think will happen once everyone realizes it's all over? asked Keelan, craning his neck at the illusionary butterflies rising from the street like a million tiny balloons. It can't be over, said Zane, thinking about how something could be so beautiful yet not exist at all. There's got to be a way to stop it. Priyanka will figure something out. What's to figure out? We're infected with a magic killing virus, said Keelan. We still have time, said Zane, wanting to believe it. He wasn't sure if he was being hopelessly optimistic or delusional, but he couldn't let himself think that they were out of options. I ran into instructor Penny Whistle on the way out, said Keelan. She didn't look the same. Like when you see a celebrity in real life, when they're not all dolled up and wearing makeup. I didn't feel compelled to like her either. They strolled in silence. It was strange to be walking around in a place so filled with smiling faces and happiness. It was like holding a funeral in Disneyland. Keelan slowed to a stop and pulled his smartphone out. He paled a little. It's a message from Instructor O'Keefe about the blood work. What's it say? asked Zane. Keelan scrolled through the email. When he finished, he looked a little perplexed. We're not carriers. I didn't understand everything, but she said it was something about the lady's poison that protected us, said Keelan. Zane rubbed the back of his neck. Great balls of fire. I don't know if I should feel happy or sad. Why would you feel sad? Think about it, said Zane. If only the people in Varna can use magic, think how powerful the lady will become. Oh, said Keelan softly. Though it won't be everyone. O'Keefe mentioned that the virus doesn't affect everyone the same. Even if it were only 50% of the population, it's going to cause a global panic, upsetting the balance of power. This is going to be a disaster, said Zane. Maybe they can figure out a counter to it. Surely there has to be a way to use magic to combat it, suggested Keelan. If there is, then Priyanka's probably going to try it. Or maybe the other patrons will know what to do, said Zane. While they were talking, the illusionary dragon battles continued overhead. But when two dragons flew at each other, the glittering silver one blinked out for a few seconds, as if the illusion had been interrupted. As the crowd groaned with disappointment, Zane shared a look with his cousin. They both knew exactly what it meant. The entertainment district prided itself on ceaseless wonders to draw in the crowds. An interruption was unforgivable, which meant the virus was loose amongst the greater population of mages. How much longer until everyone knows, asked Zane with a sinking feeling in his gut. When Keelan grabbed his arm roughly, he thought his cousin might be experiencing the effects of the virus, but found he was staring across the street. It's him, whispered Keelan. Who, asked Zane, scanning. The Animalian. When Zane didn't follow, Keelan added, Alex Malice. He'd only seen Alex's picture from the internet, 
and the back covers of his books. In those pictures he had black hair with a streak of grey, not from age but the kind that came from a bottle or enchantment. He had the smug, arrogant, tight-lipped smile of a professor who liked to bludgeon his students with his erudite knowledge. But what Zane hadn't realised was how tall Alex was, until he saw him towering over the others on the sidewalk. He's the one that sent the stingtails after us, said Keelan. Yeah, that must have been him standing by those bums that night, said Zane. What do you think he's doing, asked Keelan. Maybe he's here for a show. Zane paused. We should talk to him. We can find out more about why he had the spider ecology book, and if he knew your dad. Keelan turned on him. We trashed his apartment. He tried to kill us with some Brazilian flying scorpion things. Are you crazy? Probably, said Zane. But with everything that's happened in the last two weeks, I'm kinder over giving a crap. Let's go talk to him. Keelan rolled his eyes. It's hard to argue with the logic of illogic. Let's go see if we can get ourselves killed before the world turns to hell. That's the spirit, said Zane. There was more to it than carelessness. If the poison preserved them from the virus effects, and the lady stood to gain from its spread, stopping her became of paramount importance. He had to know if there was a way, and if Uncle Jesse had figured it out. They followed Alex from a distance, weaving through the crowds while using their senses to keep watch. When Alex suddenly turned into an open-air square with hundreds of booths called the Goblin Market, Zane motioned for Keelan to split away so they could both keep tabs separately. The market was a place for kids and adults to buy enchanted knickknacks like exploding whistles and fart shorts. Booths were a mixture of wooden stalls, colourful tarps hung over metal scaffolding, and crowded blankets on the concrete. Most of the crap didn't work as well as the sellers advertised, but the kids didn't care because they were purchasing items of magic. The place was packed, forcing Zane to wedge his way through to keep up with Alex, who seemed to glide through the crowd without being slowed down. Zane had to hop over a vendor with a blanket full of magic rings to get past a particularly resistant knot of teenage girls. When Alex glanced back looking directly at Zane, he knew he'd been spotted, but not how. There was no way that he could have known that he was following, because their encounter had been purely by chance. Assuming that Alex had some enchantment running that had alerted him, Zane left all pretense of stealth and rushed through the crowd. Before, he'd been able to maneuver around people, but now it seemed like everyone stepped into his path at the last moment. Alex fled further ahead, moving easily and quickly. He was about to leave the back of the goblin market, so Zane jumped up and grabbed an overhead scaffolding, pulling himself up and running along the thin beam while market goers gasped. Zane reached the street a few moments after Alex but couldn't locate him. We just want to talk, shouted Zane through cupped hands. Keelan came up from behind. That was like moving through a maze. We should head to his apartment. We know he has to go back there, said Zane. Before Keelan could answer, his pocket buzzed. Yes, we'll come straight back, he said into the phone after listening. Priyanka. He nodded. I hope she has a plan. The whole world does, said Keelan. What about Alex? We'll track him down later, he said, and having a premonition about why Priyanka might need them back so suddenly, added, if there is a later. Chapter 22. Second Ward, April 2015. Drastic measures. When Zane and Keelan entered the conference room in the high-rise, they were surprised to find the rest of their team standing at the windows. They in return looked confused about why they were there. After a round of hugs, Skylar asked, what's going on? Instructor Penny Whistle brought us here, and she doesn't look the same. Does this have to do with why half our classes have been cancelled this last week? Zane felt a little bad about what he was about to say since Priyanka had given them explicit instructions not to tell his team about the virus until she had more information, but he assumed that their presence meant it was time. I've got good news and bad news. The good news is there won't be any more beheadings. The bad is that it's because they got what they wanted, a virus that stops someone from being able to use magic, said Zane. Miedo, said Portia. We have to stop that virus. It's too late, said Zane. The virus is out. Are we infected? asked Vin. Yes, said Priyanka as she entered the room. She wore black jeans and a black t-shirt. Her hair was pulled back into a ponytail. I'm sorry to tell you like this but we don't have a lot of time, and I need your help. Our magic is going to leave us, 
asked Skylar, clearly trying to process the horrible news. Not everyone, said Zane, trying to console her. It doesn't affect everyone. Priyanka had taken a data chip and pressed it into a hidden compartment on the stone table. She paused after Zane spoke, her lips squeezing together. The virus is spreading unevenly, but those newest to magic are most vulnerable. Almost anyone under the age of 50 will not have their magic when the virus has finished its work. Beyond that, the percentages will drop. To his teammates' credit, they did not cry out or break down. Portia stepped to the table and said, tell us what you need us to do. Priyanka acknowledged their professionalism with a nod as she made arcane gestures. A cityscape appeared on the table, resulting in noises of surprise from them. Zane recognized it right away as Deathbird. There is a place that keeps dangerous magical things within a fortress. There is one such item that can stop the virus and reverse its effects. It is called the Word of Annihilation. Its origins are unknown, but its effects are well understood. Once there were three of these devices. The other two were used to devastating effects. Which is why the last one is being kept in the Bastille, which is the most secure facility in the realms. We're going to do a heist, asked Vin breathlessly. Please tell me this is a heist. Priyanka looked taken aback by his enthusiastic outburst. He has a thing for heist movies, said Skylar. Please don't encourage him. I have this mascot costume. He didn't get a chance to finish his sentence, as Portia clamped a hand over his mouth. The expression on Priyanka's face suggested she might think they weren't taking this seriously. Zane was about to interject when their patron burst out laughing. This result trumped Vin's outburst, leaving them all bewildered. Thank you, Vin. This is why I still run the academy, despite what a marvelous pain in the ass you students are. If you get to my fossilized age, you'll find you're carrying a mountain of baggage with you. Like an old ship dragging tons of barnacles and rust with them. So it's good to have some of that crap knocked off my hull. She sighed heavily. So yes, this is a heist. Vin broke from Portia's grip and made a whoop of joy. The previous dreary mood had been dispelled, and Priyanka continued her explanation, this time with an eagerness that made Zane wish he'd known her when she was younger. As I said before, the Bastille of Deathbird is the most secure facility in the realms, controlled by the Black Council, a group of retired assassins and thieves who know best how to protect such arcane objects like the Word of Annihilation. Priyanka looked Zane straight in the eyes. The task I have for your team is to get my team into the Bastille. Wait, we're not going in, asked Vin, his shoulders slumping slightly. Priyanka reached up to put her hand on his shoulder. My dear Vin, let me say that in this case that is a blessing. If we are caught while breaking into the Bastille, a likely event given its protections, and if we are taken alive, we will be put inside a sphere of eternal pain from which there is no escape. Given the impact of the virus, can't we just ask them for this word? asked Skylar. They wouldn't care, said Priyanka bleakly. The whole purpose of Deathbird is that it's a place to retire from the trials and tribulations of life. They have in a sense given up. The only thing they care about is if someone violates the pact or threatens their comfortable existence. Zane detected scorn in her description of them, as if she were discussing a parasite or infection. While he thought well of his patron, that insight suggested to him that she had complex motives about how she operated her life and the academy. What do we need to do? asked Keelan. Priyanka pointed to the lifelike map of the city that spread across the stone table, indicating a mansion on a hill not far from the Bastille. This is Halfton's place. At much risk to himself, he has agreed to help us. The first difficult task is to get into the Bastille without notice. There are two problems with entering the Bastille. The first is that the whole city keeps tabs on the comings and goings of the fortress, since it is the home of the Black Council. The second is that the Bastille is inhabited by a psychic bird of prey that was long ago disjoined from its body and welded to the building using awful magics. The Deathbird, said Zane, suddenly understanding. Yes, the Deathbird. It thinks the Bastille is its nest, and that any intruders coming to steal its eggs should be psychically murdered, said Priyanka. That sounds impossible, said Skylar. Nothing is impossible, only highly improbable, said Priyanka. The only point that the Deathbird must be fooled is at the entry. Otherwise those that reside within would be at risk if they had a stray impure thought. 
Instructor Pennywhistle will be able to get us through the door, but your team will get us to the door. Priyanka waved her hand, bringing the screens on the wall to life, showing a spell written in a raggedy tome in silver ink. You have an hour to learn this ritual. It takes five to cast, and will provide a limited bubble of invisibility for my team. On its own it would never work, but Halfton has agreed to provide a distraction so that anyone who might be looking closely would have their attention elsewhere, said Priyanka. And once inside, asked Keelan. Priyanka looked away, a downward curl to her lips. Some dangers I know, and hopefully have a way to bypass. The rest I will have to improvise. The way she said it suggested she wasn't happy about the setup, but if the virus was affecting the instructors, then there wasn't much time. You can count on us, said Zane. Priyanka let a hint of a smile ghost to her lips, before touching him on the shoulder and disappearing out the door. When she was gone, his teammates looked to him. Let's get started. Chapter 23. Deathbird, April 2015. The virus affects everyone differently. The ritual for limited invisibility wasn't difficult to learn. It required a medium level of enunciation and coordination from the five mages involved in the spell. The problem would be maintaining the bubble around Priyanka's team while they moved through the streets. The whole way to Halfton's mansion, Zane bounced his knees, thinking about how they were going to keep the bubble around her team for a whole mile. He caught glances from his teammates, who looked equally concerned. Do you have to wee or are you nervous? asked Instructor O'Keefe, seated across from him in the oversized carriage without seats so all ten of them could fit. Thinking, said Zane, wishing he had a bottle of water to chug after the portal journey. If we don't get the bubble right, you won't even make it to the Bastille. It's okay, laddie. What's a lifetime of pain and misery, she said with a playful wink. The other instructors, Penny Whistle, Allgood, Noya Day and Priyanka, seemed amused by her comment. When instructor Allgood caught his initial expression, he offered, humor is important at times during a mission. If you're as tight as Aliette is when it's time to split a dinner bill, then things won't go smoothly. It's the only reason we let Karen come along, said instructor Noya Day. He's a worthless Putin when it comes to anything but knocking first-year heads and glowering like a bulldog with gas. Priyanka, who was lounging on O'Keefe's lap as if it were an elegant chair, added, Don't be so hard on Captain Dildo. Remember, he can take a punch like a drunken sailor. The last line brought a round of laughter from everyone. Instructor Allgood winked at Zane, which broke loose the tension in his chest. Despite the dire circumstances in that moment, Zane felt like he didn't want to be anywhere in the realms other than in that carriage, crammed together with the instructors and his team on a heist that probably wasn't going to work. When the carriage lurched to a stop, the door swung open, revealing Halfton's smiling moustached face. I didn't know you were bringing your whole school, said Halfton. Only the ones too stupid to say no to me, said Priyanka, chuckling. Instructor Allgood, who pushed out the open door, said, Move it, Halfton. Maggie's got her boot right up my ass, and I need to stretch my legs. The bow-legged instructor led them out of the carriage, which was parked inside a small warehouse filled with a variety of strange containers. Out of the corner of his eye, Zane caught instructor Pennywhistle leaning against the door as she climbed out as if she were too weak to walk. Priyanka had noticed as well, but she made no sign that it bothered her. I brought you in by the delivery cave, said Halfton extending his arms upward as if he were in charge of a circus. He wore a long tan jacket that went down to his thighs and a sparkling blue shirt. He led them up spiral stairs cut into rock that opened up into a circular room filled with art objects. Zane didn't recognize their styles except for a lifelike statue of a dark-haired matri in black armor. That's a nice copy of the Mona Lisa, said Vin, standing in front of the painting which was in a glass case. Who said it's a copy? replied Halfton with a wry smile. Zane wandered to the front of the mansion. The Bastille could be seen across the hilltop, surrounded by crystalline trees that scintillated in the sunlight. Looking at it gave him the shivers. Halfton led them to a ballroom on the third floor, with a giant window that looked out over the Bastille. The carpets and furniture that had been in front of the window had been dragged away to the middle. He looked around before snapping his fingers. Let me grab the salt for the ritual. I forgot it downstairs. After Halfton left, Priyanka put her hand on Zane's shoulder as he looked out the window. 
Is your team ready? Of course. He glanced over his shoulder to make sure none of his teammates were nearby. Can you trust Halfton? She studied his face. Not really, but my options are limited, especially on short notice. I told him I would get his woman an invite to Deathbird. But you never said anything when we visited the Black Council last time, he said. She raised an eyebrow. I already knew what the answer was. But if it's the price of his help I'll pull some strings after this is over, which assumes more things than I'd like. After speaking to him, she moved towards instructor Penny Whistle, who was standing off by herself, which was quite unusual for the normally extroverted instructor. The pair chatted quietly with Penny Whistle nodding in the affirmative to Priyanka's questions. Eventually Priyanka squeezed her shoulder and moved away towards the other instructors. Halfton appeared a moment later with a canister of salt. Zane made the circle at a 15-foot diameter. Will that be large enough for you to move? asked Zane. We could survive on half that, said Priyanka with a subtle glance towards instructor Penny Whistle, who was sitting on the furniture, looking pale. Are you ready for the distraction? asked Halfton. Priyanka nodded. Be ready in ten minutes exactly, said Halfton, tapping on his wrist. I have it timed down to the second. What is it? asked Vin. You'll know it when it happens, said Halfton with a wink. After he left, Zane gathered his team around the salt circle. The instructors took their spots in the middle. The worries that had plagued him until that moment fled when they began the ritual. There weren't many opportunities for group spells like this one, but Instructor Allgood had drilled them constantly during their first year for moments like these, so despite the circumstances, they performed as if they'd been doing it for years. Group spells were different than individual spells, because the phase was external rather than internal. They coaxed threads of the golden stuff into the air, until a shimmering dome covered the circle. This was the scaffolding upon which they weaved their enchantment, and the five instructors faded until they were only faint outlines beneath what had become a shimmering see-through half-bubble. Zane was standing opposite the window. A hazy bastille could be seen through the dome. It wouldn't fool anyone up close, but it would work at a distance. Once the spell had hardened into place, they broke it free from the salt circle, which had provided the initial anchor. Be ready to move, said Zane, concentrating on the spell. With five of them, the strain was minimal, but it would increase as the dome moved further away. Spells and distance were logarithmic, so by the time they reached the Bastille, it would be a challenge for the team. As Zane wondered when the distraction would hit, a massive blast somewhere behind them shook the mansion, rattling the glass windows. A strange keening filled the air, like a thousand ghosts crying out, emanating from the quivering crystalline forest. He almost forgot that he was supposed to be holding the spell in place, until Keelan gave him a hand signal. Ready to move, said Zane. Moving now, responded Priyanka. The dome slid through the air, maneuvered using their collective intention. As the instructors reached the staircase, Zane relaxed, letting the phase stream from his mind more easily. Then right before the dome tilted down the exit, a peculiar thump sounded from beneath the dome, which at first Zane thought was a secondary tremor from the explosion. As they lifted the dome, it revealed a fallen woman being tended to by Priyanka, with the others crowded around her. The shock of seeing Instructor Penny Whistle lying prone on the floor disrupted his concentration. Not only was she unconscious, but she was completely bald and covered in strange ridges that suggested inhuman origins. As soon as he lost focus, the dome disintegrated into wisps of smoke. Priyanka stood slowly, a scowl hanging on her lips. As soon as she gazed across the hills to the Bastille, everyone knew the plan was ruined. Chapter 24. Deathbird, April 2015. Into the heist. Is she okay? asked Skylar, crouched on her heels looking at the unconscious instructor Penny Whistle, whose head was lying in O'Keefe's lap. The Scottish instructor was gently stroking Penny Whistle's ridged forehead. Priyanka didn't look like she was going to answer, but then she glanced at Penny Whistle, shaking her head. I don't know. Is this going to happen to us? asked Skylar. Probably, said Priyanka. Though it will likely be different for you than her, as she's only half human. Is there another way into the Bastille? asked Keelan. There's always another way, said Priyanka, though it was clear from her crossed arms that it wouldn't be pleasant. Then what are we waiting for? asked Vin nodding feverishly. Let us help. Priyanka glanced at him with watery eyes. 
It was going to be difficult enough going through the front, but now I worry that it would be a death sentence to try the other way. But we'll lose our magic if we don't, said Portia, and everyone else in the hundred halls. You might lose your magic, but you would be alive. Priyanka nodded towards the Bastille. There you will only be served pain and misery, then eventually death. Zane checked the faces of his teammates before speaking. They each gave him nods of approval. Bring us with you. The nine of us can do this. We're more than up for this. If we don't do it as you said, our world will descend into chaos. She pursed her lips, considering their offer for a long minute before exhaling. If you come with us, I will expect absolute obedience. If I tell you to jump, you jump. If I tell you to chop off your arm to save the group, you better be sawing before I'm finished speaking. There can be no dissent. Not in there, not the way we're going. I don't understand what's so bad about this other way, asked Zane. The Black Council has relied on the Deathbird to vet anyone coming into or out of the Bastille for centuries. Because of its abilities and the threats of the Pact, they're not worried about intruders through the front. But a sealed building cannot function, they need water and air and a way to get rid of waste, so there's an entrance at the back of the fortress. And if for some reason we can find a way past the crystalline trees without turning ourselves to shreds, the Black Council devised cunning traps to guard those ways. That sounds amazing, said Vin, bringing everyone's head around. He shrugged in response. Sorry, I can't help it. Priyanka let a corner of her lips curl with a smile. But none of that matters if we can't get past the crystalline forest. The trees are perfectly reflective of all energies. Throw a rock at one, and the pieces that break from it return to the thrower in total, turning them into a pincushion. Hit one with a force bolt and you'd be turned to pulp. They're often called mirror trees for this phenomenon, though I'd call them a pain in the ass. Which means we'd have to get past them without disturbing a single tree. Hit one and it could cause a chain reaction, killing all of us. I can get us past, said Instructor Allgood, leaning on his staff. Or at least I can get you through, assuming I have Aliette's help. What are you thinking? asked Priyanka, forehead hunched. He tapped on the wood floor with his staff. We'll go below. I can dig us a tunnel. The roots are still a danger, but I can take a few hits. Aliette can provide air to me through her link. Soil is just like water, right? Aliette was sitting cross-legged by Penny Whistle, eyes puffy and sore. It would be my pleasure. That will take forever, said Portia. No more than five or six hours, said Allgood. Priyanka tapped on her chin. Are you sure you can maintain a pace like that? You've dug a few tunnels in your time, but never this long, and with such short notice. His gaze fell onto Penny Whistle. Imagine a whole city like this. She turned to Halfton, who had returned from the distraction. Where can they start that's closer than here? To make his job a little easier. Halfton massaged his moustache as he thought, then moved to the window and tapped on the glass towards an outbuilding along the edge of the forest. There are chemicals in that building used to keep the crystalline forest from infringing on the city. You can use it for your tunnel entrance, he said. Good. Take them there right now as if you were showing them the forest, then bring back an illusionary double, said Priyanka. He pointed towards the horizon, which was dark with clouds. And it looks like we might get a storm, which will aid you in your escape, assuming you are successful. We need a bit of luck if we're going to make this work, said Priyanka. Halfton bowed deeply. Always a pleasure to be working a job with you, madam. Madam me again and I'll take you dragon hunting again, she said with a smirk. The immediate whites of his eyes revealed a story that Zane wanted to hear. Halfton all good and Noyade left in the carriage, while Priyanka paced in front of the window, glancing frequently to Penny Whistle whose breathing had become laboured. The virus is hitting her hard, said O'Keefe with a shake of her head. I don't know what to bloody do about it. None of my spells are working. Her ability to change appearance is probably the culprit. Whenever she does it the cells in her body are refreshed, said Priyanka. Which is why the virus is hurting her. To it she's like a baby. Oh Merlin, said Skylar, her voice cracking. Does that mean kids and babies that have magic are going to die first? We don't know, said Priyanka. It might but it might be that Marilyn's physiology is more susceptible. Either way we need to get that word, said Vin. What should we do while we wait? asked Keelan, putting his fist into his other hand. 
I don't want to just stand here for five hours. I need to do something. The rest of his team nodded in agreement. Is there something you can show us? Some spells or tricks so we're more ready, asked Zane. It could be anything, said Priyanka. But something is better than nothing. I'd worry about wearing you out but we'll have to risk it. I hope you all have a good memory. She gathered them on the opposite side of the ballroom. I will show you some spells and some techniques to leverage your imbuements, but what will best help you is to understand the mindset necessary to get past any obstacle. She paused, letting them know the seriousness of what she was about to say. Everything has a flaw. Everything. There are no impregnable fortresses, no perfect protections. There is no immovable object. What can be made can be unmade. If you find yourself away from the group, stuck in something diabolical, figure out the flaw. It might be something as simple as a hinge or a gap in a spell weave. Anything. Don't let your mind rest until you've figured it out, no matter the distractions or pain. Having said that, in the Bastille, be careful that the flaw that you think you have found is not actually a trick. The Black Council is made up of the realm's best thieves and assassins. They know every trick and technique. They will have designed their protections to appear to have flaws, which are actually traps. Be wary. That's crazy making, said Skylar. We're supposed to look for the flaw, but not if it's too obvious. You asked to be involved, said Priyanka. I'm not backing out, said Skylar. I'm just processing, that's all. Priyanka moved from her lecture into a series of exercises with simple spells used in unexpected ways. The one Zane liked the best was casting a force bolt at point-blank range, while using an imbuement to lock the arm into place, thus creating a jackhammer-like impact. They took turns demolishing Hafton's expensive furniture to practice. The five hours went by quickly. When night fell on the city, mage lights bloomed in exquisite lanterns hung from hooks on the wall. And though this was the first time their patron had been their teacher, like everything about her, movement, thought, speech, her methods were ruthlessly efficient. Zane felt like he learned more in that time than he had in months of class time with the other instructors. They were in the middle of a demonstration from Priyanka on using ropes, pulleys made from modified and spell-enhanced simple objects, and their speed enchantments to create machines that could move large objects. She had slid the massive hearth on the fireplace, a few inches from its moorings in the wall by the time Hafton appeared. It's time. Stroking his moustache, he frowned at the destruction in his ballroom. It's a good thing too. Any longer and I don't think I'd have a standing house. Good deeds seldom go unpunished, said Priyanka. Zane had a light sweat built up. He wiped his forehead with the back of his sleeve. The others looked similarly lubricated. I'll take care of Marilyn while you're gone, said Hafton. There are supplies downstairs, things you might find useful in the Bastille. Since it was night, it was easier to move about the city, especially because Deathbird had no moon. What few lights glistened in the city were distant, barely even reflecting off the crystalline forest. They used spells that Priyanka had taught them, which used the darkness like a cloak. They made it to the outbuilding where Allgood and Noyade had dug the tunnel without incident, finding a hole going into the earth inside. With the door closed, Priyanka addressed them. This is your last chance to back out. If you enter the tunnel with me, you have agreed to see this through to the end, no matter what the consequences. I want your answers, one at a time. I am ready to die trying, said Portia with a tight-lipped intensity that brought a raised eyebrow from Priyanka. Skylar took a deep breath before nodding her head, as if she'd just finally come to the conclusion that she was willing to die. I'm in. When everyone looked to Vin he answered, well duh. They all chuckled, relieving the tension of the moment. Keelan caught his gaze. There was some emotion Zane couldn't quite read, but his cousin looked back to Priyanka and said, I'm in. Last Priyanka looked to Zane. He was going to give a brief answer like the others, but then he remembered it was more than just his patron looking at him. His teammates were as well. He wanted to give them something more than what seemed like an inevitable answer. For our friends in the academy, our families who want to see us again, and for everyone in the hundred halls. Let's do this. Chapter 25 Deathbird, April 2015 Not everyone makes it to the end. The interior of the tunnel looked like it had been blasted into existence with searing flame. 
A mix of burnt hair and charred wood smell permeated the long tube that meandered in the general direction of the Bastille. It looked like the two instructors had to constantly change directions to avoid the crystalline root structures. Priyanka led them through the tunnel, carefully pointing out the occasional glimmering tendrils hanging from the black earth. Zane examined one section closely as he passed. The root structure had a million tiny facets, and a surface that reminded him of metal filings on a magnet if they were rainbow-hued. When he moved his hand too close, his skin tensed up as if there were a force field around it. When they reached what they thought was the end of the tunnel, they found instructors Allgood and Noyade in a small natural cavern that they had intersected, lying on the ground nearly motionless except for the slow rise and fall of their chests. They were covered in dirt and other, darker materials, especially Allgood, like coal miners after a 12-hour shift. The tunnel continued ahead. The sound of water falling echoed through the opening, but the way was partially blocked by a curtain of crystalline roots. Instructor Noyade opened her eyes and struggled to sit up. Her arms were trembling. It had only been five hours, but the exhaustion in her eyes made her look like the survivor of a lost expedition. Is he? asked Skylar, eyes wide with concern. Mercifully unconscious, said Noyade, leaning heavily on her bent knees. She was a lithe woman with sea-green hair, but that color was lost amid the muck. We'd been avoiding the worst of the roots until this last section. The soil blasted away, but what hit the roots rebounded on him. He's going to have a few more scars. Are you well enough to continue? asked Priyanka with a motherly tone that surprised Zane. Tears formed in instructor Noyade's eyes, streaking through the mud on her face. I'm sorry, Pri. I'm spent. That last hit took it out of me keeping Karen alive. It was like being struck with the tuning fork of the universe. Even my bones feel thin. Priyanka put a hand on Noyade's shoulder. No worries. You performed admirably. No one could have done what you did and in the time that you did it, except you two. But we didn't complete the job, said Noyade, voice cracking. There's no room to squeeze past those roots. It isn't finished. With a wave of Priyanka's hand, Noyade's eyes rolled back into her head. Priyanka caught the lithe instructor and gently laid her onto her back next to Karen. His respect and admiration for his patron was growing. She clearly cared for her instructors and students, which led them in turn to fierce loyalty. It made him regret some of his actions in his first year, when he had ignored the needs of his team until it was almost too late. Priyanka sent a message Sprite careening back the other way through the tunnel. Halfton can collect them and bring them back to clean them up and pour some healing magic into them, said Priyanka. Thank Merlin for his help in this. The whole time Priyanka was dealing with the other two instructors, O'Keefe was standing before the crystalline roots. What do you see, Maggie? asked Priyanka over her shoulder. Cleavage to make a man tremble, said O'Keefe, rooting around in her shirt. The only problem is a damn centipede dropped down the front. After a brief tussle she yanked it out and threw the insect onto the soil before stomping on it. As for the roots, I think we can scoot by them if we're careful, said Instructor O'Keefe as she eyed Vin. Except for the big man over there. Unless you know a shrinking spell, and then I'll hide him in my cleavage, which is now a centipede-free zone. A rosy hue bloomed on Vin's cheeks. If they can get through, then I can get through. Zane was worried about himself, and Vin had another hundred pounds on him. Follow me then, said Priyanka. If you bump one, try not to react or you might cause a chain reaction. We'll go one at a time to minimize the risk. Follow my path. Priyanka went first. She moved as if she had jelly for bones, contorting her body like a Tetris game to slide through the openings. When she was on the other side of the roots, she said, that was relatively simple. Let's get through this so we can focus on the real challenges ahead. Skylar went next, and though she lacked the grace of the patron, she had the size and flexibility to make the passage look easy. Then Portia went through in a herky-jerky manner that made Zane tense up every time she moved, expecting her to hit a crystalline tendril. Before making his attempt, Vin went through a series of stretches. Zane had seen the big man limber up before a dojo session with Allgood, but Vin really pushed himself this time. As Vin went through the maze of roots, Zane held his breath waiting for the inevitable mistake. It seemed impossible that Vin could fit in the gaps, but he contorted his body in no less an impressive manner than Priyanka. You go next, Zane told his cousin, who looked like he was going to object before stepping to the passage. 
Keelan took his time, carefully slanting his body to get past the dangerous plants. He was nearing the end when the ground rumbled slightly, and a section of the tunnel fell in, dumping dirt onto Keelan. He cried out in pain. When the tunnel finished collapsing, Keelan was standing still with a chunk of root sticking into his shoulder. More roots had spilled around him, leaving him in a crystalline cage. Don't move, Keelan, said Priyanka. You didn't hit it, so it didn't react too badly. If you can pull away slowly, you'll be fine. It's in my arm, he said through gritted teeth. Let me get to him, said Zane. I can help. I can do it, Keelan said calmly. Stay back. If he jerks and knocks into the other roots, you're both dead, said Priyanka. I'm coming, Keelan, said Zane. His cousin scrunched his forehead. Stay back. Zane didn't bother answering. He stepped through the roots carefully until he reached his cousin, whose forehead was damp with sweat and smudged with dirt. If you crouch down slowly, letting the roots slide out, you won't hit the ones behind you. I can reach through this gap and keep you stable, said Zane. Keelan's breath was labored. Clearly he was in a lot of pain. He made the tiniest of nods. On my go, one, two, three, said Zane. Keelan lowered himself, and the crystalline root made a sickening noise as it pulled out of his arm. The jagged edges of the plant were worse than a broken bottle. When it was finally out, Keelan nearly stumbled into the roots behind him, but Zane held him up. Thanks, Cos, said Keelan, but I could have gotten out. The partial tunnel collapse had created an easier passage through the final section, so they were able to reach the others. Portia tended Keelan's shoulder with a tiny gold beetle, that stitched and cleaned the wounds with its mandibles. Under normal circumstances, Zane would have been fascinated by the device that Halfton had given them, but he was too awed by the scene before him. They stood at the back of the Bastille, which was no less impressive than the front. The solid grey stone stood sentinel on the back of the hill, which dipped into a depression. The falling water that he'd heard before was from a large tube sticking out of the base of the structure, splashing into a pool below. The water sparkled clear under the floating mage light. Miedo, said Portia. It's a lot more impressive up close. Priyanka winked. Wait until we get inside. Chapter 26 The Bastille, April 2015 Strange time for a lesson. Looks so good you could drink it, said Skylar, staring at the glistening pool of water below them. Or at least a few laps before we go. The pool was about 50 feet wide and 40 feet below them. While the tube was at their level, it was about 80 feet from where they were standing. Instructor O'Keefe pulled a handful of shiny metal spheres from a pouch and handed one to each of them. They were the size of a marble and cold to the touch. Can anyone guess what these are? asked O'Keefe. The world's worst gumballs, said Vin, holding it up as if he were going to bite into it. Without answering, O'Keefe lobbed the sphere in her hand at the water pipe. Before it reached the pipe, it impacted something in midair, sending tendrils of electricity in a wide arc. The pristine scene before them disappeared, replaced with a swampy sewage land. Brown chunky water splashed out of the pipe, tumbling into a seething mud pit below. The water didn't seem to flow as much as it oozed. The reek hit Zane's nose, bringing up bile in the back of his throat. The stench made his eyes water. Skylar, holding a fist over her mouth, said, Please tell me we're not going through that. I think I preferred the illusion. Use your imbuement to stifle your sense of smell, said Priyanka. It'll make this much easier. Zane had practice with the technique, so he got it right away. The relief of not having to smell that wretched quagmire was palpable. Priyanka pulled a rope from her backpack, tied a heavy metal ball to the end, and handed the whole thing to Skylar. We need to get over there and disarm any wards in the pipe, said Priyanka. You're going to help me. Skylar looked like she was going to protest, but then she remembered Priyanka's earlier comment and nodded her head. By the look on her face, it was clear she realized her previous statement had earned her the job. That ball on the end will attach to the metal pipe. Throw it over and we'll use it as a bridge, said Priyanka. Don't worry, the rope is unbreakable. Skylar got it on the first try. The ball connected to the pipe with a thud. They tied it off to a spike pounded into the ground. Both Skylar and Priyanka nimbly walked across the taut rope, their imbuements making it a trivial challenge. There was enough room inside the pipe for both women to stand. Priyanka made a few arcane gestures, and glyph lines appeared inside the pipe blocking their way. 
Zane expected their patron to disarm the ward, but then it became apparent Priyanka was teaching Skylar how to do it. While they worked on the ward, everyone else milled around. The sky occasionally flashed with light, announcing the approach of the storm, though it was too far away to hear the thunder. Zane moved next to O'Keefe. Isn't this a strange time for lessons? There's a lot on the line. Judging by the smirk that curled O'Keefe's lips, he knew what her answer was going to be. What better time? Even bright young men and women like yourselves are like porn stars at work, going through the motions making noises you think will fool us. In moments like these you learn to keep a laser focus when you could kill yourself and all your friends. Zane crossed his arms and looked across the gap at Skylar, who looked frustrated by the task. Impotent sparks flew from her fingertips at the failed spell. It's her way laddie, said O'Keefe. She's been doing it this way for as long as I've known her. It just seems like a trivial thing to be teaching in a time like this. There are lives on the line. The hundred halls will fall apart without magic. There's always a new crisis. Always, said O'Keefe. The quest for power is as old as my underwear. People will screw things up faster than you can put them back together. But if you don't take the time for the future when you can, you'll never do it. It just seems strange is all he said. She won't always be here to save us, said O'Keefe. Either you'll be on a job on your own, or she'll have finally made a mistake and joined with the eternal dirt. He mulled her words as they watched Priyanka and Skylar work on the ward. But after several failed attempts, Skylar dispelled the protective magic, and the glyph faded from the air. They each crossed the taut line in turn. Zane tried to ignore the muck tugging on his ankles in the pipe. He did his best to not imagine what could be in the goo, but it was hard when it was sucking on his boots each time he stepped forward. When they were finished crossing, Priyanka tugged on the rope, and it untied itself and zipped back to her hand. She unhooked the ball, put it in her pouch, and handed the rope to Skylar, who wore it like a bandolier. The pipe led into a small square room with no visible entrances, except for the way they'd come in. Sewage in a pit at the center of the room seeped over the edge and into a trough, which led to the pipe. They stepped out and cleaned their feet with spells, though Zane didn't think he'd ever get the feeling of squishiness between his toes out of his mind. Remind me never to complain out loud again, said Skylar, shivering as she spelled away the grime. You did marvelously, said Priyanka. Now everyone look around for a way out of here. Check the walls for hidden doors. There has to be a way into the main structure. Searching took about five minutes. Portia found faint grooves in the wall as if something had been scratching across the length of it. While Zane was examining the fetid pool at the center of the cube-shaped room, he noticed Keelan wasn't moving as quickly as before. A sheen of sweat had broken out on his cousin's forehead. You okay? Zane asked quietly, away from the others. The stitched cut on his shoulder leaked pus, and around the wound his skin was blotchy red. I'll be fine, said Keelan, though it was clear he wasn't. Don't say anything. I don't want to be a burden, and there's nothing we can do until we get out of here. Zane glanced at the others before nodding. I found something, said Vin, pointing to a small hole in the wall that he'd revealed behind a hidden panel. There's a switch inside. After Priyanka examined it, she gave the room a long look. Before we trigger that, let's keep looking. That felt too easy to find. They searched for another ten minutes. Zane thought it was a pointless task since they'd already found the hidden lever, but Portia called out from the opposite side from the lever. It looks like there's a big door here. Or at least the outline of one. I found it with my fingernail, she said, holding up her hand. The door wasn't visible to the eye even with imbuements turned up, but scratching across the surface with a fingernail caught on the edge. No one could find the top of the door, which suggested it was extremely tall, or possibly went up to the ceiling. Do you think that lever opens this door? asked Skylar. Probably not, said Priyanka, lips pursed into a concerned frown as she stared at the wall. Instructor O'Keefe was digging through a pouch on her hip. It seemed like her hands were going much deeper than the suggested size of the pouch. She produced a pair of large suction cups with handles and handed them to Priyanka. After applying an alchemical solution to the suction side, Priyanka stuck them to the hidden door along the bottom edge. Then she wiped her hands on her shirt, before grabbing the handles and pulling upward like a weightlifter doing a clean and jerk. When the door shifted upward a few inches they shared a round of pleased smiles until a grinding noise rumbled beneath them. The grins turned flat 
and everyone glanced around the room, trying to figure out what was making the noise. The ceiling is closing, said Skylar right before Keelan added, and the pipe is gone. Seven heads snapped in the direction of the pipe, which was mysteriously missing. They were trapped in the room. We have to go out this door, said Priyanka, grunting as she lifted the door higher. The tendons in her neck strained like steel support wires on a bridge as she yanked upward, but the door was moving slow, and the ceiling was much faster. Vin and Portia jumped to either side of Priyanka, and added their phase imbued strength, which lifted the door a little faster. Hurry, the ceiling is closing, said Skylar, who couldn't seem to figure out what her hands should be doing. Despite the rapidly deteriorating events, Instructor O'Keefe was staring at the floor. Those gears below us aren't moving the ceiling. They're moving something else, she said. Zane was about to ask what it might be when Keelan cried out. Four massive tentacles with an almost translucent purple skin had poked from the muck. The long limbs undulated towards Skylar and Keelan, who were standing closest to the pit. Keelan sent a firebolt at the nearest tentacle. It barely singed the tough, gnarly hide. Zane joined his cousin along with O'Keefe and Skylar, battling the creature in the sewage pit with spells, but the elemental blasts did little to stop it. Each impact only darkened the translucence momentarily, as if the creature had absorbed the blow. Zane spared a glance to see how high the door had been lifted, and a tentacle moved under a force bolt and slammed him in the stomach, throwing him across the room. The impact stunned the air from his chest, leaving him gasping. With the odds in the creature's favor, it used the tentacle it had just freed up to trip Skylar onto her back. The creature was about to slam another one onto the fallen second year, when Instructor O'Keefe gave a primal scream, something that sounded like it would have been appropriate in her ancestors' time on the Scottish Highlands. Buag no bass. The grey-haired Scottish instructor materialised a ghostly hammer and slammed it into the nearest tentacle, knocking it backwards. She hit a second before the first could recover, driving forward with such furiousness that Zane wasn't sure how the tentacles didn't explode from the impact. While O'Keefe battled the creature in the pit, Zane caught his breath enough to stand. Priyanka had the door to a height of a few feet, but when Zane scrambled over expecting to see a room on the other side, all he found was a long corridor the same height as the door. You're not lifting a door but a ceiling, shouted Zane. What? asked Priyanka. It's like a huge block of stone at least 50 feet long, he said. It's more like a tunnel with a collapsible ceiling. That explains why it's so heavy. Can you get down it? asked Priyanka straining from the effort. Her lips were purple from squeezing. I can. Then go, she grunted. Zane grabbed his cousin. You go first. No arguing. Keelan hesitated, but Zane patted him on the shoulder, reminding him of his wound. He was the least able to help hold the door for the others. The ceiling had lowered to less than half the height of the room. They didn't have time to get everyone out. Skylar, you go behind him, said Zane, pushing his petite teammate. She lowered onto her hands and feet, scrambling after Keelan. Zane didn't bother watching, he was already tapping Vin on the shoulder. You next, let me take your place. Vin followed, pulling himself along on his belly like a lizard without back legs. The ceiling sunk until Zane had to duck his head to the right. What do we do about the creature? asked Zane. If O'Keefe stopped fighting it, the creature would be able to attack the people holding the door. Don't worry about that, said Priyanka. Just get to the next room. Portia took that as her cue, and she followed Vin, putting more strain on Zane's arms as he supported the door. They were no longer lifting it, but holding it in place. You go now, said Priyanka. Who will hold the door for you? asked Zane. I said go now, she repeated. You promised to listen. But. She kicked him in the shin. Hurry. Zane dropped to his knees. The ceiling was making Priyanka crouch to hold the door. He crawled through the low space, banging his back against the ceiling, as Priyanka couldn't hold the door much higher. The whole time through the crawl space, Zane kept thinking about if one of the tentacles got through O'Keefe's defenses, then Priyanka would drop the massive stone on him, turning him to pulp. He scrambled faster, banging the back of his head on the ceiling trying to hurry. When he reached the other side, he thought he'd be able to climb out and hold the ceiling up so Priyanka and O'Keefe could escape, but the passage didn't exit at the floor. When he slipped out, he fell 15 feet, barely getting his feet beneath him for a teeth-jarring impact. As soon as he landed he tried to scramble up the slick wall, 
but it was like trying to climb ice. The others were pawing at the wall as well, but even if he could get up the wall, there was nowhere to stand and hold the way for Priyanka. Moments later the gap that he'd just crawled through slammed shut. The huge blocks of stone impacting shook him, but not as much as the realization that Priyanka and O'Keefe were unlikely to survive. Zane slammed his fist into the wall. Damn it. Portia summed up how everyone was feeling when in a low and quiet voice she said, Miedo, no. There was another way to escape, right? asked Vin, his face white with anguish. You were there, man. You know the answer, said Keelan, who had tears in his eyes. Almost so quiet Zane didn't hear, Vin said, this isn't a heist. What do we do now? asked Skylar, and suddenly everyone was looking at him. Every bit of him wanted to curl into a ball and forget that Instructor O'Keefe and Priyanka had been crushed into pulp, but they needed him if they weren't going to meet a similar fate. He looked to each of them. They were shaken to the core. They'd volunteered to help Priyanka, not complete the mission without her. The lights in their eyes had dimmed as they were in shock. He was in shock. He could feel the way his senses were condensed around him, as if they were saving energy. He had to get them going again, thinking, acting. Otherwise they were going to die. Zane put his hand on Vin's shoulder. It's still a heist. We didn't come here to give up, no matter what we think might have happened to Priyanka and O'Keefe. They've survived worst, I'm sure. We shouldn't assume that they're dead. We need to keep going forward, one problem at a time. The unnatural stillness that had claimed them cracked a little. They made slight nods of the head, an acknowledgement. It wasn't much, but it was a start. We have to figure out where we are, he said, surveying their new room. Tell me what you see. I see generators, said Keelan, nodding towards the huge machines in the middle of the room that were humming, although they had no obvious wires or power supplies. It's a high ceiling, said Skylar, and those columns don't look like they'll go into the floor, so we probably don't have to worry about getting squished in here. Good, said Zane. What else? Portia had her head tilted. Her hair was pulled back into a ponytail. She had blood running from the side of her head from the battle with the tentacles, but she didn't look too wounded. I hear someone walking, she signaled. Zane signaled back asking where? Portia pointed towards the opposite side of the room. Zane motioned to the others, asking if they saw any exits. There were lots of shaking heads in response. He was about to motion for them to hide behind a generator, when he saw a glass guardian marching from behind a column. It was a man-sized creature with an exterior of glass, and a shiny metal skeleton inside. Ruby eyes glowed with murderous intent. As soon as Zane laid his eyes on the creature, his stomach twisted into a knot. He knew exactly what it was and why things had gotten worse. Actually, Portia said out loud, I see five of them. Chapter 27 The Bastille, April 2015 A frightful game of tag. Don't shoot, yelled Zane when he saw his teammates readying their spells. He held his arms up before them. The five glass guardians had spread out in an arc, closing the distance as Zane and his teammates stood against the wall. Don't shoot, asked Skylar. If you break the glass you'll release a deadly gas that will kill us all, said Zane. We have to get past them. What the ever-loving hell do we do then? asked Vin. We run, said Zane, flinging himself to the right as a guardian surged forward. There was a mad scramble as everyone took off in separate directions. Keelan leapt directly over the nearest guardian in a front flip, then jumped over a generator. Vin pirouetted between the gap of two guardians, while Skylar and Portia crisscrossed, confusing their pursuers. Zane ducked under the arm of a guardian, sliding to get away. He phased sprinted to the other end of the room, but there was no exit. Anyone see a way out of here? he asked. Shouts of no came from various points of the room. It was easy to keep ahead of the guardians, they ran slightly faster than a normal human, but there was no time to rest. Within a few minutes, Zane realized the room had no visible exit, and it was impossible to stop long enough to examine the walls for secret doors. We can't keep this up forever, said Keelan, who looked slower than the others. He rested by a column, before slipping away from two guardians. His shoulder injury was still plaguing him. This is the sucky street game of tag ever, said Skylar. No home base. Ideas, shouted Zane. We need ideas on how to stop them without breaking the glass. We can use Skylar's rope to lasso them like banditos, said Portia. 
Skylar, who was perched momentarily on a generator, looked down to the rope hanging around her shoulder and chest. It's unbreakable too. She pulled the rope off and threw one end of the line to Vin, who was sprinting past. Though no one really planned it, they weaved in and out of each other, wrapping the glass guardians into the rope then cinching them together. It was like fighting with a bull, but they managed to get the five of them wrapped together, but no one could get close enough to tie them off, so they had to keep them at the center of the two ends. The glass guardians tugged on the rope, but couldn't unentangle themselves. They surged to one side or the other, but Skylar and Vin kept them centered. Don't squeeze too tightly, said Zane. We don't want the glass to break. While they held the guardians, the rest of the group searched the room, but even after an hour of thorough examination, they could find no exit, or even how the glass guardians had gotten into the room. What do we do now? asked Keelan who had dark rings around his eyes. It's like there's no way in or out. There has to be, right? asked Portia. I wish we could just make a portal out of here, said Skylar. This whole thing is screwed. Mention of the portal reminded Zane about the tether. He touched the circular amulet against his chest. Actually I do have a way out, he said, pulling the obsidian amulet from beneath his shirt. What? Came their incredulous replies. The item I got from Penny Whistle for winning the challenge. It's called a tether. A one-time get-out-of-jail-free card. If we all group up, and you hold on to me, I can activate it, and we'll return to the honeycomb portal. Great balls of fire, said Vin. That is a get-out-of-jail-free card. They shared glances, looking from one to the other. Their foreheads were knotted, lips pursed together. If we leave then the virus will wreck our world, said Portia. And if we stay we're probably going to die, said Vin. The decision weighed on them. Only the sound of the guardians clinking together made any intrusion. I almost wish you didn't have the tether so I didn't have to make that decision, said Skylar, frowning. Everyone nodded. If Priyanka was here this wouldn't even be a decision, said Keelan, wiping his forehead with the back of his hand. No it wouldn't, said Portia softly. Zane's heart ached with the temptation to leave this behind. He wouldn't even be affected by the virus, and might even benefit, given the massive changes to society that would occur. It made him sick to his stomach that he was even considering it. But how could they keep going? They had no idea what they were doing. What do you want to do? Leave or stay, he asked. I think it has to be unanimous. I want to stay, said Portia with tears in her eyes. She looked away. But I also want to go. I won't have magic anymore, but at least I'll be alive. Everyone made nods of approval. He could see it in their eyes that they wanted to go. Zane wanted to go, even though part of him was screaming inside that they should stay. He felt a collective acknowledgement of how screwed their situation was. A seductive relief crept in, knowing that soon he'd be free of this untenable situation. Then he caught his cousin's eye. Keelan looked like he was wavering between the two choices. He lifted one shoulder in a shrug acknowledging how mad their situation was. It's not really a heist if we all die, right? asked Vin with a snort. His deadpan delivery brought a chortle which encouraged a smile from Vin. Then the chuckle turned to laughter. The others caught it immediately, as if they'd been holding their breath for far too long and could finally get air. The laughter rolled through them until they were bent at the waist with tears in their eyes. When they finally recovered, Zane asked, We're staying, right? We're probably idiots but count me in, said Skylar. Completely loco, said Portia. Yep, said Keelan nodding. Zane shook his head part in relief part not quite comprehending. Good. We're staying. For now, anyway. We can always decide again later. But we're not doing anything until we can deal with these fine see-through gentlemen and how to get out of here. Portia crept near the knot of guardians. If they're moving throughout the Bastille and we can't find the doors, they must have a way to signal to them to let them through. She tapped on her chin. Maybe I can figure out what's sending that signal. The stocky young woman pulled a drawstring velvet bag from her hip pouch, dumping out a few small shiny grey hunks of what appeared to be quartz. She made arcane gestures over the rocks with her other hand, whispering a spell into them, finally squeezing her hand closed. When she finished, she opened her hand, revealing a palm full of grey dust, and blew it towards the nearest glass guardian. The dust sparkled through the air, landing on the glass creatures. 
At first the dust did nothing, but then like magnets pulling in iron fillings, the light material slid across the glass skin, collecting around the ruby eyes. The signal is in the eyes, said Portia, then added, the dust is for finding communication bugs. I figured it'd work for this. Great job, said Zane, a kernel of hope forming in his chest. Now we just have to get one of those eyes from a guardian, without breaking it. Anyone know any other spells we can use? Vin snapped his fingers. I know one that can fill a room with a hard foam. Maybe we can encase them in it, and then pry a ruby loose. Then his head dipped. But I don't have the materials for it. I'd need a jar of glycerin, which I definitely don't have. I do, said Skylar, producing a small jar. It's a skin moisturizer, but it's filled with glycerin. Will this work? Yes. Why are you carrying skin moisturizer? asked Keelan. Supple hands and nimble hands, said Skylar, waggling her fingers. Zane took Vin's place so he could perform his spell. He set the jar of face cream on the ground next to the guardians. When he finished the spell, a whitish foam cylinder appeared from the jar like those black snake fireworks they bought at the roadside tents outside of Varna. Except the foam grew exponentially in size and volume. Vin coaxed the foam towards the guardians, and it filled in around their legs. Within a minute, the foam had covered their lower halves, and was climbing around their shoulders. The glass guardians fought against the foam, jerking and clawing at it, but eventually it filled in around them, holding them in place. When the spell was finished, a massive lump of white foam with two ropes sticking out the sides sat in the middle of the floor. Let's dig out a section so we can get to the eyes, said Zane. Go for the eyes, boo, said Skylar softly. What, asked Zane? Nothing, she said with a wry smile. The foam was hard but they chipped away at it with their knives. Within ten minutes they had the head of a guardian sticking from the foam block. Think we can remove it without breaking the glass, asked Vin, tugging gently on the right ruby eye. Only one way to find out, said Zane. Just do it slowly and carefully. They were crowded around Vin, everyone except for Keelan, who sat against one of the columns resting. They'd been so busy Zane had forgotten to see if there was anything to do about his cousin's wound. As Vin stuck the tip of his dagger beneath the edge of the ruby, he put his hand on the foam for support. When the previously hard foam sunk beneath his weight he said, oh no. There was a moment of recognition, before the foam exploded around them. Zane didn't think he was that close or that the guardians could move that fast, but suddenly one of them clamped its hand around his wrist. His first reaction was to yank away, but then he remembered the deadly gas inside. As a cloud of foam dust fell around them, Zane witnessed the damage. Everyone but Keelan had been grabbed by a glass guardian. Without the ends of the rope being pulled taut, they easily slipped their bonds, patiently tugging them towards the far wall. What do we do? asked Skylar, gently tugging against the hands of the glass guardian. Zane tried to slip his fingers inside its grip, but there was no room. The Guardian had clamped down hard. It was supposed to last longer, said Vin, distraught. I don't understand. As Zane was led towards a blank wall, he looked back to see his cousin avoiding the final Guardian. Zane reached under his shirt to grab the tether, wondering if he could somehow reach the others, but the Guardian grabbed his other hand, catching the chain and breaking it. The circular amulet slipped through his fingers, and bounced across the floor. The other three were dragged through a door that had materialized the moment before the guardians reached it. Zane struggled against the glass creature, all his strength and speed useless against it. As he glanced back, he saw Keelan running towards the open door. Keelan! But the wall reappeared in the open space, before Keelan could reach the opening. The glass guardians marched them down the hall, which at the end descended into a crystal clear pool. Zane took the biggest breath of his life and locked it in, then he was pulled into the water. Chapter 28 The Bastille, April 2015 Lost and alone The wound in his shoulder ached no matter how he held his arm, so Keelan sat against a column while the others worked on removing the ruby eye from the glass guardian. A stab of pain shot up his arm when he put his hand down for balance. He suspected a piece of the crystalline root had broken off in his flesh, and it hurt like hell, but every time he thought about telling Zane it triggered the voice of his father, no one cares about your crying. The hard part was knowing that Zane wouldn't care if they had to stop and fix his shoulder. He'd damn well welcome it. Zane had always been like that. Even when Zane was working for the goon, a garbage person if there'd ever been one, 
Keelan knew his cousin had purer motives. Sometimes he wondered how they could share the same family. Keelan looked over to his cousin, with the rest of the team around him. Zane had a way with people, and Keelan might have been jealous if being the focal point of attention didn't wear him out. He was always worried that the parts of him that were like his father would come out in stressful situations. Oh no, said Vin. The exclamation immediately brought Keelan to his feet, moments before the foam exploded. As bits of whitish fluff floated through the air, the glass guardians captured his teammates. His whole body went cold, and he had to leap out of the way of the fifth guardian. Its glass fingers brushed his hip as he slipped past. But it was too late. They'd already lost. Keelan tried to help Skylar remove herself from a guardian's grip, but it tried to grab him with its other hand. I can't break free, said Skylar breathlessly. A trembling rage went through him. He wanted to kick the glass guardian in the head, shatter it into a million pieces, but that would only kill him and the rest of the team. The deviousness of their construction left him impotent with rage. Keelan kept ahead of the fifth guardian, but he could do nothing to stop the others from being taken. He was on the other side of the room when an opening in the beige wall materialized. He sprinted towards it, pouring phase into his imbuement to reach it. Keelan, yelled Zane, holding his hand out as if he might be saved. The opening filled in right as he reached it. Keelan slammed into the wall. The impact brought a spike of agony from his shoulder. It felt like a tiny knife was digging through his flesh, tunneling deeper and deeper. Separated from his team, Keelan wanted to slump against the wall and put his head between his knees, but the fifth guardian pursued him relentlessly. After running around the room in looping circles, he thought about letting the guardian catch him so he could follow the others, but that seemed like the last possible resort. It might happen anyway, because he couldn't run forever. He was getting dizzy. The skin around the wound was hot to the touch. He had to get the piece of crystalline root out of his arm. Soon. What he really needed was the ruby eyes from the guardian, so he could get through the door and follow the others. Keelan snatched up the unbreakable rope, used it like a lasso, and captured the glass guardian. After a minute of tricky cat and mouse, Keelan tied it to a column, its arms pinned to its side. He approached the guardian with his knife out. You're not going to be a problem, are you? I just need your eyes. That's not too much to ask, is it? The guardian's red eyes and expressionless face seemed appropriate for the role. He held his hand against the creature's chest to keep it in place. He didn't like being this close to it, but didn't have a choice. You kind of remind me of Jesse, said Keelan as he held the knife up, placing the tip underneath the edge of the ruby. In his head he thought of him as father or dad, but when he spoke of him he often used his name instead. It somehow made it easier to reckon with the idea that he was related, or maybe that he wasn't too related. All I see is your red eyes. Mad at the world for never giving you what you wanted, forgetting that you had us and mom's family. Shouldn't that have been enough? When the glass guardian didn't answer, Keelan pulled the tip of the knife away. You really are like Jesse. Keelan dug back in, removing the ruby from the glass face. He thought about just taking the one, but decided that eventually it would get free, and he didn't want it capable of following him. He removed the second, slipping them both in his pocket. As he walked away, a wave of delirium overtook him. He stumbled, nearly stabbing himself in the leg on accident. Let me get to them first, then I'll take care of it. On the way to the wall, he spied a little metal circle on the ground. The tether. Zane had lost it in the scramble with the guardians. Or he left it for me. That'd be just like him to save me at his expense. He loved his cousin so much it made his heart ache, but being around Zane was like trying to shine a flashlight on a sunny day. Nobody noticed the flashlight. Keelan placed the amulet in his pocket with the ruby eyes. I'm coming to save you, Cos. He checked to make sure the glass guardian was still tied to the column before approaching the secret door. To his relief, it dematerialized and he walked through. He was expecting a lot of things, but he didn't expect a short corridor ending in stairs that went into water. A chill shivered down his spine at the sight of where he would have to go. He approached the water slowly, fighting his memories with every step. The academy had provided him with clothes and shoes that were easy to swim in, but that wasn't his problem. He touched his shoulder. 
he wouldn't be able to swim until he dealt with the wound. And even after that, he hated the idea of going underwater. Lessons in the grotto had been bad enough, and that had been in the light with all his classmates. Except for the one incident at the beginning of the year, he'd gotten through his classes with instructor Noyade unscathed. His hand went reflexively to the obsidian amulet in his pocket. No way, said Keelan. I'm not leaving them. He touched the wound on his shoulder. Pale pus leaked from stitches. First things first. Keelan sat against the wall. He didn't want to injure himself if he passed out. Then he coaxed flame into existence, heating the tip of the dagger until he thought it had been sterilized. Before applying the knife to his shoulder, he dampened his sense of touch. Pain was the hardest sense to ignore, because the body was designed to signal overload when it was being damaged, but he could at least reduce it. First he clipped the stitches then worked the tip into the wound. It felt like someone digging a finger into his shoulder. As he worked the knife back and forth, he hoped the piece of crystalline root hadn't gotten too far embedded into his shoulder. The deeper he dug the tip, the more he couldn't block the pain. By the time he reached the piece of root he could hardly keep his eyes open, and his breath came in short heaves. The piece was smaller than he expected. He worked it, lifting it from the wound until it reached the top, and he could pull it away. The piece of crystalline root was no bigger than a couple of grains of sand. He put it in his pocket for later examination. His shoulder was a bloody mess, but now that the piece of crystal was removed, he could apply magic to it. Before he was too worried about the reflective material causing more damage when he tried to heal the wound. Drenched in sweat but feeling better already, Keelan approached the water. Every bit of him resisted walking into it. His mind threw out all sorts of scenarios, mostly having to do with his teammates already being dead, and that he should just leave the Bastille and live out his days in Varna. But he had to believe that there was an air pocket somewhere down below. That it was another barrier that had to be overcome. You have to do this. After psyching himself up, he took a chest-expanding breath and walked into the water. As the cool liquid rose around his body, his anxiety returned. Being submerged felt like being shoved into a tomb. Without anyone around and his body still recovering from his self-surgery, Keelan had to fight to keep going. The staircase led to a large chamber. Though the water was relatively clear, distance turned it murky so he couldn't see the walls, which made it feel like it was a limitless expanse sucking him down. Keelan clung to the bottom of the stairs, looking around for a direction to swim. He pushed off, making tentative strokes into the middle, but as soon as he looked back to see the dim outline of the stairs, panic set in. His whole body turned into an alarm, and he couldn't swim fast enough to get back. Before he knew it, he was crawling up the stairs, shaking and dripping. He clenched his fists. Damn it. He paced before the water. He hated what his father had done to him. What if it had broken him permanently? What if he couldn't go back in? His mind was filled with loose wires, ready to short-circuit him at the worst moments. It took him a few minutes of psyching himself up, but eventually he convinced himself he had to go back in. Zane would do the same for him. After another deep breath, Keelan marched into the water, this time diving into the watery expanse and stroking hard in a downward direction. When a shape came rising out of the deep, he panicked and nearly fled the other way, but either the glass guardian didn't see him or didn't care. Maybe the ruby eyes in his pocket helped the automatons to know who was safe and who wasn't. Swimming deeper, with the air in his lungs straining to get out, he saw a line of cages hanging in the middle of the water. His whole world condensed around him when he saw the four lifeless bodies floating in the cages, limbs dangling beneath them. The shock of seeing them was like a punch to the gut. He turned and fled upward, swimming until he found the stairs and crawled out on his hands and knees. Collapsed. He was too late. They were already dead. His jaw shook. He clamped his hand around his mouth, trying to hold in the pain, because he knew if he let it out, he'd never get up again. All he could think about was how he was going to have to tell Aunt Sella and Uncle Massio that Zane was dead. Keelan pulled the circular obsidian amulet from his pocket and held his hands as if they were a plate with the magical device resting in the middle. All he had to do was hold tight and flood it with phase and he'd be saved. Back in the honeycomb. Once he did, he'd go straight back to Varna. He looked at the water again. 
Did he really know they were dead? And if they were, shouldn't he bring their bodies back to the honeycomb? He stared at the water for a long time. With a trembling realization that he had to exhaust all possibilities, however remote, or suffer a lifetime of regrets, Keelan climbed to his feet, adjusting his imbuements so that he could hold his breath even longer than before. For the third time, Keelan went into the water. It didn't get any easier, but he had to go. His father had been buried in an empty grave. He didn't want his cousin and his friends to suffer the same fate. This time, knowing where he needed to go, he reached the cages quickly. The door to Zane's cage opened to his touch, suggesting that the ruby eyes were the key to moving around the Bastille. Keelan hesitated before touching Zane, but when he did, he found his skin still warm, not at all cold as he expected. Hope bloomed in his chest, an emotion he had to temper or use up his oxygen. He swam beneath Zane to find a bronze mask fitted over his face. A quick check of the magic involved revealed it was keeping him in stasis. Keelan tugged Zane through the water, his limbs trailing behind him like seaweed. He carried Zane up the stairs and gently set him on the ground before removing the mask. Zane gasped with air, coming alive, fighting against Keelan for a moment. I've got you, man. I've got you, Keelan said to his cousin. A ready smile broke across Zane's face and relief flooded through Keelan. He buried his head against his cousin's chest. I thought I'd lost you. Zane wrapped his arms around Keelan and held him until they were both done sobbing. I thought I was lost as well. Zane looked around as he sat up. Where are the others? In the water, but I'll get them. I ain't leaving you all, said Keelan, his Alabama accent thickening his words. As Keelan strode back into the water, he found it didn't frighten him as much as it did before. He glanced back to Zane, who was still sitting on the edge of the steps recovering. I love you Cos, said Keelan. That smile returned, the one that went all the way to Zane's eyes. Love you too, Keelan. Maybe everything was going to be okay after all. Chapter 29 The Bastille, April 2015 The heist returns. Right away, Zane saw there was something different about Keelan after the watery rescue. He wasn't carrying a loaded spring in his gut and he'd gone back into the water multiple times after dragging them out of their prisons. He would have asked what had changed but there was no time. It was enough to see peace in his cousin's eyes, even if it might only be temporary. How are we getting out of here? asked Portia, wringing her hair out onto the steps. Keelan, who had returned from another foray into the water, held his hand out, revealing a handful of rubies. With these. How did you get those? asked Vin. Not only do they let you through doors, but they let the guardians know who is safe and who isn't. I was able to pry them off the other guardians, while they swam. Carry them in your pocket and we won't have to worry about them again, said Keelan. Vin put his arms around Keelan in a bear hug. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I've always wanted to be in a heist, but I never wanted to die in a heist. Zane shook out his limbs and heightened his senses with the imbuement. The stasis had left him a little groggy. Let's get out of here and get the word, said Zane. With the ruby eyes in their pockets, they moved through the generator room, finding another exit and going up a flight of stairs until they reached an area Zane recognized. After listening for anyone nearby, he led them into a large room with a massive shimmering sphere that hovered in the middle. No one spoke but they signaled him with their hands. Prison sphere. Yes, he replied. The others stared into the sphere, expressions moving from curiosity to revulsion as they realized that the shapes inside it were people. They gave it a wide berth as Zane led them to a side passage, rather than up the stairs to the chamber of the Black Council. When they heard a pair of voices coming down the stairs, Zane had them step into a room filled with extravagant paintings. Out of the corner of his eye, he noticed a Mona Lisa, but was quickly distracted by familiar voices. Know that Halfton was behind it even if I cannot prove it, said a voice that Zane immediately identified. It was Eleanor Fields, the ranking member of the Black Council. The second speaker, Tamako, whom he recognized by her stilted diction, responded, let me take a contingent of the Guardians and speak with him. I can make him tell the truth. Eleanor chuckled. As much as I would like to do that, as the man has always bothered me for reasons I cannot explain, it would upset the others and cause unnecessary strife. A pause. Speaking of the Guardians, 
Have you seen any lately? It's not like them not to be prowling about. I will send Jax down to fix them, said Tamako. Sometimes their spellweaves get tangled and they lose their way. The Black Council members went through a door, and Zane could no longer hear them. He led the team towards a spiral staircase that went up. At the end of another long corridor, they came upon a room with a giant door on one side, protective runes covering it. Standing near it made the hair on the back of his neck stand up. This is it. The word of annihilation is through this door, said Zane. Those door wards are insane, said Skylar, eyes wide, a hint of appreciation in her voice as she studied the runes. They made it so no one can get in. No one. Basically, they locked up the word and threw away the key. If anyone tries to go through the door or unravels the wards, they'll die. Like instantaneously. But the problem is, the doors will only stay open as long as the person who opened them is alive. So even if someone wanted to sacrifice themselves, it wouldn't work for long. You almost sound like you admire its design, said Vin. Purely professional. But for us, this sucks. We have no way to get in, said Skylar. We need to get through it. Priyanka always said there's a flaw in every design. Can we protect that person from the trap? Or disable it? Any ideas? asked Zane. They spent a few minutes studying the runes. The wards work like a mousetrap, said Skylar. Open the door, and the pent up magic slam onto whoever opened it. It doesn't even matter if you run away or do it from outside of the Bastille. They're designed to kill from any distance. They're unbeatable. After a long silence, Portia asked, how long from opening the door to death? Skylar read a section of runes on the left. Half a second? Maybe less. Why? Will they kill me if I'm in another realm? Asked Portia. Skylar squinted before responding. No, but how would that matter? I can open them, said Portia. Give me the tether. I'll open the door and portal back to the honeycomb. Are you sure? That's not a lot of time before you die, and we need the tether to escape the Bastille when we're done, said Zane. If we don't get the word, there's no need to escape, said Portia. The ruby eyes might get us out safely, said Keelan. Might, repeated Zane. But I see your point. We'll have to chance it. You really ready to risk it, Portia? That doesn't seem like much of a window to open the door and portal out. She stared back at him undeterred. She looked like she was ready to face down an army and win. Fair enough, said Zane. He handed Portia the amulet. Good luck, said Vin. Portia stuck her tongue out at them. I don't need luck. Zane expected a big wind-up, some neck cracking or other physical psyching up, but Portia marched to the door with the amulet in her fist, performed an unlocking charm, and then winked out of sight before the runes all turned black and shot a dark beam at the location she had just been standing. The reek of spent phase and burnt ozone filled the air as the unlocking charm continued its work, and the door opened, revealing a circular room beyond. At the center of the room, suspended within a matrix of light, was a scroll. I'm going to kiss her when we get back to the honeycomb, said Vin. We all are, assuming we live, said Keelan. Before stepping into the room, they checked for invisible traps. The word of annihilation, said Zane when he was finally able to approach. He felt like it should have looked more majestic. Do we just go up and grab it? asked Vin. Those look like proximity alarms reflecting off the word itself. If we grab it, it'll let them know we're here, said Skylar. There's no way we can fight our way past the Black Council. I see no way to disable them, said Zane, examining the walls where the light was emanating from. Could we replace it with something similar? Vin's face lit up. OMB. A switcheroo. Don't you mean OMG? asked Skylar, tilting her head. No. On Merlin's balls, said Vin. Every heist has one. The part where the thief has to switch out the jewels with an object exactly the same weight, or trigger the alarm. The problem is the sensing lights are balanced against the power of the word. This is artifact level magic. We don't have anything that can reflect that back to put in there, said Zane. I do, said Keelan, holding his fingers up as if he were holding something tiny. It's the piece of crystalline root. I dug it out of my shoulder when you all were captured. O'Keefe said it was a perfect reflector. Now is the time to find out. Before Zane could ask who wanted to do it, Vin snatched the piece of crystal from Keelan's hand. Let me do it. Are you sure? asked Zane. 
I've been waiting my whole life for this moment, said Vin breathlessly, as if he were about to be crowned prince of a fey kingdom. Vin approached the word with both hands outstretched, one squeezing around a crystalline pebble, the other open ready to snatch. He moved with unnatural speed, a gift of his imbuement, and in a flash the word was in his hand and the piece of crystalline root was floating in midair. Vin turned around, eyes wide with victory. That was the greatest moment of my life. Let's get the hell out of here, said Zane. Vin shoved the word at Zane. I'm too shaky to hold it. The scroll was surprisingly heavy, as if the condensed magic weighed it down. Now we see if we can actually get out, said Keelan. They made their way back through the large room with the sphere, and then through the long halls filled with priceless art and magic stolen from across the realms. Zane recognized a few more originals from his world. He wondered what the curators would think if they found out their expensive artworks were fake. When they reached the exit, a shimmering wall of light beneath an archway, Zane addressed them. We're not out of this yet, but we're close. Hopefully the storm reached the city, and we can get back to Halfdens quickly without being seen. Once outside, be ready to move. If anything happens, abort to the portal and get back to the honeycomb any way you can. The others went first, disappearing through the door. Zane took a breath before he stepped into the light, hoping that he'd still be alive when he came out the other side. The transition was brief, but unlike the last time he had no vast predatory mind invading his, checking for nefarious intent. He stumbled outside, but the relief he felt was blown away a second later, when a blast of sonic energy from the gherkin knocked him off his feet. He slammed into the wall and fought to get back up, but the spell had scrambled his thoughts and turned his muscles into quivering jello. His teammates were scattered about the entrance, as if they'd been thrown by an invisible hand. No one was moving. Crack. The sky split with lightning, followed by chest-thumping thunder, revealing two figures standing twenty feet away. The hair on Zane's arm stood straight up. Once the flash across his eyes faded, he couldn't see the rest of the city, but the two figures made his heart race. The first stood in shadow, his face hidden by a hood and darkness. The second was the gherkin, seven feet tall, wielding a humming sword. Zane clutched the word of annihilation trying to form a spell, but his fingers were like noodles, his tongue like a dead frog. When he realized he couldn't even get to his feet, let alone defend himself with magic, he looked up into the slate-gray face of the gherkin and waited to die. Chapter 30 Deathbird, April 2015 Not all is as it seems. Stand back or I'll use the word to destroy you, said Zane from the ground. The gherkin hesitated, lifting the sword high enough to point at Zane's chest in warning. Zane looked up expecting to gaze into its menacing eyes, but found a pained look instead. As a hint of floral perfume reached him, he began to question what was really going on. Kill him and take the word. We need to leave before anyone else shows up, said the shadowed man. The ringing in his ears from the sonic blast delayed Zane's recognition of the voice. Halfdan, the second figure pulled back his hood, revealing his moustached face. This is what your hesitation has cost us. You have to kill him now. The seven-foot-tall assassin looked back to Halfdan, before returning to Zane. Something in the way he moved was familiar. When the gherkin didn't move to kill him, Halfdan surged forward pulling his blade angrily. Fine. I'll do it. But the gherkin put his hand out, stopping Halfdan before he could reach him. Halfdan tried to shake the assassin off, but his grip was too strong. The gherkin pushed Halfdan backwards then leaned over and tugged the word from Zane's arms. The swirl of floral perfume brought back intoxicating thoughts. Come back, he said to the gherkin as it marched away. When the assassin didn't slow, Zane managed to reach into his pocket, gather enough finger dexterity to retrieve the silvery ball, and lob it at the assassin's back. The dispelling ball removed the illusion as soon as it hit, revealing the second-year student from Metallum Nocturne, Tally. Tally half-turned, the lower part of her face hidden by a bronze filter mask. Her eyes were red. Though she stood a head taller than him, the way they interacted, and the shared constellation of freckles across their noses revealed a relationship between Tally and Halfton. He was her father. Everyone in the Hundred Halls is going to die if you take the word, said Zane. We have to go, Tally, said Halfton, mouth contorted. Just tell me why, said Zane. Tally looked back to her father before answering. She jabbed a finger towards the Bastille. My mother and grandfather are in there, 
being tortured for all time. It's not right no matter what they did. We can stop it with the word. Zane's gut roiled with revulsion. He immediately thought about his mom, Sella, and how he would feel if she were in the prison sphere. Or Keelan. Or any of his family. It's awful, Tally, and I get it. Trust me, I get it, he said thinking about how he felt about the Lady of Varna. But it doesn't justify killing so many people. The world will fall apart without the halls. No, you don't get it. You can't, she said, wiping the tears from her face. Every day I think about them. Every. Day. Why not kill them instead? That would at least be merciful. And your world. Your world spawned the Black Council and the Bastille. Half its members are from the halls. It's complicit in the Council's crimes. And the virus, it's not going to kill anyone. Just take a few people's magic. The virus was only to scare you, make you think this was the only way. That's not true, Tally, said Zane. It's going to take the magic from anyone under 50, and many will die. One of our instructors might already be dead. And how many will perish in the chaos afterwards? How can you justify this? Tally, said Halfton. We have to go. Now. She met his gaze, lips squeezed to whiteness. Her shoulders crumpled inward from the pressure. Zane thought she might give in, but she thrust them back out and marched after her father. Within moments the storm and the darkness swallowed them. It was another couple of minutes before Zane could climb to his feet. He felt like a newborn foal. The others awoke around the time he was standing. My head, said Vin from his hands and knees. Did I get kicked by a mule? What happened, asked Keelan. They took the word. It was Halfton and Tally, the girl from Metallum Nocturne, he said. The girl you went on the date with, asked Skylar. Well, you've got bad luck with women. We need to get back to Halfton's place, see if the others are there, said Zane. Right as they started moving, a heavy downpour hit them. They were soaked to the bone within seconds. Even with their imbuements, it took them ten minutes to get back to the mansion. As they approached the door, two shapes moved out of the darkness. Zane brought flame to his fist, readying himself for battle, while his teammates did the same. If you want that flame shoved up your ass, keep it coming, said Instructor O'Keefe. A mage light bloomed in the space between them, revealing Priyanka and O'Keefe covered in mud. Don't worry, this is honest mud, said Priyanka. We had to tunnel out from that beastie's pit. That's how you survived? She nodded. When the ceiling fell, said O'Keefe, we dove in. The damn thing didn't know what to do with us up close, and fled somewhere beneath the Bastille. We couldn't go back up, so we had to keep digging down, and eventually we hit bedrock. We had the word, said Zane suddenly. As much as he wanted to hear how they escaped the Bastille, there was still a chance of retrieving the artifact now that the patron was back. You got it out, asked Priyanka incredulously, then added, had? We managed to steal it, said Keelan. Then Halfton and his daughter ambushed us and took it. It was the perfect heist, said Vin wistfully. Halfton, exclaimed Priyanka. She went straight through the door, knocking it halfway off its hinges. Everyone followed her into the mansion, up to the ballroom, where Pennywhistle was still convalescing. Noyade was by her side, tilting her head forward so she could sip water. On a nearby couch, one that hadn't been destroyed during Priyanka's lessons, Instructor Allgood was snoring. He came to the moment they stepped into the room, grabbing his staff as if to ward them off. Noyade's forehead knitted. You're back. I thought Halfton said there was trouble at the Bastille. He went to go help. Halfton double-crossed us. He took the word, said Priyanka. I was worried he'd done something to you before he left. How did he take it from you? asked Noyade, clearly not believing it. I wasn't there. Priyanka put her hand to her forehead. I'm so stupid. How did I not see this coming? He knew that I would try to steal the word. So you admit it, said a voice from the stairwell. You stole the word of annihilation and broke the pact. Eleanor Fields, the head of the Black Council, strolled into the room flanked by the other four members. Zane glanced out the window to see many mages surrounding Halfton's mansion. I did, said Priyanka defiantly. And I alone should pay the price. This isn't a negotiation, said Eleanor, gaze angrily flitting around the room. Where's the word? Halfton took it, said Priyanka. The identity of the second thief seemed to genuinely surprise the head of the Black Council. Halfton? That buffoon? Why? 
I don't honestly know, said Priyanka. His father and wife are in the punishment sphere. He wants to use it to destroy it, free them from eternal pain, said Zane. He tricked us into stealing it to save the halls from his virus so he could take it from us. Eleanor barely reacted, but Zane caught Tamako's head snapping around towards the Bastille. She took a step towards the stairwell as if she were going to head back right away. How do you know this and not Priyanka? asked Eleanor as she came straight up to him. Though she was a few inches shorter, Zane felt her presence keenly as if she were a raging fire. He understood why she was the head of the council. He took a step back. Tell her, said Priyanka with a soft snort. Though she may not believe it. She shook her head. I don't believe it, either. Believe what? asked Eleanor. None of you are making sense. Tell me what is going on. I? Zane glanced to his teammates. We stole the word. And when we left the Bastille, Halfton and his daughter took it. She was the Gherkin, or who we thought was the Gherkin. Using an illusion to hide herself. Then we came back here and met with Priyanka and an O'Keefe. Eleanor blinked a few times. Wait. You mean to tell me you four broke into the Bastille and stole one of the most heavily guarded artifacts in our possession? We did, said Vin, face beaming with pride. He looked like he was about to explode into glitter. It was glorious. It was the heist of my dreams. You're mad, said Eleanor with her hand to her forehead. All mad. There's no way you took the word. We had help getting into the Bastille, but then we got cut off from them, said Zane, nodding towards the instructors. But how we stole it doesn't matter now. We need to get the word back, or the virus will run unchecked in the halls. When Eleanor continued to look confused, Priyanka added, they set a magic killing virus loose in the hundred halls to trick me into stealing the word. If we don't get it back, millions will die. That's not my problem, said Eleanor. The Black Council and the citizens of Deathbird do not get involved with the outside realms anymore. You broke the pact, therefore you must pay. All of you. Whether you entered the Bastille or not. I'm sorry. It's our rules. The moment Priyanka spoke, every hand went to a weapon. Try and take me, Eleanor. You'll find we won't go quietly, and I promise you'll be the first I kill. The patron of the academy glared at the grey-haired Eleanor, who did not give an inch in her stare back. You can't kill everyone in Deathbird, said Eleanor. No, said Priyanka. But I can kill you, and you know I can. I'm at the height of my powers, while you've been retired for nearly three centuries. Then I suppose my reign will come to an end. But if I don't punish you, the rest of the council will turn on me, as will our dutiful citizens. The pact is the pact. Someone must pay and unfortunately, Halfton left you with the bill, said Eleanor. What if we could find him, said Zane? If there's one thing that man is good at, it's going to ground and hiding. He's like a tick in a tornado, you'll never suss him out, and especially not before he uses the word, said Eleanor. Zane thought back to his date with Tally. He remembered something she'd said about her father, and where their favourite place to go was. At the time he'd thought it was a ski resort in this world, but he suspected the ice hold was in another realm completely. I know where they're at, said Zane, projecting more confidence than his knowledge warranted. He thought it was a 50-50 shot that they were at the ice hold, but he didn't want to give that away. Tell me, said Eleanor. Why? You're going to throw us in the punishment sphere. I'd rather they keep the word and destroy it so at least we don't suffer that fate, said Zane. And besides, keeping that thing is horrific. It should be destroyed. Eleanor, said Tamako, the matri's harsh voice filled with need as she glanced towards the Bastille. The head of the council snapped her head towards Tamako. I know. Some communication passed between them, too quick or coded for Zane to understand. Priyanka caught it as well, and her forehead was knotted with curiosity. You wouldn't say that if you knew who was in there, said Eleanor back to Zane. Zane realized what Tamako had been implying at the same time as Priyanka. She nodded towards him to continue, catching that he had as well. You can't afford to lose the punishment sphere, said Zane. You've put far too many people in there. They'll overrun the Bastille and the city, ruin your little place of retirement. Eleanor stared at him with murderous contempt. He's right, said Anthika, one of the other council members. She had dark, lustrous skin and wore a luscious blue cloak that seemed to move around her lithe body. We cannot allow them to break the sphere with the word. 
It would be disastrous for the council, for the city. They broke the pact, said Eleanor. They must be punished, or how will we function as a society? The same as we always have, said Anthica, but we won't be a society if they break the sphere and set loose those that would hurt us. You must make the deal, Eleanor. Eleanor's eyes went a little wild as she considered it. I must do nothing of the sort. I cannot. As head of the Black Council, I forbid it. Then you should be removed from the council. You have led us well for a long, long time, but it is time to move on. I nominate myself as head of the Black Council. Anthika addressed the other members. Do I have your support? Jax Ringer, the council member who dressed like a suave pirate, immediately stepped forward as if he'd been expecting this turn of events. I concur. Yes for Anthika to replace Eleanor as head of the Black Council. Right after, before even Eleanor could voice her complaint, Lauren Pale, the fifth council member, spoke with a slight lisp. Anthika for head of the council. Yes, yes. Anthika turned her head towards Tamako, who looked just as stunned by the events as Eleanor and everyone else in the room. The pale matry's slate grey eyes surveyed the other council members before finally resting on Eleanor, who looked painfully resigned to what was about to happen. You can't do this to me, said Eleanor. The people of Deathbird have supported me for a long time. They will not accept this. The people of Deathbird accepted you, as long as you led us well. Using the sphere to enforce the pact was a mistake. It has cost us. You cost us this and the people will see it, said Anthika. The calculus of power didn't take long, and Tamako only nodded her head and said, I for Anthika. Eleanor's face paled. She strode from the room like a queen to her beheading. After she was gone, the tension released from the room. Very well, said Anthika with a small breath. Once this is over we shall find a new fifth member of the council. Until then I offer the freedom from the pact if you can stop them from using the word, assuming you also bring the thieves to us for justice. Only if you promise to destroy the sphere, said Zane, before Priyanka could say anything. On your own terms of course but you shouldn't put people in there. Either find a better way to hold them, or let them die mercifully. The corner of Anthika's lips twitched while her eyes glittered with amusement. Very well. Once you have met your part of the bargain, we shall find a more equitable way to keep those that have sinned against us. I for one won't miss looking at that awful thing every day. But what will we do? asked Tamako. We'll find a way, said Anthika. But first go and retrieve them and the word. Where are they? asked Priyanka. The ice hold, said Zane, praying that she'd know where it was. Ice hold on the fifth ring. No one else would be there right now. It's the perfect place for the ritual. She nodded. Everyone else stay here, she held out her hand towards Zane, except for you, Zane. If we're going to move fast, I can only take one. No one objected, because the other instructors were too injured. He reached out and grasped her warm hand. Bits of dirt crumbled from their palms. Ready? Ready. The speed at which they left the room turned his insides into a maelstrom. Through some link of phase, Zane's legs churned faster than they'd ever moved before. Only through her guidance did they not crash into anything while they ran through the rain-soaked city. When they reached the portal, Priyanka gave him no time to catch his breath. I need to get us there faster than normal, so this is going to hurt. Before he had time to register the warning, he was flying into the void. Chapter 31 Ice Hold, April 2015 Final Decisions Landing in a cold white place, Zane crashed to his hands and knees, vomiting until his sides hurt. It was the worst portal transfer he'd experienced, as if he'd been tied to the back of a roller coaster to dangle along behind it as it whipped through its paces. After he shakily climbed to his feet, spitting a few times to get the taste of bile out of his mouth. Behind him, the glistening obsidian portal stuck out amid the frozen white expanse on three sides, while the fourth fell away to a cloud-filled valley. Streaks of snow skittered across the landscape beneath a pale sky as the wind rose and fell in a lonely howl. Despite the temperature, the portal was set into warm bedrock, kept clean of snow and ice by runes that had been etched into the stone. A short rock wall circled the portal with steps leading down a slope, through a jagged gap. Priyanka grabbed his arm. Her eyes were red from her own battle with vertigo. Spell yourself against the elements. Once we step away, the frigid cold will take hold. It's negative 30 during the day. When he was ready, she told him, 
We're going to hit them fast. Follow my lead. Incapacitate them if you can, but not at expense to your life. As soon as they stepped away from the portal circle, the full brunt of the frigid winds hit him. Even with his enchantments, the cold cut him like a knife. He jammed his hands into his armpits. The rough cut stairs led through a jagged gap in the rocks, following along a cliff to a grotto in a cliff wall. Further into the grotto was a lodge that looked large enough to hold 40 or 50 people in comfort. What is this place? Ski lodge, said Priyanka. The icehold has the best skiing and mountain diving in all the realms. People in our line of work like to come to these places to get away. But it's the off-season right now. Too cold even with enchantments. The inside of the ice hold looked like every ski lodge Zane had seen in a movie, with a massive fireplace above which a horned creature's head stuck out of the wall, except it wasn't a deer or an elk, but what looked like a matacor, complete with leathery wings plastered on the wall next to the lion-like head. The fireplace crackled with a dim fire, as if it hadn't been tended recently. Priyanka led them through the main area, back rooms filled with exercise equipment and small restaurants, eventually coming to the back of the building. Zane had expected more rock or maybe a ski storage building, but instead he found a lush garden filled with trees and flowerbeds. The warm moist air was a balm to his skin after the brief journey through the wintry landscape. Priyanka pointed to a path that led through the foliage indicating he should take it, while she went wide, disappearing into the trees even as he tried to follow her with his eyes. Creeping down the path, Zane heightened his senses and reflexes, so he heard them long before he saw them. Tally and her father weren't hard to find. He could have found them by smell alone, since whatever they were doing was putting off a lot of phase. The trees ended, leading into a concert stage for plays or musical acts with a couple dozen seats around it. Halfton stood on one side speaking in a low tongue, his moustache trembling as he spoke, while Tally stood on the other side, her melodic voice filled with intense inflection. Between them hovered the word of annihilation, the scroll stretched open, its runes slowly coming to life burning as bright golden coals. He couldn't help but look to Tally, standing tall, red hair thrown over her shoulder in a thick braid. He imagined her crashing into battle with a massive hammer, or pouring molten iron into a mold, or lying beneath him as he pressed his lips against hers. Not now, he thought. But it was hard not to. He empathized with what she was trying to accomplish. He wanted to do the same for his family, but there was no way he would sacrifice others to achieve it like she had. When Priyanka blurred out of the shadows behind Halfton, Zane leapt into action. He was halfway down the steps when there was an explosion. Fear flooded his limbs as he saw the smoke and light where Priyanka had been standing. Halfton had laid a trap for her, and she'd run right into it. Zane froze, quickly searching around him, but his arcane sight wasn't as well developed as his patrons. If she hadn't spotted any traps, he'd have no chance. When he looked back up, Tally was looking at him sideways while continuing the ritual that would release the word. Don't do it, said Zane, carefully stepping forward. He couldn't see the traps but kept going. He made one furtive glance to his left where the explosion had been, hoping to get a glimpse of Priyanka, but he saw neither her nor a body. When he was almost to the stage, he saw a faint shimmering light before him, indicating a barrier. His skin crackled with electricity when he moved his arm near it. The barrier must have been what Priyanka had run right into in her haste to get Halfton. The barrier curved around until it was flush with the rock wall. Halfton had foreseen this complication. Tally, please. You can't do this. I know we didn't know each other for very long, but you don't want to do this. It would change you forever. Stop the ritual, let us take the word back, he said. The fierce determination he'd seen on her face when he came in cracked with emotion. Her jaw muscles tensed as she continued speaking the ritual words. The runes on the word of annihilation were nearing their completion, with nearly all of them glowing a golden hue. They were running out of time, and Zane had no way around the shield. You don't need the word anymore. Eleanor is not the head of the Black Council, and Anthika agreed to destroy the punishment sphere, said Zane. Tally's head snapped towards him. The last rune was halfway burnt, but did not continue burning as she looked towards him. From the other side of the stage, Halfton grunted, clearly trying to hold the ritual in place. He said, don't listen to him. He's trying to trick you. I'm telling the truth. You don't have to do this, said Zane. 
How convenient that this happened now, said Halfton. Even if he's telling the truth, they're probably lying to him. They're not, said Zane, sensing movement along the rock wall where Priyanka had hit the barrier. He couldn't see her, nor did he want to look and give away her location, but he sensed her working at the barrier. He needed to keep them distracted. There are other people in the sphere that they don't want out, so they were willing to make the deal. Please listen to me, Tally. If you can achieve the same goals but without hurting so many people, why wouldn't you? But they're not going to die, she said. That's the lie your father told you so you'd help him, said Zane. Tally, just finish the ritual and you can have your mom and grandfather back. We're almost done. Tally looked like she was being compressed by an invisible hand. Her forehead bunched up as her mouth contorted. At the corner of his vision, he saw Priyanka halfway through the barrier. Somehow she'd pulled the energy field away from the wall with a spell, and was sliding behind it. Tally, said her father, one last push of phase and we're done. With me now. Tally glanced to him, expression pained. The last rune resumed burning, snaking along its angled shape until it reached the end. Priyanka was almost through the barrier, but she was too late. In a desperate attempt to give Priyanka even a few seconds more, Zane yelled, I love you, Tally. The words hit her like a hammer blow. She squeezed her eyes shut. When she looked back, he could see that she had strong feelings for him. She started to open her mouth when Priyanka blurred over to Halfton and struck him cleanly in the back of the head. His legs fell out from under him and he landed in an awkward pile. Zane felt the hum of the protective barrier around the stage disappear. The words poised on Tally's lips turned to a snarl. She lunged towards the huge sword lying on a bench behind her. Tally looked ready to cut him in half. You lied to me, she said, holding the massive sword in guard pose. No, I didn't, he said. They're going to destroy the sphere. Your mom and grandfather will no longer be in pain. But they'll be dead, said Tally, lips squeezed tight. I don't know what they're going to do, said Zane, his body numb from seeing her in such agony. Tally heaved a big breath. Her face was racked with anguish. She looked ready to smash her sword into him at any moment, but Zane made no move to defend himself, and Priyanka had stayed near Halfton's fallen body, holding the ritual in place. Do you really love me? Her gaze searched him with need. He wanted to say yes, to give her the answer she craved, a lifeline back to the world, and while he had enjoyed her company and could find himself falling for her under different circumstances, the fact that she'd been willing to come this far and sacrifice so many people for her selfish cause made it impossible for him. No, he said, shaking his head softly. Tally screamed in his face, raising the great sword above her head. For a brief terrible moment he thought she was going to cut him in half, but then she threw it away, to clatter against the seats. She ran past him into the garden, the verdant foliage swallowing her whole. Priyanka acknowledged what had happened with a small nod, then said through gritted teeth, take up her position. We can complete the ritual. Send your phase into the word. I'll keep it in place while you concentrate your thoughts on destroying the virus. He found the word of annihilation ready and waiting to accept his phase, as if it were hungry for more. The artifact's design was relatively simple. The only thing it had really needed was enough phase to activate, and Tally and her father had gotten it most of the way. As the runes on the word brightened, Zane sensed this vast machine in the spell, like a living algorithm with only one purpose to destroy. It was both exhilarating and terrifying at the same time, as he sensed the power of the word could destroy a whole city or burning star if he wanted it to. The moment before the spell triggered, he thought about changing the target to the lady's poison. If it destroyed the poison in everyone's veins and the lady herself, wouldn't Varna and his family be free? He had the power in his hands. It would only take a thought, not the years of subterfuge and strategy that would likely end in his death. He could save Keelan, his parents, Aunt Lydia, his siblings. He saw their faces looking back at him in his mind, not the versions of them in Varna, but the ones they'd imagined as themselves. Nevia wore a chef's hat at a Michelin star restaurant in Paris, Keelan was riding through the mountains on a motorcycle, his parents were laughing in their formal clothes at the grand opening of their architectural firm. Time stretched as he hesitated. Across the stage, Priyanka wrinkled her forehead at him. Suddenly, with the power to help his family in his hands, he knew how Tally must have felt. One spell. One intention. It would all be over.
but so would the lives of so many others. And while the answer was easy, it wasn't right. He couldn't do it. With thoughts of the virus clearly in his mind, he focused his energy back into the word of annihilation. A thunderclap followed by a brilliant flash of light concluded the spell, knocking both him and Priyanka on their backs. The sudden release of energy left him gasping for breath. The air smelled burnt as if it had been the site of an electromagnetic bomb. It's finished, said Priyanka dusting herself off. Part of her black shirt was torn from when she hit the barrier, but she looked otherwise unharmed. She searched him with her eyes, a question on her lips and suspicion in her gaze. I'll be fine, he said. It's not easy, she said, when you have to use someone's feelings against them. But you did good. Had you not, the spell would have completed, and we would have been too late. You saved millions, possibly billions of lives. It doesn't feel like that, he said, thinking about how he'd almost chosen Varna over the world. Mostly I feel like an asshole. She raised an eyebrow. Sadly, that doesn't go away. But it means that you're not a psychopath, which is good because I don't allow them in my hall. Then what about Eddie? asked Zane with a grin. She gave him a sigh and a shake of the head, before patting him on the shoulder. Come, help me with Halfton. You can put the bindings on him. It'll be good practice. What about Tally? Will they still honor the agreement since I let her go? asked Zane. Priyanka's lips drew flat, as she lifted one shoulder slightly as if to say she didn't know. But finding out didn't take as long as expected. As they led Halfton through the lodge, now awake but bound in shimmering bonds that didn't allow him to move his fingers or speak a single word, they met with the remaining members of the Black Council, who had a bound figure with them as well. Tally's head hung low as she shrunk against her bindings. She ran right into us as we arrived at the portal, said Anthika. A spot of good luck, said Priyanka. We were busy with the ritual, or we would have given chase. Anthika glanced in Zane's direction with an air of skepticism. Either way, it is done. Both the word and the thieves in question. And the punishment sphere, asked Zane. It will be taken care of soon enough, said Anthika. Don't worry, we hold up our agreements. The sphere will come down. It was an abomination. Thank you, said Zane. What about Tally and her father? She's not an innocent party to this, said Anthika. I wasn't suggesting that she was, said Zane. Anthika glanced to the other members of the council. Unlike her other family members, I don't believe she'll lose her life for this, but we will have to find a way to keep her for a very long time. An anguished cry came from Tally's throat, while Halfton slumped against Zane with the realization of his final punishment. Her eyes pleaded with him. Tamako, the smoky eyed matri, collected Halfton from Zane. The Black Council led their prisoners out of the lodge letting Priyanka and Zane stay behind. He watched Tally the whole way. Once they were out of sight, Zane slumped onto a couch. Priyanka put her hand on his shoulder. I'd hoped she'd gotten away. I did as well, said Priyanka. We'll head back when you're ready. Zane nodded and moved to the ledge outside the lodge, despite his protective enchantments having mostly worn off. He jammed his hands in his pockets, shivering against the painful cold. His eyes watered from the icy winds swirling into the grotto, but the view was transcendent. Distant mountains formed a ring around the cloud-filled valley, which seethed and swayed like an ocean of mist. He stayed outside until his chest no longer threatened to squeeze the breath from his lungs, and he no longer felt like his heart was turning to stone. Finally, when his lips were blue and ice had formed in his tight black afro, Zane stumbled back inside. Let's go home. Chapter 32 Honeycomb, May 2015. Authors with Benefits. In the weeks after the Bastille heist, or the greatest day of my life as Vin liked to call it, the intensity of academy schooling provided a balm to Zane's mood. The instructors back into their roles as teachers rather than squad mates, offered no quarter during classes, which Zane appreciated. He suspected they knew what he was feeling, the letdown after the mission, and kept him and his fellow second years busy. Of course it might also have been that the end of the year was approaching, and this was the normal grind, but Zane liked to think of it as the first way. Strangely the other second years knew what had happened, even though no one was supposed to talk about it. When he was hanging out in the common area, other students would clump together, whispering sub-vocally, sending furtive glances towards him. It made keeping to himself more difficult than normal. On a Thursday afternoon, 
Sophia sidled up to him while he was sitting on the long couch in the library. He would have preferred a single chair, as that kept his fellow classmates at bay, but they'd all been taken. Oh, Zane, she said, practically sitting on top of him, putting her hand on his leg. You really need to hang out with the rest of the class more. The year is practically extinct. There's a bunch of us going out tonight. There's a bar called the Smoke and Amber that's supposed to be divine. She said the last word in two parts, der and vine. He took a deep breath, regretfully enjoying the sweet jasmine perfume she wore. I'm really sorry, Sophia. I'm behind on my reading, he said, pulling the tome against his chest like a shield in case she tried to slip into his lap. She ran her painted fingernail down the spine of the book. Volume 10 of the Illustrious Arts of Deception. But we're only supposed to read through five this year, she said. He was about to explain how interesting the reading was. He was currently in the middle of a chapter about the practice of how using social proofs in conjunction with targeted spell flashes could remotely program people. One of the case studies involved how they convinced a corrupt business mogul to turn himself into the police, with spell-aided videos he was receiving on his internet feeds. But then he realized she didn't have studying in mind. He was saved from answering when he saw Keelan standing across the room, waving at him. Zane closed the book, a motion which got Sophia's excitement since she clearly assumed he was going to pay attention to her. Then he pushed the heavy tome into her lap. You should read it. I have to go do a thing. Sorry. He was away from her before she could protest. Zane sensed an epic pouty face from behind him, based on his cousin's stifled expression. Zane embraced Keelan. Love you cos. What's up? Keelan handed him a flyer from the bookstore Left Tower Books. He took a quick glance. So there's a big book signing tonight with a bunch of local authors, someone you want to see going? asked Zane. His cousin gave him a big grin and jammed his finger into the crisp paper, right in the middle of the list of authors. Alex Malice, said Zane. Good idea but won't he know we're coming like he did last time. I don't know how he knew we were following but he knew. Keelan pulled out his phone and showed him a picture of a tiny furry grey mammal with big eyes. It almost looked like a lemur. He has a pet Alamus PSI Nocturne, said Keelan. It's a psychic mammal that bonds with other creatures, providing them protection and warning of danger in exchange for safety and food. They're little bigger than a mouse. They're only found in the Portuguese hills and most researchers thought they were extinct, but Alex has one. I found out through talking to some of his classmates. They're insanely jealous of him for owning one. It's how he knew we were following, and why the goblin market turned into a maze for us. They can influence people around them. Then how do we get to the signing event without alerting him? asked Zane. Keelan handed him a chunky iron bracelet. He had a matching one of his own. I borrowed these from Instructor O'Keefe. They're blankers. Assuming we don't make any dangerous moves, they'll keep the Alamus from noticing us. I got us a couple of copies of his latest book, so we don't look out of place. Zane examined the glossy hardback. The World's Most Dangerous Zoo, a retrospective by Alexander Malice. The Portland Magical Zoo, I guess I've heard of it but didn't know what it was. Let's go find out what he knows about your dad. If he knows anything, said Keelan with a heaviness to his gaze. Left Tower Books was in the third ward. The line to get into the bookstore was already out the door by the time they arrived. They couldn't use magic to get ahead in the line or risk spooking Alex. Besides, they wanted to talk to him, and going later gave them a better shot. Three hours later, when they finally reached the front of the line, Alex Malice was seated at the table in a safari shirt, a representative from the bookstore behind him. He was much younger than Zane had thought from his author photo, but that made sense given that he'd graduated the same year that Uncle Jesse died. The grey streaks in his black hair made him appear much older. Alex didn't even look up, as they handed over the books. Thank you for purchasing my books. Who can I fill these out to? asked Alex in a droll tone. To Jesse Walker, said Keelan. Alex mechanically opened the front cover, and his pen was poised over the paper when he paused, his ponytail shifting as he tilted his head. As soon as he looked up, he exploded from the table. It's you. Both Zane and his cousin held their hands out. Wait please, said Keelan. We just want to talk. The bookstore attendant's eyes were wide. Alex, is everything okay? He looked ready to run but hadn't moved yet. 
We're just here to ask you a few questions about my dad, said Keelan. Alex's hand went to his shirt pocket, which shifted with a slight bulge. His forehead knotted with concern. Zane held out his arm. Don't worry. He didn't fail you. We came prepared. But the, said Alex, making a motion with his eyes towards the sky. The stingtails. Let's call it fair trade for your apartment, said Zane. Like my cousin said, we just want to talk to you about Jesse. Alex paused, looking like he was still deciding between bolting and staying. Then he looked at the line still behind them. Can you wait until after I'm done? I don't like to disappoint my fans, he said. Sure, we'll wait at the cafe across the street, said Keelan. They collected their books and moved across the street, ordering a couple of coffees while they waited. Zane was a little surprised when Alex showed up an hour later. He'd half expected him to leave the city. He sat across from them with his hands placed before him, as if he were afraid of making a sudden move. I'm really sorry about trashing your apartment, said Zane. We were there for the ecological webs of arachnids. We didn't know the book was trapped. Alex glanced at the door before relaxing his shoulders. And I apologize for the sting tails. They're nasty business if you're not ready for them. Clearly I underestimated you both, but you know we could have avoided this if you'd contacted me directly. Again my fault, said Zane. I couldn't wait for answers when we found out you hadn't been home in a while. I thought we'd take a peek in, grab the book and leave without causing any issues. You knew my father, said Keelan, cutting in before Alex could answer. Jesse Walker. Alex hesitated as if he wasn't sure about acknowledging it, but then he nodded slowly. He looked around the cafe. We enchanted the table, said Keelan. No one's going to overhear us. I assume you're both from Varna, said Alex, keeping his body very still. Yes. Then you understand my caution when it comes to what you're asking about. I'm also curious as to why you would both join the academy, considering what your father was researching. He's my uncle and Keelan's father, said Zane, but I get your point. Let's say we have our reasons. And what if those reasons are to curry favor with your town's patron by exposing that I helped your father, said Alex. Why the hell would we do that, asked Keelan, barely controlling the volume of his voice. I? Alex paused with his mouth open, glancing between them. What do you think happened to him, asked Alex. He was killed, said Keelan, and they took my mother's arm as punishment, even though she didn't do a damn thing. Alex looked away, blinked a few times. Knew my father, I should have caught it the first time. He looked back. May I ask what happened to him? And my condolences, of course. That's the thing, said Zane. We don't know. He disappeared seven years ago. We think that the lady had him killed, but we never saw his body. The casket was empty, said Keelan, holding back his emotions. Are you sure he's dead? asked Alex. Zane's heart leapt in his chest. What? Why would you say that? Keelan squeezed his fist around his coffee mug, snapping off the handle. If no one saw the body, said Alex, eyeing them carefully, then how do you know? Sorry. That's a terrible thing to suggest, but I'm a scientist. I don't like to believe something unless I can verify it. Zane put a hand on his cousin's arm. Why don't you start from the beginning? Tell us how he contacted you, what he asked about. After taking a sip of his water, Alex said, he contacted me during my final year in the halls. He was looking for information about Papura Domina Arania and had been asking around. While I'm not an expert on spiders, I'd never heard of that particular species, and that intrigued me enough to contact him back. I was of course warned away from this line of research by a few professors, though they wouldn't say why. This only made me more determined to help Jesse, if only for the self-knowledge. But as I tried to learn about the spiders, I found myself continuously stymied by holes in the information. It felt like someone had removed every mention of them from society. Zane cleared his throat. We noticed that too. Doubling down on my research, I delved into less traveled pathways of knowledge, said Alex with a coy smile. In this, I learned far more than I wanted to about Varna. I'm sorry, the whole situation sounds positively devastating. We're well aware, replied Zane. Anyway, eventually I came across the book, which naturally was trapped in a way that would kill most researchers, but I was able to extract the information without opening it. When Zane raised an eyebrow, Alex added, 
I had it scanned in an MRI. Sometimes technology works better than magic. I passed that information along to your father, who was quite excited about the material. He seemed to think it was a way out of his situation. In what way? asked Keelan. I don't know, said Alex, making a shrugging gesture with his hands. My only impression, given what I know about Varna, was that he felt he'd found a weapon. Zane's face went numb at mention of a weapon against the lady. Alex's eyes went wide as he stared across the table. I take it that a weapon is important. Are you sure? asked Zane. No, of course I'm not sure. This was seven years ago, and many things have happened since. But that was my first impression of the memory, and my gut feelings are often right. But you read the book. Did you see a weapon in there? asked Zane. Sorry, no. I couldn't understand his excitement. Alex glanced at his wrist even though he wasn't wearing a watch, and stood up from the table. I hate to do this but I have to go. I'm leaving early in the morning for another signing in Pittsburgh. They gave him their thanks and farewells. After he was gone Keelan turned to Zane. I don't remember reading about a weapon, and I have that book practically memorized by now, said Keelan. Same here but maybe if we read it again, we'll see something. Zane put his hand on his cousin's shoulder. One step at a time. We'll figure it out, eventually. Or die trying, said Keelan. Let's try to skip that part. Chapter 33. The Honeycomb, May 2015. The Stinger of a Bee. The final weeks of school ticked down without incident. It seemed anticlimactic compared to what had happened in the preceding months. On the day after final exams, and before Zane and his cousin took the train back to Varna, he received a message from Priyanka to meet at Empire Inc. It was written in a scrawling script on a silvery ball, one of the items they'd used at the Bastille. What's that? asked Skylar as she was packing her third trunk of clothing. Zane, who'd been sitting on the couch when the fifth year came in to deliver the ball, said, a message from Priyanka. That looks like one of those things I used to dispel illusions in the Bastille, she said, which brought back the memory of what it had revealed. Skylar wrinkled her nose in disgust. His cousin, who was climbing down from his room, jumped the last ten feet, landing as silent as a panther. What's with the writing on it? A message from Priyanka. I have to meet her at Empire Inc., he said. Strange, said Keelan. Want me to come? Zane looked at his cousin who looked completely at home in the team apartment, unlike he had at the beginning of the year. He didn't want to disturb that feeling. Nah, you finish packing. I'll take the portal. I'm sure whatever it is it won't be long, said Zane. They appeared sceptical about the benign nature of the message, but let him go just the same. He made it to Empire Inc. 15 minutes later, after a round of precautionary enchantments. The patron wasn't above surprising them with challenges to test their reflexes and problem-solving skills. The tattoo shop was closed and no one was working the store, but the front room lights were on. The horizon painted pinks and oranges against the sky, and the spire blazed as a tower of light. It's a beautiful city, as long as you don't look too close. The voice came from a chair on the left side of the room, behind a privacy curtain. It wasn't Priyanka, but it was familiar. Zane stepped to the center, keeping his imbuement at the ready should he need to flee. The midnight-skinned Anthika, the new head of the Black Council, lounged in a leather tattoo station, one leg crossed over the other. She wore tight jeans, a brilliant yellow v-neck, and open-toed white shoes. The fluorescent lights made her skin glossy. Thank you for coming, said Anthika as she climbed to her feet. I'm sorry for the deception, but I wanted to speak to you. Zane took a step back, which brought a smile to her lips. Don't worry, Pri knows I'm here. She suggested this location might put you at ease. That is her handwriting on the ball, not that I couldn't have reproduced it. Not allowing himself to relax a hair, Zane said, to what do I owe the pleasure of your visit? The corner of her lips curled slightly. I wanted to thank you. Thank me? Yes, said Anthika, for stopping Hafton from destroying the sphere. Without you, Deathbird would be in ruins. No offense, but I wasn't saving you, I was saving the hundred halls, he said. It's amazing what one can do when properly motivated, said Anthika, moving closer to him. She had a languid gait, as if her spine were made of reeds rather than bone. When she reached him, she placed her finger under his chin, 
and he flinched from the shock of their skin connecting. I thought stealing the word was possible, but I didn't expect one of Priyanka's students to do it. It was a team effort, said Zane, then he caught the implication of what she'd said. Wait, did you put Halfton up to this so you could depose Eleanor and take her place? Anthika placed her hand on her chest in outrage. You wound me after I give you such a compliment. The politics of Deathbird are virile, but not suicidal. I had nothing to do with Halfton's foolish idea, but I won't claim to have not profited from it. Whether or not she was lying he couldn't tell, but either way she was in charge of a dangerous place. Not to be rude but why did you ask me here, asked Zane. Zane dear, she said as if he were her grandson, I brought you here to give you a gift. A gift. You are familiar with the word, right? Pre does teach these things, she said chiding him with a grin lurking on her lips. Familiar, yes. Confused, definitely. The corners of her eyes crinkled as she examined him. Caution in our line of business is warranted, but don't forget to relax. A spring at tension for too long loses its ability to bounce back. A corpse bounces back even less, he replied. Anthika wandered towards the window. She tapped on the glass, indicating the spire. Do you know why Invictus made this place? asked Anthika. You knew him, he asked. How could one not? He was an asshole, but the man had vision. She tapped on her lower lip with a fingernail. He made the hundred halls as insurance for the future. As the realm slowly became connected by way of the obsidian portals, he saw that the mixing of cultures would result in conflict. He hoped to limit that conflict by providing the necessary skills to those that might thwart chaos. Are you suggesting this gift is insurance for you? asked Zane. I can't be bought. I'm not trying to, she said, facing him. Invictus was a genius, a man of uncanny vision. Unfortunately, there will never be another like him. But while I don't have his vision, I'm gifted with the occasional glimpse of prophecy. And you saw the need to give me a gift. She kept a tight-lipped smile. I would prefer not to reveal what I saw. But I will say that there is a great battle ahead of you, and I wish to provide you with a weapon. A wicked dagger appeared in the air between them. It was the length of his forearm with a black pommel, silver guard and keen blade. The edges looked sharp enough to sing through the air. Abzu the hidden blade. The hairs on his arms rose as he reached towards the weapon. He kept his hand hovering over it. He couldn't help but covet the dagger, and Anthika smiled in response to his need. What does it do? It's an artifact from ancient times. A powerful weapon? Not made for battle or alley scraps, but rather the taking of life, said Anthika. All weapons are for taking life. Not really. Her eyes glittered with amusement. Some wish only to brandish them, to scare their enemies or bolster themselves. Then the weapon is merely a status symbol. But when this blade is revealed, it must take life, or it will turn on its owner. Zane took a step back, drawing a chuckle from her lips. Don't worry. I do not own this weapon. Not in the way you will soon understand if you take it. We are safe. Zane took a long look at the blade. Though he heard no voice it called to him. His whole body seemed to vibrate from the nearness, as if they'd been made from the same primal clay. Do you accept it? she asked. With the Lady of Varna firmly in his mind, Zane put his hand on the rounded hilt. The cool metal sent shivers up his arm and down his spine. When he pulled the weapon away from her hand, that sensation changed. Suddenly pain racked his arm, as if it had been dipped in molten lead. He cried out and tried to drop the weapon, but it wouldn't fall from his hand. He turned his hand over to see the weapon sinking into his flesh, becoming one with him. Zane fell to his knees, holding his arm as the dagger entered the meat of his muscle. He tried to block the pain with his imbuement, but he couldn't reach it through the curtain of pain. It went on for agonizing minutes, until at last he found relief in its absence. Zane lay on his side on the cool tile as Anthika stood above him. The weapon was no longer visible. He probed his arm to find no sign of the dagger. When he looked up she said, I would have told you but it would have only made it worse. It's over now. You and the weapon are one. How do I use the damn thing? he asked. The weapon will come when you want it, but do not reveal it unless you mean to use it, she said from above. He struggled to gain his feet, but once upright he felt steadier. The memories of pain faded quickly. Anthika strode from the room, leaving by the front door rather than the portal. 
She disappeared from sight but a few feet out the door, despite the bright streetlights and her yellow top. Zane probed his arm a few more times trying to find sign of the ancient dagger. Now that it and Anthika were gone, he wondered if the whole thing had been an illusion. She'd mentioned a great battle. There was only one for him. Zane turned towards the back. It was time to go home. Chapter 34 Varna, June 2015 Answers in unexpected places Watch out below, called Zane from the top of the pile of cars in the middle of Doc's junkyard. The sun reflected off the many broken windshields and old hoods, turning the rusty patch of Varna into a sauna. The smell of old oil wafted up from the narrow rows of wreckage. Nevia in cutoffs and a tank top ran to the truck, while his father Massio scooted to the side. Keelan made no move to get out of the way, and Doc had stayed back while Zane had climbed the stack of half-crushed cars. Zane launched the rusted refrigerator in a high arc. It slammed into the ground inches from Keelan. When the refrigerator tipped into the dirt, the others returned. Nevia punched Keelan in the shoulder, who gave her a cattish grin. Show off. Zane let down his impact kicking up dust. He cupped his hands against the sun. It was still early June, but the heat had come early, and while he could have kept himself cool with a simple enchantment, there was something comforting about the Alabama heat and breaking things in Doc's junkyard. When they were younger, Doc would let them break the windows out of the cars that were going into the crusher. With his thumbs tucked behind the straps of his overalls, Doc approached the pile. The wrinkles in his face grew deeper as a grin stretched across his nutbrown skin. He tucked a strand of his stark white hair back underneath his massy Ferguson tractor hat, which had splits on the sides of the bill and had smudges of dirt on it that had probably been there since the 90s. Tie a rope to the end of her, and she'll tug right off the back. After that, I can haul her back to the stack. The rest will be up to you, said Doc. The her in question was an old ice cream truck that had seen better days. The bumper was long gone, and the engine would probably need replacing, but the structure had been sturdy enough to hold Zane when he'd climbed on top of it to throw the refrigerator off. It's gonna be a lot of work getting her fixed, said Massio, but it was clear from the look on Nevia's face that she was ready to march through battle for it. I don't care how long it takes, she said, but I will have my own food truck. Half the residents in Varna won't buy food from a truck, said Keelan. They will after they eat some of my food, said Nevia. Even if I have to tackle them and force them to eat it. Zane believed his younger sister. When she put her mind to something, it was best to get the hell out of her way. Then in the sweetest voice Nevia said, Oh dearest older brother and smartest cousin, why are you not bringing my precious Delilah down from yonder pile? Delilah? You named your food truck, asked Keelan, then he wrinkled his face. And did you say smartest or smartass? Is there a difference, said Nevia with a wink. Every good vehicle needs a name, said Massio, patting the dented door. The ice cream decal had mostly peeled off except for the bottom of the cones. Yeah, but that's usually the case for a hot rod. Not a food truck, said Keelan. Instead of responding, Massio pushed Keelan towards the pile. Go on boys, you have work to do. It didn't take but an hour for Zane and his cousin to haul the old ice cream truck down and put it on the long trailer bed. After tying it down, Massio and Nevia jumped in the cab. You two can run back, said his dad with a wink. We'll bring the truck back later, Doc. Thanks again for everything. The truck door opened and Nevia jumped out, ran over to Doc and gave him a big hug. Thank you for Delilah. I wish I could pay you something now, but I promise I will later. Doc cupped her face with his wrinkled hand. There's no need, Nevia. You all have been more than neighbors all these years, come and to help me whenever I've asked. You're damn near family, more than my own flesh and blood. So enjoy Delilah. Make me proud. He winked, and Nevia gave him a kiss on the cheek before she ran back to the cab. As it pulled away with the old ice cream truck on the back, Keelan said, I didn't know your sister could be nice. That's because you only see her in the kitchen, said Zane. She's like a badger in her hole when she's cooking. Don't mess with her unless you want to lose an arm. You boys want a couple of orange sodas? Knock a little off this heat, asked Doc, squinting away the myriad of reflections. Zane hadn't had an orange soda in years. Sounds great. They went back to the little building in the center of the junkyard that Doc called his home. After a long drink from the cold bottle Zane said, where do you even find these? 
I didn't know they bottled this stuff anymore. Helps to know people, said Doc winking. You know, it's good to see you boys together after what happened between your fathers. Zane had the bottle of orange drink against his lips, so he was able to hide his surprise at the comment. He glanced at Keelan, who had not hid his expression as well, but Doc hadn't been looking at him. What do you mean? asked Keelan in a quiet voice. You know, said Doc as if he thought they did, they'd been fighting like two wasps in a jar before Jesse died. Was a shame they didn't get to make up. Hate to see those kinds of things linger. What were they fighting about? asked Zane. What they always fought about, the lady, said Doc, nodding in a northerly direction. Zane and his cousin shared glances. They'd never realized that Doc knew what had gone on between their fathers. Zane had a good feeling that Doc wasn't supposed to tell them this, but he was north of 80, and might have forgotten. What about the lady? asked Keelan. You know, how Jesse wanted to do something about her, but Masio tried to warn him away. Doc paused. Did your father not tell you all this already? Yeah, he did, but it's been a while. It's good to hear it from someone else, said Zane. Anyway, when Jesse thought he'd found a way to take care of the lady, he was all excited. This was the night before he died. He'd wanted Masio to go with him, but he declined. Zane could hardly control his breath as he asked, where did he go? And what did he think he would find? Doc sucked on his teeth for a moment. They would never say in front of me, in case, you know. But I think I have some of his old books here. They used the back room like a war room when it came to things in the town. Doc led them into the back room of his small one-story house. An old table was filled with empty jars and old tools and liberally covered with dust. Behind the table was a short bookshelf. Doc handed them a half dozen books before excusing himself to use the bathroom. Zane quickly looked over the titles. They were either maps of the region or geological surveys. The weapon, whispered Zane, paging through the top book. He must have found it. Keelan started flipping through pages frantically while Zane did the same. They found numerous maps of the town from various time periods, including its founding. In all of them, the ladies' plantation sat at the center in some form or another, and in a few of them, an area north of the plantation was highlighted by a heavy ink circle. I know this area, said Keelan. We passed through it on the way to the train tracks. We should go check it out, said Zane. There might be a cave there or an old well. Maybe something else entirely. Keelan frowned. I, I'm not sure if we should. A fever of excitement filled Zane's chest. Their fathers hadn't the training they had. What if he did find something, but wasn't capable of taking it? Maybe it was a trap tomb like the Bastille, said Zane. Or maybe it's a way into the lady's plantation. It's not that, said Keelan, staring into the distance, face pinched with pain. What if I find out he's alive? Chapter 35 Varna, June 2015 A Forgotten Path Despite looking like someone had kicked him between the legs, Keelan joined Zane on the search. They reached the location on the map quickly, using their imbuements, but once they were there, the searching slowed because the trees were being strangled by kudzu. The invasive vine covered everything in a blanket of green. The center section of the town had more elevation than the surrounding areas. Zane was studying the map, trying to get a bearing on their location while Keelan side-armed rocks into the bushes. The train tracks are up that way, said Zane, pointing through the trees. I never realized how close to the lady's place we were when we came through here. There's an old barbed wire fence right in that hollow that marks the edge of her property. We must have hopped over that fence a thousand times. Keelan looked back to him, squinting into the sunlight that had made it through the trees. Nothing in Varna's that far from the lady. I thought you knew that. I mean geographically, said Zane. I meant that too, said Keelan, tight-lipped, nostrils flaring. Zane almost fired back a retort, but he saw his cousin was cocked like a hammer. It made sense. They were searching for his dad's final resting place, or possibly a clue to where he might have gone. Zane didn't know which would be worse for his cousin. He suspected it might be the latter. The map, which was from about 40 years ago, was confusing compared to what Zane was seeing, because the kudzu smoothed out the geological features that might have shown the way. He turned back and forth a few times before deciding on the next place to search. If we go over the fence, there's a depression before it leads up a slope towards the back of the plantation where the outbuildings are, said Zane. 
Keelan followed without comment, tossing rocks into the trees at increasing speed. When they reached the rusted barbed wire fence, Keelan threw one so hard that the rock embedded into a tree. With his foot on the wire, Zane said, You sure you want to do this? I can check it out and let you know if I find anything. Keelan's head snapped around. He opened his mouth, closed it, then shut his eyes. I'm sorry, Cos. You know this is messing with me. I want to know, but you know I don't. I get it, said Zane. No, you don't, said Keelan, opening his bloodshot eyes. You don't know how many times he put a hand to me. I mean, I might have deserved it a time or two, but not as often as he did it. That dude was an asshole. But he was also my father. What the hell am I supposed to do with that? Face scrunched up, Keelan had nascent tears in his eyes. It's not your damage, said Zane. I don't know why he was how he was, but that's not you. You've taken the best parts of him and thrown away the rest. If it weren't for you, we all would have died in the Bastille. And I know how hard that must have been, diving into the water with those creepy-ass glass guardians swimming around. I know, I know. I hear you, Cos, but sometimes even though I know these things, I worry. Like there's some flaw in me that when it comes down to it, I'll break like he did. Because you really never know until that moment. Zane grabbed his cousin and pulled him in for a hug. Keelan was taller and they were both sweaty and gross, but he squeezed him tight. I will always trust you. Always. I know you. We're more than cousins, we're brothers. I don't care what happens, but you will be there for me, like I will be there for you. Always. Keelan let him hold him for a long minute. When he pulled away, he was nodding his head and thumbing away the tears. Thanks, Cos. I needed that. Keelan blew out a cleansing breath. I'm ready now. In the space between the hills, kudzu vines had stretched between the trees, along with those long-limbed flying insects his mother had told him didn't bite, but he still didn't like when they flew around his head. Zane and his cousin tromped around, taking a circuitous route, looking for signs of caves. If there's something here, I'm not sure how we'll find it, said Keelan. Damn kudzu's covering everything. Maybe we shouldn't look with our eyes but our other senses, said Zane, thinking back to their imbuement lessons in the Undercity earlier in the year. Yeah, let's do that. They calmed themselves. Zane closed his eyes to shut out the visual information. When Zane amped his other senses up, he could hear Keelan's heartbeat. It sounded like a rabbit being chased down by a hawk. Zane could sense his tremoring, as if his whole body had been wired to explode. Zane sent his senses out further. There was no wind, so he could practically hear the forest steaming in the heat, smell the rot of small dead animals beneath the kudzu. As he was scanning a patch of the invasive vines, he sensed a different air, like the exhalation of some great earthy beast. Over there, said Zane. Yeah, I caught that too. Like the ground is breathing. Over in that patch of shade against that steep incline, said Keelan. As they struggled through the kudzu, Zane saw the verdant leaves rustle as if something were exhaling. When they reached the area, he could feel cool air seeping out. Using their bare hands, they ripped away the vines, revealing a narrow cut going into the ground as if someone had jabbed the earth with a dagger. Keelan bent over near the side of the cave, pulling a tattered olive green canvas backpack from the side. This is my dad's, Keelan said breathlessly. Jaw is written in marker on the inside lip. Jesse Allen Walker, said Zane. Keelan opened the backpack and pulled out a couple of flares, a map, and a couple of old granola bars. Why'd he leave this out here? asked Keelan. Zane ignored the question and pointed to the entrance. Too narrow to slide through with that on your back? Gonna have to suck it in. Without waiting for his cousin, Zane turned sideways and squeezed through the crack. The rock scraped his back, but he made it through. While he was letting his eyes adjust, Keelan forced himself through the narrow entrance. Because he was broader in the chest, it took him a good minute and left his back bloody. Zane was about to summon a mage light when Keelan handed him a flare. They sparked them to life, the red-orange tubes spitting light as they held them up. The cave was larger than Zane expected. He'd thought it would stay narrow or only go a few paces before turning into a crawl space. This cave has to come out somewhere else, said Keelan. I feel a breeze. Maybe he came out somewhere else and couldn't find where he'd gone in, said Zane. Judging by the look in Keelan's eyes, he was more afraid of finding out that his dad was alive than dead. Maybe it was easier to forget what he'd done to him if he wasn't around anymore. 
Zane led the way, holding up the flare. The orangish light crept ahead as they moved through the cave. After widening again, the cave reduced down to a passageway. There was no sign of human travel or that his uncle had come this way. They were about 30 feet past the entrance when Zane glanced back. He could no longer see the light from outside. Suddenly the walls condensed around him. He wasn't necessarily afraid of the underground, but he wasn't a fan either. He took a deep breath, detecting faint molds, old rot, mineral water and other musty cave smells. Dripping from somewhere ahead made patient steady time, while further in the skittering of insects echoed softly. The passage opened up into a second large cave, at least 50 feet across, this one with multiple exits on the far side. A small pool waited on the left side, the source of the dripping. Wow, said Zane, examining the moist rocks that made up the ceiling. They were striated with color and oozing water. This is pretty awesome. It must not have been a weapon he was looking for, said Keelan. This place seems too natural. I don't even need to check for phase to know this place is clean. There were explosives back at docks. Maybe he thought it was a way to sneak into the ladies' place. Blow it up. I think we're still headed that way. Keelan sighed. That would explain the breeze. But blowing up the plantation doesn't solve the poison problem. Let's keep going. We'll check out those passages. If there's more cave then we'll come back later when we can explore properly, said Zane. They found the body around the next curve, lying against the stone wall as if he'd fallen asleep. Zane recognized the light jacket as soon as he saw it. Oh, said Keelan as he saw the body, the exclamation somewhere between pain and surprise. Zane moved to examine it but Keelan stayed back. He was holding his emotions between his teeth. Go ahead, said Keelan, nodding. I, I just need to take a moment. Though it had only been seven years, the corpse looked desiccated as if he died fifty years ago. Except for his clothing, Zane couldn't even tell it was his uncle Jesse. Zane saw no obvious signs of death. As Zane edged closer, he felt the hairs on the back of his neck stand tall. His skin was a sea of electricity. Zane spied a pouch on Jesse's side that looked like it held something square, maybe a notebook. How did he die? asked Keelan who still hadn't moved. I don't know, said Zane. He looks drained. Zane wasn't sure why he said that, but it seemed to fit what he was seeing, even if he didn't understand it. He leaned closer, thinking about digging into the pouch but not wanting to touch it, or the body. Zane. Yeah I know, said Zane. I'm not touching him. Not that. There was a real need in his voice, that at first Zane confused for emotions about his father's corpse. He'd been so focused on the body, he hadn't been paying attention to what was around them. Keelan's eyes were white with concern. Behind them, where the exit led to the surface, were dozens of spiders, each the width of a coffee mug. Are those? asked Zane, seeing the critters creep across the stone on silent legs. Not the ladies. Something else, related maybe. Time to leave. Agreed, answered Keelan. The spiders had crept into the cave behind them, and more were coming as they watched from the smaller passages that left the cave in multiple directions like a labyrinth. The spiders moved with patient surety, flanking them on all sides. Zane approached the spiders with his flare held high. One good blast of elemental fire and the path would be clear. Get ready to move, said Zane, holding his hand out. Right as Zane summoned Faze, Keelan said, wait, don't. But it was too late. Zane splashed fire over the spiders, expecting them to roast in the flame and curl up onto their backs. Instead, the magical fire incited them into a frenzy. He swore the spiders that took a direct hit grew in size. There are Kerania Magicantia, said Keelan. Magic eaters. As if a starting gun had sounded, the swarm of spiders came rushing forward. There weren't dozens but hundreds now flooding out from the back caves. Magic eaters. How the hell do we get out? asked Zane. Keelan glanced to the corpse of his father, then back to the exit, which was blocked by hundreds of magic-eating spiders. I don't think we do. Chapter 36 Varna, June 2015 Choices The overwhelming numbers of spiders turned Zane into a statue, and all the answers that came into his head involved magic, which would only make things worse. The dozen spiders that he'd hit with an elemental blast were as big as dinner plates, though moving lethargically as if the sudden growth had taxed their bodies. I wish I had the tether, thought Zane, but it had been a one-shot item. 
It was hard to fathom that they'd stolen the word of annihilation from the Bastille, only to get taken down by an army of arachnids, but there was no way to get out without giving the spiders a chance to attack them. Zane stomped a spider that got too close, then another, dancing backwards as more came skittering in. He kicked one back, soccer style, before knocking another away that had crawled up the wall. To the water, said Keelan. Following his cousin, Zane took two big leaps over the spiders, barely missing slamming his head on the ceiling. They splashed into the water, which was calf deep. It was frigid, making his teeth chatter right away. The spiders came up to the edge of the water, surrounding them, but making no attempt to swim. A few spiders crawled up the walls and onto the ceiling, but the oozing wetness kept them at bay. How do we get out? asked Zane. I don't know, said Keelan. I don't think we can make a run for it. There are more coming out from the back every second. There must be hundreds. A few of the larger spiders tested their legs in the pool. I don't think the water will hold them back forever, said Zane. He spun around, splashing as he moved, trying to keep an eye on all the spiders at once, afraid the ones behind him would launch an assault when he wasn't watching them. I know what we're gonna do, said Keelan, his Alabama accent seeping through. I'm gonna get out of the water, blast them a few times to get their attention, and lead them deeper into the cave. When I do, you go out the front fast as you can. No, Keelan. We're leaving together, said Zane. It has to be me, said Keelan. I could barely squeeze past those rocks on the way in. They'd swarm me before I got out. Let me lure them away so at least you escape. He paused, emotions caught in his throat. And maybe it's what was meant to be, me dying with my dad. No, Keelan. Stop thinking that way. A small group of spiders pushed into the water. Zane splashed them back, but there were more of them who seemed ready to risk the pool. Let me do this, said Keelan. An overwhelming frustration built up in Zane, until he screamed at the top of his lungs. You're not dying here. We're not dying here. We're going to get out, together, said Zane, his hands shaking with the thought of losing Keelan. His cousin had a calm, serene expression, as if he'd accepted his death. I want to do this. It'll be okay. You be ready. I don't know how far I'm gonna get, but I'll try and make it count. Tell everyone how much I love them. Nevia the twins, Imani, my mom, your parents. I really wanted to try some of Nevia's food truck food. Zane grabbed his cousin's arm before he could wade out of the pool. I'm not letting you go. Keelan struggled against him but Zane held him tight. We both can't make it. Let me do this for you. They need you to survive, it has to be me, I'm expendable. With tears in his eyes, Zane threw his arms around Keelan and wrestled him into the pool as the spiders launched themselves into the water, drawn by the conflict. You're not expendable, he whispered in Keelan's ear. Their struggle was interrupted by an ear-shattering blast. Zane felt like he'd been kicked upside the head with sound. He staggered in the pool next to Keelan while magic-eating spiders floated towards them. Standing at the entrance to the cave was his father, Masio, with a short-barreled shotgun in either hand. He pointed one at the carpet of spiders flowing towards him. Hold your ears, boys, said Masio. Zane blocked his hearing the moment before his father pulled the trigger. Dozens of spiders shredded in the blast. Masio fired again, and then another time, before quickly loading two more salt shells. Zane recognized the guns from Doc's junkyard. The old man kept them to ward off thieves or critters without doing them serious harm. Get ready to move, shouted Masio, clearly deafened from the blasts. He fired two more times at the spiders, scattering those that hadn't been pulped by the salt shot. Now. Zane leapt out of the water, scrambling towards the passage behind his father. He stepped on a few spiders along the way, knocking off others that leapt onto his leg. With his father firing salt shots, they backed into the first cave. The pinch point kept the spiders from assaulting en masse. While Keelan forced his way out the narrow exit, Zane reloaded the shotguns. Once his cousin was out, Zane and his father fled the cave. The three of them scrambled over the kudzu until they were a hundred yards away. Only then did they stop. His father was bent over at the waist, breathing heavily. How did you know where to find us? asked Zane. Beads of sweat covered Masio's forehead. He tossed the shotguns on a pile of leaves and pulled his shirt to his face to wipe away the wetness. Once he had collected himself, Masio put his hands on his hips. He looked like he wasn't happy about what he was about to say, 
and he gave Keelan a good long glance before speaking. Because I've known about that cave since your daddy died, said Masio. Keelan's face bloomed with anger, but then he caught it and chewed on it until he shook it away. You understand, said Masio, forehead hunched with emotion. Trust me, it wasn't easy leaving his body there. He was my best friend. What was he looking for? asked Zane, keeping an eye out towards the cave in case the spiders didn't mind the daylight. I don't know, said Masio, who looked embarrassed that he had to admit that. He never told me, because he didn't want the lady to have a reason to hurt me. I'm sorry, Keelan. I know this is hard for you, especially after what they did to your mom. Why did you let him go? asked Keelan angrily. That's a fair question, said Masio, but I don't think I could have stopped him. About a year before he died, something changed in him. He was bound and determined to make up for what he thought of as his flaws. A cold wind blew right through Zane. He knew exactly what had happened. Keelan looked to him with understanding. They both knew. It was the day in the trailer, when they'd broken Jesse's award. Zane could remember that day as if it were yesterday. It was one of those indelible moments that never left him. It's not Keelan's fault you gave up. You could do something, even now. It's never too late. The words he'd spoken to Uncle Jesse rose up from the past. Keelan had heard them too. But there was no recrimination from his cousin, only a shared understanding, even though they both knew that it had been Zane's words that had shamed Uncle Jesse into action. Masio slapped his neck, breaking the silence. Can we get out of here? These bugs are tearing me up. I'm ready to go home, said Zane, picking up a shotgun. Keelan grabbed the other shotgun. Me too. They marched through the kudzu strangled forest in silence except for the occasional slap in defense against the insects that had come out for dusk. The sun melted against the horizon in brilliant oranges and pinks, a colorful ending to a difficult day. When at last they approached the stack, which was lit up like a carnival with strings of light stretched between the painted containers, they heard quiet conversation. Sella and Lydia were sitting in the courtyard with Doc and the twins, while Amani's laughter echoed into the trees. The smells of roast lamb reached them, eliciting a collective sigh of appreciation. Masio collected the shotguns and set them against a tree. He clasped Zane and his cousin by the shoulders. Nobody else knows about that cave except the three of us. Let's keep it that way. Zane nodded along with his cousin. Now let's go in, clean up, and have a nice dinner in celebration of Nevia's food truck. You go ahead, Uncle Masio, said Keelan. I want to talk to Zane for a second. Masio studied them both, before nodding and heading towards the light. When he was out of earshot, Keelan turned to Zane. Thank you. For what? Keelan held his arms around his midsection. At the trailer. You know when. I never realized it until now that he stopped hurting me after that day. You're not mad at me? Mad? Why would I be mad? Because if I hadn't said that, he'd still be alive. That's all on him cause, said Keelan, eyes rounded. Not you. And he was trying to be better, make up for who he was just like I am. You're not your father, said Zane. I know, said Keelan softly shaking his head. But it's hard because he was my father. You know all these years I've been mad at him for dying, but part of me was more worried that he was alive. I know this sounds terrible but I'm glad it was the former, even though that means he can never make up for what he done. Does it make a difference that he tried to fix what's happening in Varna? A single shoulder shrug, followed by a contorted expression. It helps a little. Not enough probably. Some things you can never forgive just hope to forget and try again the next day. Keelan looked up. I wish he'd found a weapon. Me too. Keelan shot Zane a wry smile. Man, I'm hungry enough to eat an elephant. Let's go wash up. Sounds good I'm starving. Keelan chuckled under his breath. You know what I want to do tomorrow? Something I haven't done in a long, long time. Zane racked his brain for the possibilities, but when nothing came, he said, What? Take a swim in Doc's pond. They put their arms around each other as they strolled towards the light. This has been The Sorcerer's Spy by Thomas K. Carpenter.